Her Demon Daddy by Celeste King, a dark romance. Chapter 1. Asmodeus. 55 years earlier. Screams and moans pierce the air, and my eyes search desperately for an escape. There must be an end to this. I just have to find it. But I should know by now, there isn't a way out. There is no end. The ground burns around me. The sky is an angry red. Much like the rivers of blood covering the ground. This is what our planet has turned into. What have my people become? Gas still fills the air, squeezing my lungs tightly and obscuring my vision. I don't have time to consider it as my hand squeezes the small necklace I never take off. It's the only thing that grounds me, though right now the ground might be the place I don't want to be. That is, until I see the shimmering opening of a portal. Relief surges through me as the magic pulses radiate through the air, ripping and stretching the fabric of space to give me the one thing I need most. An escape. I dash toward the open portal, not letting my mind catch up with my actions. Have I thought through the consequences? Absolutely not. But now is not the time for that. It is the time for action. The only alternative is death. The demons around me have blank faces, their minds in a state incapable of thought. Only direction. This way! I shout, ushering them through to a land unknown. My eyes skim the body-laden and scorched ground. I don't have time to consider what leaving the only place I've ever known means. I have to keep moving. Straddling the connection between two worlds, I turn to look at what is to be our new home. Tall buildings pierce the clouded skies in the distance, and an electrical charge buzzes in the air, tickling my skin. The visible edges tell me we are either surrounded by cliffs or on an island, either of which is fine by me. Anything to escape our current situation. Hurry! I usher the demons through. My eyes track the skies, and my stomach churns. I don't know how long we have. I am no stranger to violence, not as a demon, warrior, or royal. I have been required to withstand sights that would sicken others. So when the state of the demons around me turns my stomach, I know that it must be dire. Blood and open wounds adorn their bodies through shredded armor, and our magic isn't healing them fast enough. Several fall to their knees, and the others are too dazed to rush to help their fallen brothers as they should. The wounded need help, which I will get them as soon as we reach safety. As the last demon crosses onto the new island, the portal closes. While I should be more concerned about the loss of passage, I am relieved. I have potentially been barred from my home, but I am more focused on what I was running from than what I've lost. And to me, the trade-off is worth it. I move through the battalion, assessing the damage. I don't see anyone too far gone, thank the Seven. It may be a small portion of us left, but we will make it through this together. As I slip between the bodies, they all turn, staring at me. And unlike usual, there is no judgment there. There have always been those who have questioned my calls. And yet this one, no one has dared argue. We are all alive. And that seems to be enough. My mind seems to catch up at this moment, reminding me that I do not know where I am. The portal has closed, and there is no way back home. What if this island is uninhabitable? I'm glad I was able to save everyone. But what if I've doomed us just the same? I suck in a deep breath, calming my worries. I have to take this one step at a time, away from the dangers that were plaguing us and into this new world. Is it different? Yes. Everything. The plants, buildings, and ground are a dark, glittering onyx. But it is not something I despise nor am I against the electrical storm scattering through the sky. I can easily draw magic from it, which will be very useful when it comes to healing my warriors. I've made my way to the front of the crowd, and now there is nothing between our new city and me. I expected to feel intimidated, staring at the twisting architecture. I don't know what is here waiting for us, but instead of apprehension, a thrill of excitement rushes through me. A new possibility. Footsteps behind me draw my attention, and I turn around slowly to see one of our best warriors, a massive Gilak demon, making his way forward. He's blinking slowly, the daze in his eyes clearing, and I realize that clarity is starting to reach him. Perhaps his large size metabolized it faster than the others, but I can see I don't have long. Especially as he mutters, Where are we? My eyes sweep the crowd and I see that he is not the only one taking in our surroundings. The shock is wearing off, and they are starting to register their surroundings and they don't seem as thrilled as I am. Not as one of the matrons blink, 
looking over the edge nearest her with wide eyes. Where is the ground? I stare at the jagged edges of what I've realized is indeed an island, and it seems to be a floating one. There is no other land in sight, nor water. Instead, there is only the thick shroud of the storm, blocking out all sunlight and charging the air until my skin is prickling with the power at my fingertips. How could they not love everything about this island? It's as if it was built for demons, and I suppose it was. But when no one answers their questions, it seems to hit me. Their eyes are on me, the one who ushered them through here, the one who conjured the portal that saved them. They are my battalion, yes, but now it has become more than that. I am responsible for them, more so than I have ever been. I've worked hard to protect those in my charge, but guiding them to a new home is a step I never thought I would get the chance to take. And it's time I give them the answers they so eagerly seek, lest they find them on their own. This is my chance. I draw myself up to my full height, straightening my shoulders. My face is shrouded by my hood, which I pulled up to protect myself from the onslaught in the sky before we entered the portal. And for that I'm grateful. I am your king, I announce with as much authority as I can muster. Scanning each face, I see not an ounce of recognition as they nod along. Good. I've brought you here to escape our ravaged planet. I have saved you from the environmental annihilation of our home. As they nod, I start to pace my voice picking up in volume. They truly remember nothing, and because of that, I will tell them everything they need to know. Our planet has been lost to us. I realize how wounded some of them look, and try to circumvent any follow-up questions by adding, We survived the final attacks that the world dared to rain down on us, and now we are what's left of our race. For our strength and courage, the gods have blessed us. I turn, sweeping my arm toward the city. Welcome to Gamaleth, our new home. A gift from the Seven for all that we have endured in their name, and we will treat it as such. With my proclamation, excitement runs through the crowd. Murmurs grow until they turn into cheers, for me or the gods, that I do not know. All I know is that they are starting to come back to life, and they are eager to see this new world I've promised. I step back, ushering them toward their new home, as the skin along my back prickles. It feels almost like I'm being watched, all the muscles in my body going tense. A chill races up my spine, and a cold sweat breaks out across my skin. Very clever. A deep voice rumbles in my ear, and I turn my head, checking behind me in my peripheral vision. But just as I suspected, no one is there. In fact, it almost feels like that voice came from inside of my head. I'm trying not to spin all the way around so as not to draw attention to myself. The last thing I need is any other demons noticing my behavior. But then the necklace resting against the dip between my collarbones starts to warm, and it hits me all at once. That voice is inside my head. And for good reason. I gulp as I realize the kind of scrutiny I am under. Especially as he whispers, Now let's see how long you can keep this up. His vicious laughter fills my head and frays my nerves until that's all I can hear and his question continues to echo through my mind long after the presence leaves me. How long can I keep this up? Chapter 2. Asmodeus. I stand frozen as the walls and floor beneath me shake. I know if I feel it here, on one of the top floors of the castle, it must have been bad but I don't know why I'd expect anything less. They've been growing stronger with each passing day, and I can only ignore it for so long. Others are starting to take note. More than once the concern has been raised to me. It seems that people don't take kindly to a floating island shaking as if it is going to drop out of the sky. I have yet to tell anyone that is exactly what will happen. Finally the ground stops trembling, and my stomach churns as I feel the building lurch beneath me. It has been resettling with every shift of the planet, and I'm not sure how much longer my home will remain in one piece. I stare at the altar before me. There's a table upon the raised dais, lit candles scattered around an onyx bowl filled with water. All the thick black curtains are drawn so that the only light comes from the flames and where they reflect off the water. Mounted to the wall above the altar is the same symbol tied around my neck. An obsidian tree, bare branches, and exposed roots the sign of Ultix, the god of the earth. I don't know if he made this island specifically for us, 
or if he just showed me the pathway. But either way, he brought me here. And now, he seems to no longer be feeling so generous. I don't know what to do, I shout out as I hit my knees. Praying doesn't work. Nor does my magic or the combined power of all my Sazgaroth demons, who should be the best magic wielders on the island. I haven't missed a single sacrifice, and yet the island's place in the sky is tumultuous at the best, and my hold on my people has been diminishing with its power. Out of the two, I'm more willing to let us crash into the ground planet below than to let my power over the other demons slip. Hence, the tremors. I've been pouring everything I can to maintain our society. Though that isn't to say I haven't been trying with the island. I'm just at a loss. A part of me wonders if that is Ultix's goal. Crashing into Protheca will only lead to another war, forcing us to fight for our own section of the planet. Something tells me that would entertain the god more than us occasionally tormenting a village in search of elves and humans to do our bidding. Well, his bidding. I stay there on my knees, my thoughts whirling as I stare up at the tree that I once saw as my salvation. Now I see it for what it is, a threat, a promise with consequences I'm not ready to reap. Finally, I draw myself back onto my feet. I don't know why I bother. I mutter as I climb the steps to the altar and blow out the candles. The water ripples, and I half expect another tremor to run through the island at my defiance. But like for the last fifty-five years, I'm being ignored. Going to the curtains, I peel them back from the windows and let in the dim light. When we first came to Gamaleth, I thought the storm was a random occurrence. But then it never went away. We've been shrouded in the clouds ever since. Through the windows, I take in the sprawling city. Demons roam the streets, and as I watch them move about, I'm struck with how terrible a war would be. Our numbers are still so few, even less so with the limited matrons. We would face annihilation on Protheca due to their numbers. And yet it's a possibility I am considering. But I fear what will happen if we go into battle. Will it dredge up memories of home for them? Will they start to remember the wars there, the ravaged planet we were forced to leave? It's a risk I shouldn't take, but I'm starting to run out of options. If I don't do something, this is all going to fall apart, and I can't have that. Without Galmaleth, I'm nothing. There is no future for me without this island, my power, and my people, which are all dependent on each other. My hold is slipping, and I know that it will cost me all of it. Irritated from my lack of progress, I go to gather my robes, pulling my hood over my face. The time I've spent in here was anything but peaceful, and I'm leaving more tense than when I entered, and with no plan. I burst through the doors that lead into the main castle and the few servants nearby scurry out of my path. I'm used to that, prefer it actually, and right now I think they can feel the rage rolling off of me. Too soon, I see one of my advisors coming down the hallway, and I huff as I try to pass him by. Cezric falls into step beside me, and I stifle a sigh. Unfortunately, it comes out as a harsh growl. That was the third one this week, sir, he tells me as if I haven't been counting them myself. I grit my teeth. I'm aware. It's causing unrest. People are talking. Let them talk. In truth, that's the last thing I want. Questions are already starting to filter in. Questions I do not have the answer to. But I can't show that panic now, and I would rather my wrath silence them than allow the speculation to start. The Seven only knows what that will lead to. Sir, says Rook Presses, though more timidly this time. I believe that this is an issue worthy of more consideration. I spin on him, snarling beneath my hood. Do not speak to me as if I am incapable of my own logical conclusions. I step forward and Cezric shrinks back. I am well aware of what needs my attention. I do not need you telling me how to handle my kingdom. My anger reaches an uncontainable limit. I'm stretched too thin as this problem grows, and the last thing I need is some ignorant lower demon pushing it harder. I am well aware of how frequent the tremors have been, and how more often and aggressive they will grow. It has felt like Ultix himself has been counting down our days for us. His message today is loud and clear. Time's almost up. Am I understood? He nods and I let loose a low growl. Answer me. Yes, sir. Without responding, I turn, storming to the end of the hall and into my personal quarters. I sink back against the double doors and let loose a breath that does nothing for the tension in my chest. How much pressure am I going to be able to withstand until I crumble too? Pushing that thought away, I walk deep into my room. Come here, I bark, standing before my changing area. My servants rush in, sure-footed after half a century without their sight. Their small, diligent Zonax, 
and they didn't even protest when I permanently blinded them. It was a small price for them to pay for their lives, after all. I couldn't have servants that could see me, of course. I can't stay in my robes all the time. This was the only option left to me, but they've grown used to it. I stand on the raised platform as they peel away my robes and armor, changing me into something more comfortable. I've decided to return to my rooms for the night. Before I can relax, though, I have to handle what may very well be futile business. Is it time, sir? My most diligent servant, Argeg, asks. I turn away from them as they put the robes and armor away. Yes, bring me the usual. This is something else I've grown used to. I am a warrior, a fighter, and I will do whatever it takes to survive. But this aspect of my life took some adjustment at first. I never shied away from it, of course. But I know other demons shudder when they assume what I do with the women delivered to my rooms. As Argeg skitters toward the servant entrance to go collect my latest request, a thought occurs to me. This time, I say. And he pauses, twisting his head to listen to me. I want it a little different. How so? Gods. I hope this works. Pick a strong fare. Something unlike what you normally select for me. Argeg remains frozen, waiting for further instruction and it sets me on edge. Draron, another one of my servants, rocks nervously from foot to foot. Sir, I sigh. I truly must do everything myself. Bring me the strongest woman you can find, I snap. Why can't I be surrounded by competent demons? I swear a group of Ergen would be better than this lot sometimes. And do it fast! I want her now! They scurry to fulfill my demand, rushing out of the servant's entrance at a speed that I could have appreciated. If our lives didn't all depend on it. If I realized anything today, it's that the souls of the meek aren't cutting it anymore. Chapter 3. Ciara. Cold stone bites into my back, but instead of shifting away from it, I lean into it. It's grounding, almost like the pain reminds me that this is not a nightmare. I am not dreaming. I doubt I have the imagination to make up the torturous dungeons I found myself in. And I'm not wholly convinced that I'm not in the afterlife. Though if I am, I know that I must be in glaciers. The frozen, barren landscape plunged in eternal darkness is the only thing that can bring fear to the dark elves. Those descriptors seem to check all the boxes of my surroundings right now. Casting my eyes around the cage, I take in the faces of the other women. Some of their names I don't even know. Here. Whether this be Protheca, another planet, or the afterlife holding cell, the women come and go frequently. I used to wonder where they went, why some came back but others didn't. Some women say they shuffle us around between cells to keep us from forming alliances. I don't know why they would. Most of these girls are scared of their own shadows at this point, like the blonde in the corner. I see her stir the first time she's moved since they dumped her in here. Not that she's been unconscious. I honestly think she's too afraid to sleep. No, like most girls that get brought in here, she was too scared to move. She wouldn't eat or drink. Sometimes I'm not sure if it's because they fear what is in the provisions, or if they'd rather succumb to the terror slowly consuming them than keep living. I'm pretty sure it's the latter. I shift forward. Someone needs to help the new girl, and the lot in here show no indication of teaching her the way we do things here. I doubt any of the guard rotations and food if you can call it that, deliveries are the same and knowing the schedule will help her hold on to her sanity. And I want to see how much of it she still has. Sometimes they are so far gone they can't register what's around them. That's when it gets dangerous for the rest of us. Once they dumped a very frail girl in here in the dead of the night. She looked almost gone. She was so small and bruised. I went to help her, but the second I leaned over her, she latched onto my throat with a strength I didn't expect her to possess. I'm lucky that I've provided enough guidance to the other woman that they've deemed me worthy to save. I learned then to only talk to the new girls when others are watching. It's survival of the fittest in here. Just as I start to cross the cell, though, I hear the familiar scrape of the door opening at the end of the hallway. They're coming. The other girls recognise it too, stiffening up as the demons approach. Already I can hear the deranged cackling bouncing off the walls and I square my shoulders as I stare forward. Look alive! The bird-like demon squawks as he rakes his fingers over the bars. 
the harsh sound of his claws on metal echo through the room, making everyone shiver. Why so glum? You aren't dead. Yet. He howls with laughter at the last part, and I grit my teeth. They love to find enjoyment in our misery, and it works. All the others tremble in their presence, but I refuse to. I won't give them the satisfaction. They already took my freedom, my life, everything. I won't give them this little bit of defiance I have left. The demon bears its teeth at me, and I don't flinch. I don't look away or even blink. I just clench my jaw against the words I want to hurl at him, as he leans forward and thrusts his hand through the slot at the bottom of the cell door. I don't let my eyes go to his hand as the hard bread clatters against the floor. My stomach may be gnawing itself, but I will stand what little bit of ground I have left. I will fight for every inch I can get, even as the stench of half-spoiled food fills the room. I can't wait until they let you, he hisses. Hopefully I get the leftovers. Now that almost makes me shiver, but I don't let the disgust show. I only grin. I do hope we encounter each other without these pesky bars in the way, I answer, and I know the threat is dripping in my tone. I'd love to show you what I can really do. I expect him to come back with a snarl or a sick joke, but he only backs away, a low growl building in his chest. Good. He knows I am dangerous. Without another word, he turns and struts down the hall, muttering under his breath. I think I catch an insult in there, but that's about all. Once the door at the end of the hall slams closed, the girls dive forward. I remain in place, stoic as they scramble for food. I will make sure everyone gets something to eat, though sometimes I'm not sure if we're better off getting sick from it or starving. As everyone retreats, I look down to see a torn piece of bread, a handful of decent berries, and a suspiciously soggy piece of meat. Good, they left some for me. The new girl is eyeing the food, and I realise that she's holding something mouldy in her hand, and I huff, moving forward to gather my items. Then I take a seat next to her, ripping the bread in half. The only way we survive here is together, I tell her as I extend the bread and half the berries to her. I'm Ciara. Trinity. It almost sounds like a whimper as she snatches the bread and curls in on herself. Well, at least she isn't feral. Thank you. Look, I get that you're scared, but they like that. The more timid you are, the most likely you are to be pulled from the cage. Have you ever... I shake my head. Nope. I stand strong, stare them down. They either know that I am too feral to let out or that I might be dangerous to them. And I make it a point to prove that every time they come down here, I won't be an easy victory. And if they tried me, I'd definitely do some damage. They don't want that. I lean a little closer to her. If you want to make it in here, you don't need to be scared of them. You want them to be scared of you. Trinity snorts. Scared of me. Everyone is afraid of what they don't know. I tear off a small bite of bread and roll it between my thumb and forefinger. Make them think you are something untested and they won't want to take the chances. You've really got this all figured out. She eyes me. Are you from here? I snort. I don't think anyone is. We all came from Prathika, the ground planet. I roll my eyes. I just think I've been here longer than anyone, at least to have not been picked yet. How? She swallows, staring up at me, and I can tell she isn't sure if she should ask. A year. It's a hard lump to swallow, but it's true. A year without leaving this cage. Do you know, what happens when you are picked? I honestly had assumed she was one of the ones that had been used and dumped. None of those girls ever talked, though. And while, at first, I thought they used us for sport, there are too many of us being kept alive and brought back for that to be the case. I'm starting to think that the role of a woman isn't all that different here than it is on Prathika. I don't know. I've never heard anyone talk about it. But I'm going to find out. Trinity's eyes look like they nearly bug out of her head. You want to find out? I nod. It's easier to fight the known than the unknown. She wraps her tiny arms around her knees and clutches them close. I'd rather just be in here. I think that I could handle. I don't argue with her, but in the back of my head, I can already hear the voice of doubt. They won't leave us in here forever, and I want to be prepared for what's to come. There's only one way to do that, to face what's outside those bars. Before I can answer, I hear the door slam open again, 
surely they aren't feeding us, which means I leap up to my feet, balling my fists and giving the demon a hard glare. Its beady eyes connect with me the second it rounds the corner, and I let my lips tip up in an almost deranged smile. Sometimes I'm not sure how much of a hold I have on my sanity, and this feels more like letting that slip through than putting on an act. Trinity seems to forget everything I said as she skitters back immediately. Rarely do they listen, but I can't risk too much for the others. I have to stay alive. That's my top priority. Otherwise, we're all doomed. Who will protect the others? The door to the cage is ripped open as I cock my head and watch the demon, the smile still on my face. He's still facing my direction and I'm certain that he is going to go for Trinity. They always take the small and meek ones and she's put on the best show for them. But then the unexpected happens. Claws close around my upper arm and I don't have enough time to register what's going on before I'm pulled past the bars. They're taking me, which means I'm totally screwed. Chapter 4 Asmodeus, the fire in the hearth across from me roars as though in tandem with my thoughts. The snapping and crackling of the embers fill my too silent room, echoing off of the tall ceiling as I stare into the hearth. Warmth kisses my bare skin, the pleasant sensation a snide reminder of how vulnerable I am without my armor and hood, how separate I must keep myself from the world around me. Ultix has grown weary of this game we've been playing, and I no longer know how much time I have left before everything collapses. The souls of the human women seem to be enough to keep my god happy thus far, to allow me to continue in his favor. But with each passing day that favor wanes. There are only so many solutions to the problem before me, and none of them allow me to continue with my people the way I have been. Familiar ire begins to rise in my chest. I have worked too hard, too tirelessly to allow this life to be taken from me now. I am a king, by title and right, and I have dedicated myself to my people. I'll be damned if I allow it all to fall apart now. I push myself out of the armchair, pacing across the worn wood floors. Perhaps an unbroken soul, broken right as it is sacrificed, will be more potent. One of the feral ones forced to bow to my will, to Ultix's will, may provide more power to help keep Galmaleth afloat. Even if it only extends the inevitable by a few more days, I will do it. I need time to plan, rally my people, and prepare them. There has to be some move that will keep everything from falling apart. I just haven't found it yet. As if by instinct my hand trails toward the amulet hanging around my bare neck. Perhaps if I were to directly call upon Ultix again, find out what it is that I can offer to maintain Galmaleth as it is. No, I tell myself sternly, yanking my hand away. Hot shame prickles across my skin as I realize what I was about to do. The fact that I even called upon Ultix once is enough to condemn me in the eyes of every demon in existence. To do it twice would surely mark my end whether at Ultix's hand or my own, in an attempt to regain the only shred of honor I have left. Besides, there is no telling how such a summons would go, even if Ultix did deem to answer it. His wrath is not to be toyed with, and the god clearly no longer has an interest in entertaining me. He could expose everything, ruin everything, but instead the bastard seems content to toy with me. Thunder claps in the distance, as if the god has sensed the direction of my thoughts and is issuing a warning. I gulp against the sudden tightness in my throat, shaking off my train of thought. There's no use brooding. I know what must be done. Drarun! I bark, shattering the silence of my room. Scuttling echoes outside my door before the knob turns, the blind demon appearing in the doorway. Yes, hooded one? Dress me, immediately. Draran springs into action, whispering hurried orders to the other blind servants lingering outside. Another two join him as he gathers up my armor and hood the three of them working in tandem to robe me and settle the heavy armor over my shoulders. I watch them work in the reflection of the large mirror on the wall, watching as everything that makes me a demon, or recognizable as something of this planet or any other, leeches away. By the time the armor is strapped across my shoulders and the hood is placed and carefully arranged around my horns, I no longer bear any resemblance to something of this plane. I loosen my hold on my chaos, allowing it to pulse around the hooded figure I see in the reflection. My horns spiral up and back from beneath the heavy hood, obscuring my face entirely save for the gleam of my eyes in the shadows. Every inch of my skin except for my hands is covered in a similar dark fabric, adding to the theatrical image and allowing my armor to take center stage. The black armor resting from leather straps at my shoulders seems to swallow the light around it, 
the ornate gold edges gleaming subtly in the dancing firelight. Seeing the subtle indentation across the breastplate makes my throat constrict suddenly, and I have to push away the memories that try to rise to the forefront of my mind at the sight. My king? Draw ran in tones from behind me. I'd all but forgotten he was here. Where is the woman? I ask, anxious energy pooling at my fingertips. I do not relish this duty, but it must be done, as much for my people as for me. They are preparing her as we speak. Good. You are dismissed. Drarin leaves with hardly a sound, but I don't allow myself to fully exhale until the door shuts behind him. I'm on more uneven footing than I have ever been, not just because of everything that's happening with Ultix, but because of my own damn mind. Memories of home plague me. The events that led me here repeating in every quiet moment, robbing me of any semblance of peace. It's as if I'm still trapped in that God's damned war, still fighting for my life any time I try to take a breath. I feel as though I'm battling the gods themselves, all just to eke out some semblance of life for myself and my people. It is as exhausting as it is infuriating. But I have no time for rest, no time for weakness. I did my best, I tell myself. They would have all died were it not for me. There is no changing what has been done, and the memories will plague me for the rest of my life. I collapse back into the chair by the fireplace, staring into the flames once more, as I wait for the woman to be brought to me. A growing dread swirls in my stomach, as if in warning of something to come. I face too many unknowns, too many threats to my empire right now. That must be why the memories have grown worse, harder to ignore. As if summoned by my thoughts of them, another memory, one of my most frequent tormentors, surfaces and swallows me whole. Ikoth stretches out around me in my mind, the earth black and rich and the sky a brilliant red, as if stuck in a permanent glowing dusk. A sudden, burning longing fills me at the sight of my home, at the vivid smell of damp earth and constant wind that even my memory cannot dull. There are many times that I wish for nothing more than to return to Ikoth, but even in the midst of my memory, I know I can never do that. For all my longing, Ikoth was as much hell as it was home. The terror of constant war, the powerlessness that permeated my life there, all begin to flood back as the memory surges forward. The Dazeneth mare beneath me flies like the wind, the roaring constant hoofbeats behind me echoing across the plains like a war drum. Soil is kicked up with each of her hoofbeats, but I ride her harder, push her to go faster. The distress signal went up nearly an hour ago. With every second that passes, we will only lose more demons, and the Zafan's victory becomes more imminent. I glance over my shoulder, my battalion following closely behind. The Ikoth flag is raised, blacks and bloody crimsons fluttering in the wind. The grim, determined set of the faces of my soldiers pushes me harder. Faster! Stay on your guard! We're nearly there! I encourage over the din, returning my attention to the path ahead. It winds between two embankments, and hardly over half a mile ahead, we should reach the clearing. The distress signal came from. Black earth rises on either side of us as we ride faster, picking up speed as we near our destination. The embankments make it seem as though we are riding into the belly of Arasak itself, deep into the planet's core. As the waves of earth crest over us, I can't help but remember the dread I felt in this moment, as if I knew it was all about to go wrong. I try to steel myself against the inevitable gore waiting for us, but the anxiety of battle roils in my blood nonetheless. How many soldiers will I lose this time? How long until all of the demons under my care are claimed by this brutal war? I'm so lost in thought that when I see the first glimmer of gold at the top of the steep embankment surrounding us, I don't react. It's not until the second flash of gold, contrasted by a snatch of white, soft feathers, that the panic overtakes me. Zafan! I roar, yanking the reins of my Dazeneth, but it's too little too late. Countless Zafan, far more than the demons I have at my back, appear at the tops of the embankments. We're trapped. All of us will die. Flaming arrows scorch past me as I dive off of the back of my mare, rolling to the ground. I hardly have time to recover before Xaphan is upon me his symmetrical face twisted into a hateful roar as his blade clashes against mine. The tang of blood fills the air, the sounds of battle punctuated by the agonized screams of my soldiers. There's too many of them. We're never going to make it. A knock wrenches me from the memory, forcing me back into the present, the flickering flames of the fire replacing the scene that has tortured me since the day it occurred. My heart pounds wildly in my chest, my palms slick as though I was just in the middle of battle once again. I take a breath, trying to regain my control and willing steadiness I do not feel into my voice. Enter.
Chapter 5. Ciara. Claws bite into my upper arms as I writhe in the demon's grips, snarling and kicking at anything I can reach. My toes skid across the marble floor as I grapple for any kind of foothold, but despite my best efforts, we do not slow down. I can't remember the last time I saw anything of what lies beyond the dungeon doors. But now that I'm faced with the sight of the palace yawning open around us, I can't help the awe and dread that mingle painfully in my belly. The sounds of my struggle against the demons holding me echo off of vaulted ceilings, made louder by the dark stone of the walls and floors. Hallways wide enough to fit whole armies begin to narrow as I'm led deeper into the palace, the ornate sconces and beautiful paintings adorning the walls, becoming fewer before they're replaced entirely by nothing but cold, empty expanses of stone. The complete lack of extravagance tells me we're heading away from the main part of the palace, but I don't know if that's something I should be glad for or not. Keep moving, the demon to my left hisses, jerking me forward so hard that I lose my footing. I stumble, certain I'm about to fall when the other demon jerks me upright at the last second. I grip my teeth against the cry of pain bubbling at the back of my throat. I don't want to give the bastards the satisfaction. They're stronger than I am and have thwarted my every effort to get away. But that doesn't mean I have to fall into the submissive role they so clearly expect of me. We round a corner suddenly and are greeted with a sudden blast of heat and near deafening noise. Demons of all types move about in the kitchen, chattering and squawking to one another over the clatter of pots and pans. The smell of real warm food makes my mouth fill with saliva, my stomach screaming in protest as the demons drag me through the hustle and bustle of the kitchens toward a small, nondescript door on the other side of the space. Demons fall silent as I pass them, the feeling of all those unnatural eyes pressing against my skin, only heightening the fear swirling through me. A part of me wonders if I should renew my efforts to get away, having far more potential weapons available to me here than I did in the hallway, but my desperation to avoid whatever waits for me beyond that door pales in comparison to the fate I'd meet at the hands of this many demons. I'd be lucky to make it out in one piece. Hell, I suppose I'm lucky to still be in one piece. I swallow the fire raging inside me, promising myself that I'm just biding my time. I'm not giving up or giving in. I'm lying in wait. The small comfort that thought gives me dissipates quickly into confusion as I'm shoved past the small door in the kitchen and into the room beyond. A huge porcelain tub takes up the majority of the space, flanked by a small wooden dresser and what looks to be a vanity, complete with a simple oval mirror on the wall behind it. Two servants stand on either side of the tub, and it's with no small amount of relief that I note that they look far more like people than the animalistic trolver demons who dragged me here. The door slams shut behind me, and I only realise that the demons who escorted me have left when their razor-sharp talons on my arms are replaced with the soft, firm hands of the servants within. I start up my desperate fight for freedom immediately, snarling and scratching at the demons, but their hands don't budge. Feverish panic begins to swell in my throat. I have half a mind to scream, despite knowing that no one would come to my rescue, but don't get the chance before the demons thrust me into the scalding water of the tub. A bucket of water is dumped unceremoniously over my head, filling my open mouth and drowning the scream building behind my lips. I choke, clawing blindly at the demons around me. I blink the water from my eyes, sputtering and gulping down heaving breaths as I take a good look at my new captors. They are, as I initially noticed, at least more human looking. But when I finally take a good look at their faces, my blood comes to a standstill in my veins. Where their eyes should be, there's nothing but a deep, empty gouge, as though a shovel was dragged across their eye sockets. Patches of ill-formed, scarred skin stretch blankly over their empty sockets, and a new, feral type of fear grips me. Are they going to take me to whoever did that to them? Is that what they might do for me? Primal terror grips me, and I begin to try and fight them off again, kicking and snarling and snapping any time their hands get near. One of the demons manages to grab me by the back of my head their long fingers winding into my dark hair and holding me steady. Behave, the demon behind me scolds sharply, as though I were merely a petulant child throwing a tantrum. I scream my frustration, fighting against the hands wound into my hair harder, but my struggle only earns me a sharp, blinding pain across my cheek. Stars dance across my vision, and for a moment I can only sit stunned in the bathtub. If you do not behave, we will be forced to bind and gag you, 
Do you understand? The demon snarls in my ear. I nod, trying not to wince at the pounding ache radiating across my face. If they bind and gag me, I'll have no way to defend myself. So, at least for the time being, I have to sit still. I only hope another opportunity for escape presents itself before it's too late. The demons mistake my sudden stillness for submission and go back to work, scrubbing the dirt and grime off of my skin and out of my hair. If the circumstances were different, I might actually enjoy getting to bathe. It was a rare treat when I was in the dungeons, and even then, we typically had to use washcloths and the cold, dirty water the Trollvor provided in bowls to attempt to get clean. The blind demons move with a deftness that seems contradictory to their lack of eyesight, never faltering in their movements. I find myself wondering if perhaps they're able to see by some magic or spell, but it doesn't matter. They clearly aren't at as much of a disadvantage as I thought, which just reinforces that my only choice is to bide my time and hope that there will be an opening for escape. I stew in my own thoughts as the demons pull me from the water, one of them rifling around in the nearby dresser. No one who is taken out of the dungeons ever comes back, at least not whole. I've heard the women whisper about what happens to those who are taken, but I never fully allowed myself to consider that those rumours might have substance beyond the terrified whisperings of prisoners. The king who presides over the demons, King Asmodeus, is rumoured to hand out the women in the dungeons to his most brutal and vicious generals. Some women say that they eat the captives they take, and others say that they're used as a commodity. But whatever the truth is, I don't plan to be used for either. For anything, if I can play this correctly. Arms up, the demon by the dresser commands as he turns back toward me. I obey, lifting my arms over my head and trying not to cringe at his sudden nearness as he slides a thin white gown over my head. The fabric is almost entirely sheer, draping around my body and putting nearly everything on display. I wait for his next command certain that I'll at least be wearing something over this sorry excuse for a dress. But it never comes. Instead, the demon at my back guides me to the vanity, shoving on my shoulders and forcing me to sit on the stool. The demon drags a brush through my long, knotted hair, working out the mats as I stare at myself in the mirror. I haven't seen my own reflection since before I was taken from Pratheca, and the difference in my face alone is shocking. My skin is no longer the golden tan it once was, having sallowed to a sickly yellow colour. My cheeks have hollowed out from lack of real nutrition, and the dark purple smudges beneath my green eyes look more like war paint than the badges of exhaustion they are. Still, despite my shocking appearance, I keep my chin lifted. I will not break. I will not show weakness. I won't allow them to rob this last bit of defiance from me, no matter what else they may take. Even as I try to steal my resolve, however, my stomach hollows out beneath a horrific realisation. The bathing, the dress, the grooming. All of it seems intended to dress me up. Make me more appetising somehow. A shudder rolls through me faster than I can suppress it as the word appetising crosses my mind. That may be far, far too close to the truth for comfort. Before I have time to linger on the thought, the demons are leading me from the small room and back through the kitchens and winding servants' halls. It takes hardly any time at all before we're back in the main rooms of the Gilded Palace, and with every step I take forward, my blood thrums louder in my ears. There's no escape. At every turn I lefuke for an exit, a window, a potential weapon, anything to aid me in my attempt to escape. But there's nothing but latched doors and more demons. With every passing moment, the reality of my situation grows harder to ignore, desperation clawing behind my ribs. I'm hopelessly lost at this point and have no idea how I would possibly navigate myself out of the palace, much less where I would go if I even did manage to get out. The demon's grips on my arms become lighter as we draw closer to our destination, as if they can sense the fight beginning to drain out of me. We turn yet another countless corner and the sight of the hall has fingers of ice dancing down my spine. This hall is even more ornate than the others, with plush crimson carpeting meeting my bare feet and elaborate sconces and paintings dripping with gold. My heart hammers wildly in my chest as my eyes land on a massive set of gilded double doors. Whoever sent for me is clearly high within the demonic ranks, or else they'd never be settled into a place with such obvious finery. One of the demons reaches around me to knock lightly on the door, and after a moment of silence, a deep velvety voice echoes from within. Enter. 
My knees wobble, and I clasp my hands together tightly in front of me to try and quell their shaking. Beads of sweat begin to pool at the back of my neck, sliding down my spine, as the demon wordlessly opens the door and guides me into the flickering, firelit room beyond. My mind vacates as my eyes land on the figure lounging in an armchair beside the hearth. A massive, cloaked demon in ornate armour, black enough that it seems to swallow the light, is leaning back lazily in the chair, one leg perched carelessly on the adjoining footstool. I can't see his eyes, or any distinguishing features for that matter, but I can feel the weight of his gaze on me like a physical touch. Two large, dark horns curve up and then away from his hooded face, shadows seeming to pulse and dance around him. My breath hitches in my throat, but I keep my chin lifted, staring him down. I've been brought to none other than the Demon King himself. Chapter 6. Asmodeus. She's beautiful. I don't know what I expected, truthfully. When I requested that they bring me an unbroken, untamed soul, I expected a creature less desirable. And yet, here she stands, her sharp green eyes bright with defiance, her chin lifted as though she were looking down at some sewer rodan rather than the king of demons. For all her bravado, however, her scent betrays her. The heady, thick scent of fear coats my room in a matter of seconds, rolling off of her in dizzying waves. It's almost admirable how little her face or body language betrays what she's truly feeling, but I suppose in the end it only speaks to the nature of her soul. Unbroken and untamed, exactly as I requested. Leave us, I say, waving a flippant hand at Draron and Tilek, who are still loitering by the door. They obey immediately, but it's not until the door clicks shut behind them that I allow my eyes to return to the woman before me. It's a shame to know that her soul will be ripped from her corporeal form, that I will be the one to have to force her to yield it. It's a necessary evil, done on behalf of my people, and yet... The thought makes me feel something akin to sadness. Strange. I don't know that I've ever felt sad over a human before. I fight the urge to shake my head, mentally clearing my thoughts. The silence stretches on between us, and I find myself waiting to see if she will react like the others before her, if she will scream, or cry, or beg for her life. She does none of those things, however, and I find it only draws me to her more. What is your name? My voice resonates in the confines of my room, shattering the tense silence, and the woman stiffens at the sound. For a moment, I don't think she's going to answer me. Ciara, she responds curtly. Even her voice is beautiful, strong and soft at the same time. I know what must be done, and yet... I cannot resist the urge to know more about her. Do you know who I am? I ask, as I rise from my armchair, drawing myself up to my full height. She is tall by human women's standards, but I easily dwarf her. Despite having to look up at me, however, I get the distinct feeling that she is still looking down her nose at me. It is a peculiar skill, one I cannot decide if I like. You're a kidnapper and a murderer, the woman Ciara snarls, that cold facade cracking beneath the flames of her anger. I smile beneath my hood, glad that she can't see it. Anger is always an interesting coping mechanism. Ah, uh, but I am far more than that, I respond smoothly, stepping toward her. Ciara does not flinch away, although her hands tremble from where they are clasped tightly in front of her. Her full lips twist into a snarl as I take another step toward her, putting myself within arm's reach of her as her green eyes harden. I'm not scared of you, Ciara spits, and I cannot help the dark laugh that slips from between my lips. Your bravado is inspiring, little human, but your scent does not lie. She stiffens, her cheeks flushing an interesting shade of crimson. Before I can resist the temptation, I brush the bare pads of my fingers across it, needing to know what that color feels like. The second I touch her, however, what little control Ciara was exerting over herself snaps. She flies at me like a feral animal, her fingers bent into the shape of claws. I evade each of her blows easily, sidestepping her swings and backing out of the range of her long legs. Ciara snarls, launching herself at me with renewed vigor after I deflect her initial blows. I can't help but admire the sheer tenacity it takes for such a feeble human woman to try and challenge the King of Demons, and I find that I'm almost… enjoying this. Her leg lashes out, her bare foot very nearly catching me in an undesirable place before I catch it, holding her ankle firmly in my hand. It's almost laughable, the way she hops on one foot and scowls at me before ripping her leg from my grasp. I do not expect you will get very far in this attempt. 
I warn her. Ciara's only response is to pick up a vase off of the nearby side table and launch it at my head. I duck, air whizzing past me, and she's launching herself at me again before the vase has even hit the floor. I deflect the flurry of blows she tries to rain down on me, knocking her arms away before she can do any damage, blocking one blow after another. Nearly all traces of fear are gone from her scent now, and I can't help but wonder if this is as cathartic for her as it is entertaining for me. Before I realize what's happening, her hand winds in the thick material of my hood, and an innate panic that's been drilled into me for the past several decades takes over. I shove her off of me with far more force than necessary, grabbing the material of my hood out of her hand before she can unmask me. Ciara flies off of me, slamming against the wall with a resounding crack and crumpling to the floor. For a moment, I'm only capable of standing there in stunned silence. Have I killed her? Before I can think twice about it, I'm kneeling over her, gathering her unconscious body into my arms. Her skin is as soft and warm beneath my hands as it looks, and all of a sudden, I can't help but marvel at how fragile she feels tucked against my chest, so at odds with the fiery woman who stared me down. I cross the room quickly, laying her out on my bed. Her face is smooth and blank, as though she were simply resting. But that does little to quell the gnawing panic rising in my stomach. I try to tell myself that this panic has nothing to do with my interest in her. She must be conscious for the soul cleaving to work after all. That's why I have to wait for her to wake up. Minutes seem to stretch into hours as I stare down at her unmoving form. How do I wake her up? How does one take care of an injured human? Does she need water? Blood? I'm seconds away from shouting for Argeg when Ciara lets out a soft, throaty moan, her brows knitting together over her still shut eyes. It's all I can do not to heave a sigh of relief as her lashes flutter open. For some reason, an apology springs to my lips, but I swallow it before it can shake free. You must behave, I growl instead. So I've been told, Ciara mutters, her eyes squeezing together as she shifts to sit up. This will be over much more quickly if you listen. Her eyes fly open at that, the piercing green of them so near that I nearly jump backward. I didn't realize that I'd drawn so close to her while she was unconscious but now I'm painfully aware of the way my body hovers over hers, the heat of her breath mingling with mine. I clear my throat, drawing back to give her, and myself, a little more room to think. I'm not in the business of making things easy for you, Ciara replies after a moment. The spike of fear in her scent betrays her once more, but I cannot fault her for that. Her ability to retain her composure in the face of her fate is a testament enough to her will, and I don't doubt for a moment that she does not plan to make anything easy for me. I must be silent for too long because Ciara shifts uncomfortably, chewing the inside of her cheek with that all-seeing gaze leveled at me. Why are you doing this? She asks eventually, as though unsure of whether to ask the question at all. It is what must be done for my people, I say without thinking. I immediately regret the words as they come out of my mouth. Any good king would relish rising to the needs of his people, and my tone of voice alone displays enough weakness to ruin me. Ciara doesn't seem to mind, however. She does not recoil in disgust from my obvious reluctance, but instead looks at me curiously. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, she responds softly. I bark out a laugh, the sound surprising me nearly as much as it seems to surprise her. I cannot remember the last time I really laughed, I realize. A tentative smile quirks at the edges of Ciara's lips at my laugh, her eyes sparking with curiosity. I shake my head my laughter dying in my throat as the reality of our situation comes crashing back in. If only you knew how true that is, I find myself replying, shaking my head, in more ways than one. Well, true or not, I meant what I said earlier. Which was, I'm not going to submit to you just because you seem... Ciara trails off before shaking her head, that familiar steel creeping back into her eyes as she returns her gaze to me. I won't be a toy for you to fuck, or your next meal, she adds eyeing me as though she fully expects me to try and eat her. I might laugh at that, if the true purpose for her being here wasn't equally, if not more so, nefarious. I have no interest in your body for either of those things, I say, forcing myself to stand from my chair. I turn my back on her, pacing to the hearth nestled in the corner. I try to tell myself that I know what I must do, that this woman's soul could make the difference between the survival of my people and complete annihilation, but the thoughts are little comfort. Perhaps allowing my curiosity about Ciara to run wild was a mistake. It has made it all that much harder to imagine ripping the fire from her body. 
When she does not respond, I turn back to her, her wary gaze pinning me. Then why? She asks. I can see even from here how tense she is, as if she's going to spring up at any second to try and make a break for it. The delicate muscles of her throat bob as she gulps in anticipation of my answer. For your soul. Cloying fear radiates from her at my words, her eyes widening slightly. With the other women, this was the moment I waited for. The sheer horror of what awaited them broke them, and in that breaking it was all too easy to take from them what Ultix demanded. But with Ciara, I find myself hesitating. I won't let you take that either. Her voice is shockingly steady compared to the fear wafting off of her. But I should expect nothing less from her at this point. The sudden weight of my weakness slams into me like a boulder. If the price for my people's safety, for the security of my reign, is this woman's soul, then why am I hesitating? I should have cleaved her spirit from her body already, and yet here I am, delaying and simpering like some spineless child. Fury erupts behind my ribs at my own unworthiness of my position, dragging unwanted memories to the forefront of my mind that I struggle to push back. With no other outlet other than the woman in front of me, I wheel on her. I'll do as I wish, I snap, my voice growing louder with every passing word. I am the king of demons, the savior of my people, and I will do what needs to be done. And how could stealing my soul possibly help your people? She retorts, venom in her voice. I growl my frustration, biting back the answer that springs to my lips. I owe you no answers, no apologies, nothing. You're just a human. I spit. Indignation and fury color her features at my words, her mouth opening to form her response. I have no interest in hearing what she has to say, not when her steady gaze and fiery disposition have already urged me to say too much. Something about the way that she looks at me leaves me feeling exposed, like cold air on an open wound, and I'm not interested in being examined any further. Draren! I bark, turning away from her. The demon is in the doorway immediately, as though he was waiting just outside. Hooded one? Take her away. I'm bored of her. Draran dutifully hurries past me, and I hear the rustling of fabric against skin as he pulls Ciara from the bed and leads her from the room. Despite my best efforts, I'm unable to avoid her gaze before she disappears around the doorway. An emotion I can't quite read settles on her face, the split second of our gazes clashing seeming to stretch on forever. A useless well of panic opens up in my chest as the door shuts softly behind them. She's seen too much, she knows too much, and yet I was unable to do what must be done. I have failed, in every measurable way, and now I know that I must pay the price. Chapter 7 Ciara The dungeon doors open, and the king's servants walk me inside. I barely feel their hard grips on my arms, sure to leave bruises due to my confusion and fear. He could have done anything he wanted to me. He had me, conscious and unconscious, right in front of him. So why did he leave me alone? Why call his aides to take me back to the dungeon? Fear hits when I wonder if he has something worse planned for me. What if I wasn't what he wanted, and now I'm going to be killed anyway? I guess it wouldn't be much better than if he had killed me, but I will admit it was nice to be out of the dungeons for a while. The girls look at me with wide eyes and shocked faces. I avert my gaze from theirs, feeling conflicted about my own return. I don't know why I feel ashamed for being brought back to the dungeons. I should be happy, even relieved. But I feel like I failed somehow. Maybe there was a subtle test he gave me that I didn't pass. If there was a visual representation for the questions running through my mind, I imagine it would be like different colours of paint mixing together. A group of colours, and once they all blend together, they make an undesirable brown. The servants throw me into my cell, and I stop myself before hitting the concrete wall. I look at the wall before me, blank and damning. I wonder if I should have done something different when I was up with the king. Not so that he could steal my soul, but so that he wouldn't have sent me back here. I close my eyes and hear the aides leave the dungeon, slamming the door behind them. While I wonder why I've been sent back down here, I'm also eternally grateful that the only thing he took from me today was my time and being caged in a dungeon. I have plenty of that to give. The girls immediately start whispering amongst themselves before Trinity calls my name in a louder whisper than the others. I turn around slowly and walk to the edge of the cell and meet her there. Before I can ask what she wants, 
The other girls swarm me, and I'm hit with a barrage of questions. How did you get back? Why did he release you? Is it because of what you've taught us? What was it like up there? Did you escape them? Are you in trouble now? I shake my head and close my eyes, trying to block out their questions. My thoughts are loud enough on their own already. I don't have the capacity for theirs, too. Also, I don't know what to tell them. They're asking me the same questions I've been wondering myself. I hold out a hand to stop them, and they quiet down as I exhale, gathering myself. I look at them and shake my head again as I look at the ground and put my hands on my hips. I don't know why I'm back, I admit, wishing I had something more exciting to tell them. What do you mean? Trinity asks. You have to know why they sent you back. What happened up there? I shrug. Nothing. I... My mouth remains agape as I look at their curious faces. He just sent me back. I don't want to tell them that the king wanted my soul. These girls don't need anything more to scare them. Looking at their faces, I realise their eyes look hopeful because I found some magical way to defeat the king. I purse my lips and walk away from them, returning to my corner as I run my fingers through my hair. My fight with him was useless, but I wanted to ensure he knew I wouldn't back down without one. I also wish I had the opportunity to ask him some questions other than the ones I did. The most important one, of course, was what are you going to do with me? I also want to know why he kidnapped so many of us, why he wears a hood over his head, and how he got to where he is today. Also, I would love to know why he wants my soul. I sink against the wall and fiddle with my fingers, watching the slow movements as the questions repeat in my head. The girls are still whispering, and I'm glad they are. I don't want them to ask me any more questions because they won't get any answers that would satisfy them. The next day, we're awakened by the slamming of the dungeon door again. As I yawn, I lift my head off my arm and blink a few times, the memories of yesterday flooding back quickly. They walk toward my cell and begin opening the door. I should stand up. I know they're more than likely here for me, but I don't want to admit that a part of me wants to return. The curiosity I have about the king outweighs the fear that's been plaguing me since I arrived here. When his servants motion for me to stand, I do. I don't want to find out what the consequences would be for disobeying them. I'm already worried the king will steal my soul. Do I want to be brutally beaten before that happens? I think not. I walk toward them and let them grab my wrists. They don't have to, I'm going willingly, but I also don't want the girls to know I want to see him again. If they think I'm betraying them somehow, it could break them. Not that I don't have faith in their strength, but I know what betrayal feels like. It's not something I would wish on my worst enemy. I'm walked out of the dungeon and back to the king's chambers. They open the door, and I hold my breath as I'm ushered in. He's sitting at his desk in an expansive library off to the right, his hood draped over his face as usual. I wonder how he can read with that thing on. It must be tiresome to walk through life when your vision is obscured. My liege, the servant says. He waves them off and stands up as they close the doors behind me. Did you sleep? He asks in his dark, brooding tone. Barely, I reply, crossing my arms. But at least I didn't have nightmares about my soul being stolen. That was nice. Fuck. I think as the words exit my mouth. Maybe being so aggressive right now is not the best idea. I like your banter, he says, much to my surprise. It's been a long time since I've enjoyed a back and forth with someone. I'm being held captive. This isn't really a back and forth. That's what I mean, he replies slowly before sitting back at his desk. He motions for me to sit in one of the chairs in the library, and I do, sceptically, paranoid he might have booby-trapped it. I try not to let my fear show, though he has to think I'm not afraid of him. The doors to the library open, and I turn around to see servants walking in with trays of food. I look back at the king, confused, as a plate is put in front of me and the other before him on his desk. He waves them off again, and I look at the food sceptically as he begins eating, the fork disappearing into the darkness of his hood. You're not hungry, he asks between bites. How do I know the food isn't poisoned? I ask flatly, crossing my arms again. He laughs a low, dark chuckle that sends shivers up my arms. If I wanted to kill you, you'd already be buried. He's not wrong. He could have yesterday or today before the food arrived. Since I'm starving and I've been held captive for days, I deserve a treat. 
I spear one of the pieces of meat on the plate with a fork and put it in my mouth, rubbing my tongue over it, trying to detect poison as if I knew how it tasted. He chuckles again. It's been good weather today. I look out the window and see cloudy skies. I guess demons don't care much for sunny skies. Moreso, I frown and take another bite, wondering why he's talking to me about the weather. How are the girls? He asks slowly. They're being held captive in a dungeon. They're starving and terrified and want to return to their families. They're fine, I reply in a dull tone. I can't help myself. His audacity makes me irritated. You know, living the lives of captives. He chuckles again. And what's that like? Oh, that's right. I smile as I chew my food. You wouldn't know what that's like, right? You're just the kidnapper. I'm much more than that. Then why do you wear that hood? He freezes, his arm hanging over his plate as he holds a fork full of meat. My heart begins racing, thinking I've gone too far. He slowly stands up from his desk, and I remember how tall he is, only adding to his intimidation. Excuse me? I gulp, but I can't walk my words back now. Besides, I want to know. Why do you wear that hood if you're an all-powerful king? Why disguise yourself? He remains silent and turns around to look out the window, holding his arms behind his back. I look at his hands, seeing his light grey skin for the first time. I put my fork down and close my eyes, damning myself for my smart-ass mouth. I am badly scarred, he says darkly, from the events that brought my people and me to Galmaleth. I don't wish to see them on myself, much less for others to see. I close my eyes and fold my lips. I'm... I'm sorry. It must have been difficult to have gone through that. I mean, opening a portal, losing your home planet and then reigning over this one. That's a lot of pressure. Yes, he whispers as he slowly turns his head over his shoulder. It has been quite taxing. His whispers intimidate me more than his yelling. It's like he has many secrets underneath that hood instead of a face. At first, I thought the hood was an intimidation tactic. But now I feel guilty for assuming. I also feel guilty for feeling guilty. Why do I empathise with a tyrant trying to steal young women's souls? As I watch him sceptically as he walks in front of his desk and begins to pace before it. I look at his stance, pondering and brooding. I can vaguely make out the shape of his body beneath his robes. He's big yet lean. The robes are baggy, enough to hide any sign of muscles, but I can tell he barely has any fat on him. The silence that falls between us pierces my being. It's the loudest thing I've ever heard besides his robes dragging on the library carpet. I look down at my plate, not wanting him to see me watching him as he walks back and forth. The sound of his robes scratching the carpet stops, and I look up at him. He's stopped pacing and is facing me. He holds up a hand and points to me with a long grey finger. I'm claiming you. Claiming me? I react more than respond, standing from my chair and facing him. Need I remind you that I won't be your slave or your food? No. He dismisses my comment with a wave and begins walking around his desk to his chair. I want you for neither of those reasons, and it's been a while since I've had someone to talk to. He stops mid-pace after saying the last sentence briefly before continuing to walk to his chair. He sits and folds his hands in his lap, his hood raised enough that I can tell he's looking at me, even without seeing his eyes. I've decided you'll be my companion. He exhales as he says the words, and I try to process them. Companion? What does that even entail? That kind of sounds like I'm going to be fucked, I think, but I don't want to express my concerns. I've already pushed him far today and I was petrified after I asked about his hood. I don't want to scare him or myself anymore. I nod slowly and look at the floor before looking up at him again and taking a deep breath. Fine. What? He asks as if he's confused. I said, fine, I respond, more confused than he is as to why he's surprised. He's a king for God's sake. He stands and clears his throat before lifting his chin toward the door and waving his hand, beckoning for someone to enter. I turn around as the doors open and see his aides ready to serve him. Take her back, he says darkly as he waves me away. The servants grab me and I leave his chambers, 
the paint mixing in my head again as I replay our conversation. What does this mean for the other women and me? Will another's soul be taken because he wants me for something else? Why did he pick me? More importantly, how am I going to escape him? Chapter 8, Asmodeus. I watch the girl I've claimed as my companion smile as she walks into my bedroom. I feel delighted, almost giddy, as the image of her lying on my bed crosses my mind. Almost instinctively, she walks to my bed and sprawls on it, smiling at me like she's been waiting for this moment. I stare at her legs and thighs through her sheer white dress, my heart pounding. She's captivating, almost intoxicating, when her body is wrapped in my sheets. I need to see more of her and she needs to see me. I slowly reach my hands up and push my hood back, watching her face intently for a response. What I expect to see are shock and terror, but her lips curl into a devilish grin. I stand before her, unmasked and craving her, not her soul or flesh. I want to make her mine, and I want her to like it. She lifts a finger and pats the bed, beckoning me to her. Like I've been put under a spell, I walk toward her, taking my robes off slowly as I stare at her pouting lips. I undress in front of her, noticing her gaze over my abdomen as I drop my shirt to the floor. She sits up in bed and takes off her dress, the sight of the sleeves falling from her arms making me hard. My pants drop to the floor and her dress comes off revealing her curves and breasts. I look at the white thong hugging her hips, and I can't wait to rip it off with my teeth. I climb into bed next to her and run my fingertips up her warm neck, leaning in to kiss her. Her eyes are slightly closed and she parts her lips as she looks at me with admiration. I lean in closer, her breath hot on my lips, craving her taste as she wraps her hand around the back of my neck. Our lips almost touch when her mouth opens wide and she screams. I cover my ears. It's shrill and sharp, and when I look at her, her face morphs into every woman whose soul I've given to Ultix. I close my eyes to shut out the images, and when I open them, I'm crouched in the corner of my childhood home. I turn around, the scream still piercing. My ears and see my mother shrieking from the other room, her eyes blank and hands shaking from the vibrations. I run to her to try to stop her and calm her down. When I get into the room, she whips around and stops screaming. The silence feels good in my ten-year-old ears. My hearing shouldn't be damaged yet. Her hand grips my arm, looks fiercely into my eyes, and points at the statue I broke as a child. Another valuable broken because of you, she shouts. Another valuable worth ten times as much as you, wasted because of your antics. She leans down and gets in my face, her eyes furious, and the scowl on her face horrifying. You will never be king. She stands up and begins shrieking again and I cover my ears. Darting out of the room, I run through endless hallways with twists and turns until I round a corner to the door to our garden. I open it, step outside and emerge the age I am today. I cry like I did as a child as I walk among the flowers and plants. I stop to wipe the tears from my eyes, and when I open them, my cousin Vagthamon is in front of me with a smirk. He folds his arms and stares down at me viciously, pointing to the door. Did you hear her? She's not right, I shout at him. I will be king. I do have what it takes. Prove it, he whispers before striking me with his hand. I jump onto him, throwing punches as I feel him hit my ribcage, and I cringe and strike back with an uppercut to his jaw. We roll onto the ground, and he stands over me beating me until my arms weaken, and I give up. I look at him from half-closed eyes, feeling the pain deepen in my body from his punches. He leans down and smacks me slightly, making me open my eyes wide as he scoffs and shakes his head. You'll never amount to me, he says darkly. I will be king and you. He pauses and leans in closer. We'll be forgotten. He stands up and punches me one more time square in the face. I shoot up in my bed, cold and drenched in sweat, looking around for him expecting him to be in the room. I'm breathing heavily. My heart rate begins to slow as I place my hand on my chest. I gulp and try to catch my breath. This has to stop. The nightmares have been constant, and they are consistently more violent. They began as dreams of my life before Galmaleth, of the good times, drinking with my friends in the army, having beautiful women and winning battles, feeling the adrenaline from the victory. They're terrible nightmares that always begin with the same thing. A sacrifice to Ultix. I must find a way to appease him, tide him over, and end this deal. I can't continue like this, or I'll be as good as dead. 
I call in Draron and Tilek to dress me. While these two are blind, they know the feel of the fabrics I wish to pair together. They dress me as I continue to control my breathing, trying to come down from the sickening feeling of the nightmare. I barely wait until they put my robe on me before I rush out of my room into my library. I walk in quickly, my strides long and powerful as I scream. Tolmond! My call echoes through the hallways of the castle. Bring me Tolmond! I whisk my robes around me and sit behind my desk. I watch the door intently, wondering what could take them so long. They know better than to keep me waiting. After minutes of listening to my rapid heartbeat in my ears, Tolmond enters my study and bows. I motion for him to come forward. What can I do? Bring me all the information you have on Ultix. I don't have time for his manners. I look at his face and see confusion flutter through his gaze. I fold my hands and lean forward, slowly cocking my head to the side. I watch him gulp and nod. Absolutely, my liege. I'll be back with everything I can find shortly. Tolman leaves my study and shuts the door behind him. I wonder if I should have entertained his formalities because now I'm alone again. My heartbeat pounds in my chest like a sledgehammer. My thoughts race so quickly that my mind goes blank and I feel pins and needles all over my body. I stand up and pace in front of the window, looking out at the rain every few moments, hoping the sight of it will save me. As I pace, I look at the shelves, hoping the titles of my books will distract me. Instead, I see the smooth stone on the shelf. I remember the feeling as I stare at it. It fits perfectly in the palm of my hand, and the smoothness detracts from its danger. It's the beacon that could repair my woes and destroy anything I have left to enjoy. It would summon the demons from Ikoth and has the possibility of bringing angels from Galmaleth with it. The tool would allow everyone to return to Arasak, a risk I've never known I could take. A stone. That's what would change it all. A fucking piece of rock. You're scared of rock, my thoughts scream. The mighty king, too afraid to hold a stone in his hands. A coward. A useless, worthless coward. The thoughts tip me over the edge. I scream, shrieking like my mother in my dream. I race to my desk and knock everything off it, throwing the figurines and books against the walls, hoping when they break, my nerves will too. It doesn't work. I run to the bookshelf and begin tearing books apart, letting the pages flutter to the floor as I growl and swear at the lined pages. My rage is untamed and primal, like a caged beast that hasn't eaten in weeks. I continue destroying anything I can find until one of my servants walks in cautiously. I turn around and look at him. In moments like this, I wish they could see my expression. He knows better than to disturb me. Why are you here? I shout at him. My liege, I heard the commotion. He pauses briefly and clears his throat. Maybe it would do you some good to take this energy of yours elsewhere? Are you telling me what to do? I growl, walking toward him slowly. He stiffens and looks at me fearfully. Perhaps you could take one of the girls from the dungeon, the woman you've claimed. And what? I snarl. Take out the energy on her, not the things you cherish. My rage intensifies as he speaks. How dare he speak of her like that? Like an object that can be thrown around and discarded easily. I open my mouth about to reprimand him, when I remember thinking I should have let Tolman stay. Her company might benefit me and create a distraction from the turmoil in my being. I stand tall, straighten my back, crack my neck, and look at the servant. Send her to the gardens, I command darkly. I walk past him and out of my study to the hallway. Walking along it, it reminds me of my dream last night. I reach the door to my gardens and breathe in slowly, worrying this may be another dream, and I will emerge as a ten-year-old boy again. I put my hand on the doorknob and step outside into the rain. I look at the red sand stretching over the gardens and sigh in relief. I'm still here. I'm about to walk deeper into the gardens when I hear the door open behind me. Turning around, I see her standing before me with a grin. My panic ensues. This feels like my dream. I stiffen and clench my nails into my palms, seeing if I can feel their sharpness. I feel it and relax slightly. I'm still here. She looks at me with slight confusion, but also I catch a glimmer of cheer in her eyes. Is she excited to see me? I wonder as she walks toward me quickly. My muscles relax as I watch her walk and feel my mind clear. She's about to reach me when the ground shakes and a loud crash sounds from the castle. I keep my footing strong and hold myself up on the quaking ground as she falls to her knees, catching herself on the red sand as she looks at me fearfully. It subsides, and I stand tall again, 
exhaling as I look down at her. She stands up and dusts her hands off, looking around frantically. What was that? She asks with wide eyes. A part of the electrical storms, I say as I turn around and motion for her to walk with me. She catches up to me as I pace and look at my feet in the sand. It was another quake, signaling that I'm running out of time. This is my warning, but she doesn't need to know that. I catch her looking at me and feel like she can sense my fear, and I must deter her from asking me questions. What is your passion? I ask her curiously. My what? Your passion, I repeat, not looking at her. Oh, uh, she chuckles lightly. If I had to say anything, it would be writing. Writing? I ask, trying to focus on her words. What do you write? I ask slowly. She tells me of writing poetry, tiny lines that carry the weight of emotions. She says it helps her in dark times, like pouring her soul onto a page. While I've never been a fan of poems, her voice soothes me, my muscles relax more, and I feel my mind return to a state of rest as she speaks to me. Chapter 9 Ciara I glance at him across the library as he scans his latest book. He told me he's beginning to study demon court politics. I asked him why a few days ago, since he's the king and he doesn't have a court, and he told me he was curious because he had heard about it before his life began here. I've often wondered about his backstory, but don't pry. It's been two weeks since he summoned me to his gardens, and each day has been a new adventure for us. I'm happy to have been out of the dungeon since that day, but I also find myself beginning to enjoy his company. The feeling makes me worried. I don't think I should enjoy the companionship of a demon king, but I can't help myself. Some days are like this. He reads and hands me a pen and paper to write. When I'm done, he saves the papers and has promised not to read them. I find it odd that a demon would promise. Such a thing, but I believed him when he said it. My trust in him has grown. He hasn't spoken any more of wanting to take my soul or tried to harm me in any manner. It's confusing to be grateful for a man not putting me in danger, as that's usually the bare minimum. On other days he wants to do more activities, like walking around the garden or showing me around the castle. I'm appreciative that he's let me into his life. I can understand how vulnerability would be difficult for a demon to comprehend. While he's been gracious and accommodating, something is still off about him. Something is lurking in him that I can't place my finger on, and I want to know what it is. He closes his book and sighs, turning toward me. I put down my pen and paper and look at him curiously as I wait for him to speak. He taps his fingers on the table before standing and walking toward the door. I think it's time for more training, he says lowly as he reaches the door. He turns around and beckons to me with his grey fingers. Are you coming? Yes. I say sheepishly, as I stand up and follow him down the hallways to the basement arena. He's almost charming. Sometimes I wonder if he's put me under a spell. Everything he suggests I get excited about doing, especially training. The other day, we talked about battle strategies he learned when he was enlisted in the Demon Army. I commented on how I've never known how to fight, and he offered to train me. At first I was nervous, but once we stepped into the arena I began enjoying his instructions. We reach the arena, a large sanded room underground, the walls filled with weapons. Instead of swords and machetes, we use wooden sticks when he teaches me new moves. He hands me mine, and we circle each other. Every time we begin, I slightly hope that his hood will fall off, and I can catch a glimpse of his face. Without warning, he spins around and strikes me from overhead. I block it with my stick and try to hit his torso, but he dodges it and swings it into my side, stopping right before he hits me. Again, he says darkly. He whirls around in the opposite direction and I dodge it. I try to go high and he goes low, hitting my shins lightly with the stick. I roll my eyes. If there's anything demons hate, it's weakness, and I'm certainly weaker since I arrived here. I want to be stronger, quicker, and as skilled as he is. Even becoming half as experienced a fighter as Asmodeus would be enough. I've never seen someone so sharp and calculated. I strike him without warning, and he blocks it before turning and trying to hit me from a high angle. I dodge it and press my wooden rod directly into his heart, grinning as I stare into the darkness of his hood. He slowly lifts his hand and lowers the stick from his chest. Good, you're learning quickly. 
I have a good teacher, I respond through heavy breaths. My heart is racing, and I feel myself starting to sweat. We continue to spar in the arena, backing away and toward each other to try and predict each other's movements. I'm learning that he likes to hit low, so I try to go high when I can. For most of the sparring session, he wins our duels. When he begins this round, I try to dodge his hit and trip over myself, falling onto the sand. He stands over me and quickly places the tip of his stick onto my neck, pressing down on it lightly. Something surges through me, more than the typical adrenaline. It's almost a feeling of want, a desire for him to press it deeper onto me. It's a dark thought coupled with an odd sense of sexual tension. I shake it off, telling myself I'm dizzy from the fight and hungry since we've only snacked today. He removes the stick from my neck and extends a hand to me. I grab it and stand up, feeling his cold hand wrap around mine. I haven't touched him before, at least not enough to notice how much his touch sends shivers through my body. Again, I tell myself it's the adrenaline. I've been through a lot since I've been here, and I wouldn't be surprised if my body and mind are playing tricks on me. We circle each other again, and I try to peer deeper into his hood, but all I see is darkness. What trips me up when I think about his face under the hood is I can never tell which part of me he's looking at, if he's looking at all. I think he's about to strike, but he holds out a hand instead, motioning for me to lower my weapon. I exhale and wipe the sweat from my brow, slightly grateful that he's had enough. My muscles are starting to ache, and sweat is dripping through the tips of my hair. Clean yourself up, he states as he takes my stick from me. You'll have to be pristine for dinner tonight. Dinner? I watch him walk to the wall and hang up our rods. We never have dinner together. Typically, he has it served to me in the new room he's gifted me. I stare at him with confusion and cross my arms, leaning my weight on my right leg. Will we be eating in one of our rooms? I ask slowly. No, he turns around to face me. You'll be joining me in the grand dining room. My heart thuds as I wonder why he wants me to be in the dining room. The nervous part of me thinks maybe it's something bad. Perhaps he's bored of me and wants to give me a last supper before he takes my soul. The rational piece of my mind tells me it's just a dinner, not a death sentence. All I can do is nod before walking out of the arena and up to the main level. He doesn't follow me, and I wonder why. But I don't dare to turn around. The fear rushing through me is too severe to look back. I climb to the third floor and walk to my room, closing the door behind me and leaning against it as I sigh and close my eyes. When I open them, I look at the door on the other side of my room and grin slightly. Asmodeus put me in the room next to his, and the door joins to his chambers. He told me he would never use it unless I knock on it first if I ever need something, knowing he's available. Any time is nice, but a small part of me wishes he would use it unexpectedly. I don't know where these racy parts of myself are coming from, but I shove them down as I notice a dress on my bed. I walk toward it and notice it's black and sleek with gold specks on it. It looks expensive, and the fabric is smooth. It has one shoulder strap and a cutout on the side of the torso atop the train on the bottom. It's as racy as this new side of me, but I guess this is the demon's way. I hear a knock on the door and open it, being greeted by Dra Ran with a kind smile. I'm here to get you ready, miss, he states in his dark voice. Thank you, Dra Ran, I say as he walks inside. It's still odd to undress and be cared for by a blind servant, but he's very respectful and does an excellent job of caring for me. Most mornings, he'll wake me up and tell me where Asmodeus wants me to meet him, being informative and helpful if I forget my way around the castle in the morning. I shower, and I wonder about dinner again, while the hot water hits my face. It seems very formal, and part of me is praying we don't have any surprise guests. I'm not sure I'm ready to meet another demon. They already surround me. I get out, and Draran fits my dress onto me. Looking in the mirror, I'm stunned by how well it fits. I've never worn something that makes me feel sexy before, but I like the feeling of power the dress gives me. The powerful feeling strengthens when he pulls out the stilettos from under the bed. I feel like a sexy, confident woman, instead of a captive who has lost considerable weight in a dungeon. Draran braids my hair as my mind races faster. Before I can calm down, he leads me out of the room and down the steps. My heart pounds in my chest and my palms sweat, but I keep my head high as we approach the dining room doors. Here we go. 
I hope you're enjoying this production of Her Demon Daddy. Like and subscribe down below to help support the channel. This is at no cost to you, but helps me more than you know. It will also help update you when new audiobooks are released. Chapter 10. Asmodeus. The swirls lining the dining room table turn upward and toward the center. I've never noticed them before, but I've been sitting and staring blankly at them for at least an hour now. The more time that passes, the more stupid I feel. Why did I have to ask her to dinner? She must be wondering what the occasion is, and I've debated making up a false holiday to excuse my weird behavior. I've felt more of an attraction forming toward her for the last few weeks, something I don't know that I've ever felt before. She feels like a drug to me. All I want is more. More time, more conversations, more company. Tracing the swirls on the table with my finger, I think about earlier in the arena. There was a moment when she was on the ground, looking up at me, where I swore I saw something flicker through her eyes, a moment of attraction. That, coupled with her seeming excited to see me each morning, gives me hope, even if it is false, a fictional tale in my mind. This is the worst place for a woman like her to be. A human shouldn't be surrounded by these many demons consistently. Furthermore, it's a worse idea for her to be so close to the king of them all. I also know of the demons residing in this castle or this planet. Found out I was having dalliances with a human. They would rebel against me quickly. There were two specific instances when I reamed out my brothers and other demons for taking human brides. I always thought it was disrespectful to our kind to mate with them. Humans used to be nothing more than objects to me. Useless flesh capsules that should be thrown aside. Almost how Tolman talked about her the other day. I would be labeled a hypocrite and traitor if anyone knew I was doing this for any reason other than because I was bored. I could tell them I was using her for my own pleasure or taking advantage of her. That would be more accepted. The issue is that I would feel sicker speaking of her in that manner than being called a traitor. My thoughts are interrupted by the dining room doors being swung open slowly. I stand and adjust my robes slightly, wondering why I feel a need to do so, when I see Ciara walk in. My mouth drops and I'm thankful she can't see it. I knew the dress I picked for her would look great, but I didn't think it would look this amazing on her. The cuts on it show off her skin and slight curves beautifully, and the train sweeps behind her, almost like the dress demands her to be treated like royalty. Of course, she should be treated like royalty anyway. Her spirit commands it, and she doesn't even know. I close my mouth and watch as she walks through the dining room, gliding in her heels like she's walked in them her whole life. Her gait and looks make my hands sweat and my heart race. She smiles at me, and I don't know what to say. I'm too captivated by her, even more than I was before. It's not the dress or the heels that are making me unnerved, but how she carries herself in them, and she hasn't even spoken to me yet. Say something. I think as I watch Drarun pull out a chair for her at the end of the dining room table. She sits and adjusts herself in the seat. I sit down and think of what to say. Luckily, before I can do so, she speaks first. Thank you for the dress, she remarks happily. I want to clear my throat, but I don't want her to hear it. You're welcome, I say carefully, trying to be discreet as I clear my throat after. A terrible thought crosses my mind. Would she still be thankful if she knew how I looked beneath these robes? Would I receive the same smiling greetings from her if I removed this hood or told her the truth about my past? What if she knew how I got here? Would she still be excited to spar with me in the arena? I feel an odd twinge of guilt and shake off the thoughts, motioning for my servants to bring us dinner. Tonight, I ask them to prepare something more special than usual. There is a rare hog on the eastern side of Tilith that is only out of its hideout during the pause in electric storms, which isn't often. I have demons on that side of the island that are prepared to hunt it whenever the pause occurs and ship the meat to my castle. Ciara has excelled in her studies lately and also in the arena. Even if she doesn't know what she's eating, I figured she deserved a delicacy. Thank you, she says kindly to one of my servants. It takes me aback that she would have manners toward a demon. I don't know if I've ever said thank you to anyone but her if I've even said it to her. I motion to her plate and bow my head slightly. Please, eat. She takes a bite of her food and moans, nodding her head as she looks at me with piercing green eyes. I watch her lips move as she chews, and dangerous thoughts enter my mind. This is amazing. Her words break my fantasy. Thank you. Fuck, I just said it. What is going on with me? Why am I acting like this and losing control of my thoughts? She's a human woman, 
the least threatening being on the planet. If anything, she should be thanking me. Well, she has quite a few times. Maybe her empathy and gratitude drive me to feel this way about her. No, I'm not feeling anything for her. I remind myself as I eat. I still don't know what to say to her, but I catch her glancing at me a few times as I pretend only to be looking at my food. The dress looks nice on you, I comment, unable to stop myself. Well, thank you, she responds with a sweet smile. I almost feel like a secret agent at a gala. A what? What? You know what I'm talking about, come on. I shake my head. Please enlighten me. You know, like the women that wear the hot outfits and they're spying on someone? They go to some fancy gala and have to pretend to blend in, she says with mock seriousness. Uh, I don't know what else to say to that. Maybe that's what I'm doing with you, she remarks playfully. What? I grin. Spying on me? Oh yeah, she says with a joking face. I've been sending reports back to my people for weeks. Your people? I chuckle. Mm-hmm. My heart drops. What if she's not kidding? Could Altix have sent a human spy for me? No, he wouldn't. That would be stupid. She could not get information back to the other humans anyway. Are you serious? I ask nervously. No, Asmodeus. She laughs. Really? I laugh and wipe my mouth quickly. You never know. Ugh. She sighs and throws up her hands with a grin. How did you know? I laugh again. King's instinct, I guess. What the fuck am I doing? I'm laughing with her. I can't be doing this. She shouldn't be here. It was a terrible idea to ask her to dinner. The thoughts make me shut off my smile. She can't see it, so she keeps eating. I can't keep doing this. There are too many secrets about me that she can't know. If she ever found out, she would certainly not want me anymore, and she could ruin my reputation by revealing my identity to my servants. The deception I've been putting her through is extensive and unfair to either of us. After a while of me not speaking and slowly eating my food, I hear her sigh and look up to see a dissatisfied look. What's the matter? I ask slowly. Asmodeus, she begins as she puts her napkin in her lap. I can tell that whatever she says will not be good. This dinner was lovely. I appreciate the dress and everything you've done for me. She pauses as she leans forward on the table. But your moodiness is a bit concerning. I never know which side of you I'm going to get. You're either happy and excited, silent, or brooding. It feels like whiplash. I scoff and lean back in my chair, appalled at her audacity. Are you questioning my behavior? I am, she replies firmly. I stand and place my hands on the table, fuming. Know your place, human. She stands and mimics my stance. And what is that exactly, Asmodeus? Because I've been given a bedroom, training lessons, and the freedom to write. The other girls are locked in the dungeons, so I doubt I'm just a human to you. Enough! I shout as my hand hits the table. She shakes her head and I see the disappointment in her eyes. The look makes my chest tighten. I hear her exhale quickly through her nose. What's it all for, then? She asks calmly. The training, the walks in the garden, what's your end goal here? To spend time with you, bond with you, and show you that I'm feeling things for you that I didn't know possible. I can't say that out loud, but I have no other excuses. I didn't think of a cover story for this conversation because I never thought it would happen. Draw a run, I call out to my servant, who walks over from outside the dining room and bows to me. Take her away to her room. I'm done with her for the night. He tries to take her arm and she jerks it away. You know what, Asmodeus? She shouts. If you're going to keep me as a prisoner, act like it. Don't treat me like I'm something different just to make yourself feel better about keeping me captive in your sad, lonely kingdom. I sit down and pretend not to watch her as Draron retakes her arm. This time she pulls it away again and looks at him fiercely. Don't worry, Draron, I'm going. She looks me up and down. There's no reason for me to stay. Her words cut into me like a knife, and I sink into my chair as she exits the room. I didn't think she would stand up to me like that, much less that my treatment of her would anger her. I thought I was being kind and gracious, which is already very outside of my nature. I'm disappointed she doesn't see it that way. Chapter 11 Ciara. There are four things I could easily break in my new bedroom. A small glass ball on the bookshelf, the mirror on the wall, and the heels of the stilettos I wore last night. I'm sure there are more creative things I could come up with if I wanted to. 
but my mind is too scattered to focus that much. Fury has clouded my thinking. I was barely able to sleep last night after my confrontation with Asmodeus. He's treating me like I'm important to him, but telling me to remember my place as a captive. I've started to question my reality, wondering if I've been making up a connection with him in my head these past few weeks. I'm not crazy. I have to remind myself of that. Things aren't adding up, and it's beginning to make my head spin. Why would he buy me a dress and invite me to dinner in the grand dining hall if he wasn't thinking of me as more than a captive? Why do I have my own bedroom? I've started to feel a bond between us, and I thought he was feeling it too. Hearing him laugh and loosen up made me sure last night, and I knew I needed to confront him. I can't live in this weird limbo with him anymore, but after how last night went, I might have to. I stand up and pace around the room, biting my fingernails as I think about my outburst in the dining room. I wonder if I've ruined everything. Have I pushed him too far? A knock at the door makes me jump. I sigh, collecting myself before I open it. It's probably Draren, ready to dress me for the day. I hope he'll give me instructions to meet Asmodeus somewhere. Maybe he'll want to speak to me. I open it and don't look at him. I turn around quickly and sit on the bed, looking at the wall pitifully. When I hear loud, long strides, I look up and see Asmodeus walking into my room. I sit up straight and gulp as I look at him, expecting him to reprimand me for my actions last night. Will you indulge me with a walk in the gardens? He asks lowly. I squint my eyes and my brow furrows. I nod and watch him walk out of my room. I roll my eyes and rub my forehead with my hand, exhaling as I think about what I will say to him. Standing up, I adjust my shirt and exit my room, preparing for the worst. Opening the door to the gardens, I breathe in the fresh air. The castle is vast and open, but can still get stuffy, especially with so much tension floating around. Asmodeus is standing in the centre of the gardens, looking into the distance. I walk toward him and glance at the flowers blooming. It's impressive they can withstand the electrical storms of this planet. Once I reach him, I stand beside him, look at the horizon, and wonder where his mind is. We turn our heads to each other, and I glance at his hood awkwardly before he starts walking. I pace beside him slowly and feel the silence kill me every second. I can't take it anymore. I have to say something. I'm... I begin. Listen, Ciara, he says at the same time. Oh. I smile awkwardly and look away from him. You go ahead. No, you can. Oh. I pause and clear my throat. Well, I was just going to apologise for last night. I feel that my behaviour was rude and... I see a blonde-haired woman walking in the gardens in the distance. The more I glance at the woman, I recognise her. There's no way, I think as I leave Asmodeus's side and walk toward her. As I get closer, I see her walking with a demon. Asmodeus calls me from the background, but I disregard him as I walk closer to the pair. They're holding hands, and discomfort rushes through me as I approach them. Trinity! I shout. Trinity lets go of the demon's hand and whips around, flushed and glancing around with her mouth slightly open before half-heartedly smiling at me. Ciara! She brushes her hair behind her ear and walks toward me, rubbing her arm. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? I ask with a concerned look. She looks over my shoulder, and she and the demon simultaneously bow. I turn around and see Asmodeus approaching, his slow gait giving him that intimidating air about him. Your Majesty, the demon says with a gulp. The demon's eyes flicker to me, and I sense tension and suspicion coming from him. Rightfully so, I feel the same about him and Trinity. I grab Trinity's arm and drag her aside looking back to see Asmodeus and the demon watching us walk away. What are you doing, Trinity? Walking with a demon in the gardens? She looks over my shoulder and smirks. I could ask you the same thing. I maintain my concerned gaze, and she sighs and rolls her eyes. Listen, I found a way to survive and get myself out of that damned dungeon. I appreciate everything you taught me, but my ways just work. She pauses and winks in the demon's direction a little differently. But I... Ciara, Asmodeus calls out, interrupting my sentence. I'm fine, 
Trinity says as she takes my hands in hers. Don't worry about me. Go. I turn around and walk back to Asmodeus with Trinity beside me. Asmodeus turns his head, watching the two walk off into the gardens together. I watch them too, wondering if she knows the danger she's putting herself in. How did she even manage to seduce a demon? I admit part of me is jealous as I see them intertwine hands again, and she rests her head on his shoulder. I remind myself that she's doing this to survive. It's not real love, but I still feel that ugly twinge of envy in my chest. Asmodeus sighs deeply and turns his head toward me. You shouldn't do such reckless things. Me, reckless? She's sleeping with a demon. I can't have you running off and speaking to people when we're together, Ciara. What? I turn to him, frowning. Why not? Come, he motions as he turns to walk away from them. I follow him and feel embarrassed. What have I done wrong this time? I have always taken a more... He pauses. Aggressive stance on the notion of human and demon relationships. Seems a little hypocritical, I comment, crossing my arms. My defense mechanisms are coming out again. Yes, it is. He exhales slowly which is why I've kept my time with you secretive. That's flattering. I have a kingdom to look after, Ciara, he snaps. I have demons that look up to me. There are rules here, and we can't run around doing anything we want. But you can because you're the king. My throat gets tight, and I clench my jaw. My fists ball up, and I try to breathe deeply. I feel I'm being taken advantage of, hidden from the world. Is he that ashamed of me? I have been spending much time with you. You're correct. I look at him, surprised that he's getting vulnerable. And I can't tell you why I have been. The weeks have passed, and we've fallen into each other somehow. My fists unclench, and my jaw muscles relax. Hope returns to me as I wonder if he has also been developing feelings for me. I look at his hand by the side of his robes, and gulp as I think of doing something that could potentially land me in a perilous situation. I slowly reach out and intertwine my fingers with his. My chest vibrates as I observe his body language. His body stiffens for a moment before his fingers wrap around mine, and he puts pressure on my hand. Come with me. His hood turns to me. I want to show you something. His voice is low and quiet as he leads me back toward the castle. I wonder if I shouldn't have interlaced my fingers with his, but I don't pull away. I might be a stupid, naive human for holding on to him, but his touch is too exciting to let go. He leads me to his bedroom, holding my hand the whole way. His grip is tight but gentle, and my heart races as we enter his chambers. He turns to Draran and asks him to bring us dinner in his room tonight. My nerves are tingling. Why does he want to have dinner in his room? Did I mess up? Is he going to take my soul? Fuck. I always go too far. I hear him exhale as he walks around his room, fidgeting with his fingers. He looks around quickly at the walls and ceiling, and I follow his gaze, noticing nothing interesting where he is glancing. What is he doing? Finally, he faces and sighs. He holds his hands out, and I walk to him and place mine in his, my heart about to explode. You must promise not to scream, he asks quietly. I promise. I reply softly with my eyes wide and mouth slightly open. And you will speak of this to no one. I promise. His fingers pull away from mine and my arms drop to my sides. He lowers his head and pushes back his hood with his hands. The first thing I see are two black horns curling outward from his long, wavy hair. I breathe in slowly, preparing myself for what I'm about to see. He tips his head upward and looks at me dead on. I don't want to scream or run. I don't want to leave him. I don't see anything that would scare me. I forget to breathe as I look at him, my heart leaping into my throat at the raw, masculine beauty of his face. I hardly even think about the fact that I'm the first person ever to see the full face of the Demon King. Chapter 12. Asmodeus. She hasn't run yet, and I wonder how much I can reveal to her before she does. Deciding to experiment, I undo the armor over my robes and take them both off. I stand before her, looking into her eyes in only my undershirt and pants. 
Looking at her without my hood, I can see all her details. Her long black hair has strands that fall gently over her shoulder. Her green eyes sparkle in the lights of my bedroom, and her curves drive me crazier than before. She's seen the scars on my face, my horns, my hair, and my pitch black eyes. One of those elements alone would be enough to frighten a human, but she doesn't move. Her face doesn't change. She remains still before me with kind eyes, leaving me to wonder what she must be thinking. Could she be too afraid to run from me? Asmodeus. She pauses and steps toward me. I want to back away, but I stand firm as she gets close. You're so handsome. I laugh, shocked by her statement. I shake my head and look into her eyes, feeling like my chest has opened to her. She could reach into me and rip my heart out within seconds. You don't have to lie, Ciara. I'm not. She pauses again as she slowly reaches for my face. I cringe slightly, and she stops her motion and looks into my eyes before doing it again. Her fingertips brush over my cheek, and shivers rush through me. I close my eyes and focus on her touch, my skin fragile and sensitive from years concealed in darkness. Why do you hide your face if you look like this? I open my eyes and look into hers deeply. I chuckle and gently take her wrist in my hand as I lower it from my face. I doubt anyone else would find me as attractive as you do. I want to tell her the real reason I can't reveal myself. I want to end this deception game I've been playing with her, but I can't. If this didn't take her from me, knowing the truth about who I am, will. I can spin in those thoughts for hours, but she reaches to touch my face again, and I let her. I close my eyes again, and the hair on the back of my neck stands up as my lips part slightly. I lean my face into her soft hands before looking at her again. I get lost in her, my thoughts cast out by her gentleness. I lean down toward her, lightly placing my hand on her waist. She looks down at it and lifts her chin to me again. She's still not running. I lean down more and look into her eyes before moving my gaze to her lips. My lips press against hers softly, and I feel her muscles relax as I press her against me. She throws her arms around my neck and kisses me back. I pull back momentarily, wondering what I'm doing before losing all sense of logic. I kiss her again, pulling her into my arms and sneaking my tongue between her lips. She finds my rhythm quickly, and our tongues dance in each other's mouth. After we finish, I'm lulled off into the dream world, a place I would rather avoid. It's the same nightmare again and again. I salute my cousin. Yes, sir. The distress signal went off ten minutes ago in Ikoth, and my cousin has ordered me to lead the battalion to provide aid for the other troops. I appreciate that Vagathemon thinks highly enough of me to have me lead this journey, but I still don't believe he's fit enough to maintain his throne. Yes. I gather the matrons and other demons we need and set off. We'll need a vast army to help us defeat the Zafan. They've come to desecrate our kind, believing their good is the only way of life. They don't know how foolish they seem with their white wings and robes. Their innocence has always been manipulation in disguise, and they deserve to die for their sins. We ride off on our horses, their red eyes glowing in the dark as their hooves shake the plains. Thunder rumbles above us, and the skies turn black. Ride on! I yell to my battalion as I kick my horse. It snorts and gallops faster, and I look behind me to see a Zaffin poaching one of my men off his horse. I continue riding. We must get out of the plain soon, and there's no time to wonder how they found us. I look back again and see Zaffin knocking my men off their horses and clawing out their eyes. I stop my horse and turn around as I wield my sword over my head. I strike one and see its blood hit the grass below, and as another flies above me, I try to attack its underbelly but miss. I ride around my men in circles, trying to kill the Zaphon that have ambushed us. They rage around me and strike me with their weapons, cutting me all over my torso. They came in numbers with a plan ready, and we are unprepared. More than half of my men lie dead on the plains now. I get off my horse and use my sword to fight them off. Two hit me at once, cutting either side of my face, and I hit the ground. One of my men spears one of the Zaphon in the heart, and the other turns to fight him. I stand up and kill that one slitting its throat with my dagger. I turn around, hearing a loud screech. I see a large Zaphan shooting down from the sky. I dash toward my horse and kick them to run toward it. I ready my sword, hoping to strike it in the heart before it can kill another one of my men. Before I get close, another one grabs my sword from my hand. The brute takes off with it on one of our horses. I look ahead and see the largest Zaphan I've laid eyes on soaring straight at me. I can't die, I think as I clutch my amulet. I'm not king yet. 
I grasp my pendant and close my eyes. Altix! I scream as I get closer to the Zaphon. The Zaphon is about to spear me in the head when time stops. Everything slows down and I look around in shock. My men struggle to get up from the ground, moving in real time while the Zaphon move at glacial paces. I look ahead and quickly dismount my horse, staring at the thing that would have been my death. I don't dare question why this has happened. I run to my men and try to help them up before large fungi start sprouting from the ground, kicking dirt up violently as they burst and release gas into the air. My men start coughing and walking around in a trance. I try to shake one out of it, and he all but points at the sky and smiles. Why am I not poisoned? When will the time resume? How do I save them? I cannot tell if you are foolish or brave, Asmodeus. A deep, husky voice bellows from the sky. I turn around, looking for the source of it, but all I see are my men in hypnosis. What did you do to them? I scream as I throw my head back, looking at the dark clouds. You requested my help, and now you will receive it. There's always a deal, I whisper as I look at the ground. I don't want your help if I will have to owe you. Ultix chuckles, the clouds shaking from his voice. But you already asked for it. A bright blue light makes me flinch. It shoots down from the sky and lands on the grass next to me before opening up into a large circle. Dark purple lines swarm through it, and I can tell Ultix has sent me a portal. I look at my men in the Xaphon, my heart racing and adrenaline pumping. I have to decide before time starts again. In a panic, I get the men that have survived and bring them to the portal, pushing them through until I'm the last one left. I look around at the Xaphon and dead demons in the clearing and close my eyes. This better be worth it, I think as I jump in after my men. I tumble onto dry sand and cough it out of my lungs. Turning on my back, I look at a dark sky with lightning rushing through it. There are no Zaphan in sight. I get up and look around at my men. They're still tranced but getting their bearings back. I look up, see a castle high on a sanded hill and laugh. I did it. I whisper through chuckles. I saved them. I'm their leader. Chapter 13. Ciara. I feel my body turn over in the sheets as I begin to wake. The brightness shining through my eyelids makes me crack them, and I see Asmodeus sitting on the edge of the bed, looking out the window. The crack of sunshine in the stormy skies makes his contours even more defined, and I look at him in amazement. I can't believe he showed me his face, much less that he slept with me. I feel giddy and hopeful as I stare at him in silence. I wonder where his head is, as he leans back and the definitive lines of his back muscles flex. I remember how he held me last night before we came together. He looked into my eyes intentionally, like he wanted me to know how much he cared. I'm trying not to get too ahead of myself, but my feelings for him are getting stronger. They're to the point that I don't care that he's a demon. In my eyes, he's as much a human as I am. He's just taken a different path in life. We come from two different worlds, but we've been able to meet in the middle. Isn't that what all love is anyway? Still, I don't understand why he hides his face, and his servants in the castle have to be blind. Is he that embarrassed by his looks? He's gorgeous in so many ways. His jawline is sharp and accentuated, while his eyes are pure black. They reflect whatever's in front of them like a crystal ball, and his skin is light grey, which only makes his facial definition more prominent. I move slightly in the sheets, and the sound makes him turn around and look at me. He smiles, the first one I've ever seen on his face, and leans over the bed to kiss me. Good morning, he whispers. Good morning, I echo as I place my hand on his cheek lightly. He kisses it and stands up, the rays of the sun casting a shadow over the right side of his contoured abs. I have something for you. Oh, really? Yes. He holds up a finger and walks toward the door. I'll be right back. He leaves and at first I wonder why he didn't put on his robes. I sigh and shake my head. I keep forgetting all of his servants are blind. This is such an odd kingdom. I roll over closer to the window and rest my head on my hand as I look out at the landscape. The wind isn't blowing very hard today, so no sand is getting kicked up from the ground. The clouds look a little less dark, and part of me feels like the weather is almost reflecting my emotions. He enters the room, and I turn around to see him holding a tray of food, my mouth opens in shock, and I shake my head, chuckling. Sitting up in bed, I look at the display he's brought me and grin at him. His servants would bring us food. 
The fact that he got it for me himself makes me elated. I watch as he sets it down in front of me and feel him kiss me before I take a bite of the bread on the plate. Now, when did I become important enough for a king to serve me breakfast? I joke. He smiles, almost sadly, as he sits next to me on the bed. He looks at the sheets and I wonder if I've offended him. He recovers quickly and grins at me again. King is only a title. He pauses and looks out the window. That's something I wish I had learned a long time ago. He waves his hand and laughs awkwardly, almost as if he's dismissing his own comment, before he gazes at me. Will you let me take you on a proper tour of the palace later? Yes, of course, I exclaim. I've wanted to see more of the rooms that seem to be hidden among the long, winding hallways. Great. He stands and calls in his servants. I quickly pull the covers over me, horrified because I'm still yet to dress. Asmodeus, I whisper angrily. What are you doing? He chuckles as Draran and Argeg enter the room. They're blind, remember? I sigh and close my eyes as I let the sheets drop. I keep forgetting. I eat the breakfast he's made for me while I watch his servants dress him. They place his large robes on him, then load him up with his chest and forearm armour. I guess it makes sense, I think, as I bite into the dried meat. He's the king. He could get attacked at any moment. I have a light bulb go off over my head as a strange thought comes to me. However, I've never heard him talk about a threat to him on this planet. I get up from bed and let his servants dress me. He looks at me with bedroom eyes before Draran puts his hood over his head and his face disappears from me once again. I'm still excited that throughout the day I'll know what he looks like beneath it now. We leave his room and he takes my hand. I feel so happy knowing he's not afraid to keep me a secret anymore. I feel like he's as proud of me as I am of him. We walk downstairs and through a hallway in the eastern wing that I've never been down before. Weapons line the walls and the white tile floors make our footsteps echo as he brings me to a tall red door. Ready? He asks with a grin. Yes. He opens the door and I see a library much larger than the one he normally takes me into. It has two levels and there must be over 300 bookshelves holding various leather-bound tomes. I walk in with my mouth agape as I take in the beauty of it. Have you read all of these? I ask in astonishment. He chuckles. Not all of them, but I've come pretty close. I run my fingers along the beautiful gold-lined spines and look at the various names of the books. Some are fictional, it seems, with titles like The Demon and His Pastimes and A Meal for Fiends. Others seem more historical, with names of various battles and warfare. As I walk along an aisle in the back, I see one book that catches my interest. Poems from Hell, an anthology. I open it and marvel at the old yellow pages as I flip through them carefully. The poetry uses old language and some words I've never heard of before to describe various species of demons. The author also speaks of various kings and queens of the land, making me wonder where he resided when he wrote it. Before I can continue, Asmodeus approaches me and looks over my shoulder. I feel his warmth behind me and think I could melt into him like butter. He reaches along my arms to the sides of the book and closes it as he intertwines his fingers with mine. The fabric of his hood touches the side of my neck as I lean into him. Want to see something else? He whispers as his lips touch my ear. Yes, I reply as I reach around and press his lips against my neck. He takes the book from me and places it back on the shelf before leading me out of the library. The craving for him is so strong I can barely control it. We continue walking down the eastern wing until we reach an opening in the hallway that leads into a smaller room with various glass boxes lining the walls. I walk along them and peer inside curiously. They all seem to hold various artefacts, rocks, scrolls, and even what looks like a set of fossilised horns. I point at them and look at him. What are those? Horns of a fallen demon, the first death from old age in the kingdom. A little unsettling, but oddly sweet as well. I keep walking around the room in amazement. I didn't think demons would put so much time and money into ancient collections like this. Before I arrived here, I thought they were evil creatures who only craved blood, violence and manipulation. But Asmodeus continues to prove me wrong. You continue to surprise me, Asmodeus. How's that? 
Having collections of artifacts and numerous ancient books, it's something I wouldn't have thought a demon would put much stock into. I look at him, and he shrugs. Who doesn't enjoy beautiful things? I can feel his eyes on me from underneath his hood and blush as I turn back to the artifacts. Would you care to do some writing today? He asks from the opening of the room. I break my gaze from the artifacts and smile at him. Yes, that would be amazing. Come on, he extends his hand, and I take it as he leads me back to his study. We enter the room our relationship has grown in, and he closes the door behind him. I walk over to the shelf and grab my notebook and pen before sitting down in my usual chair. He takes his seat behind his desk and pulls out his book on demon courts. I'm inspired by the poetry book I looked over in his library but can't focus. All I keep thinking about was how he held on to me last night, gripping me like I would fly away if he let me go. I look at him from my notebook and catch his hood pointed toward me. I can tell he's staring at me, and before I get a chance to ask what he's looking at, he stands from his chair and walks over to me slowly. I get up from my chair and go to place my notebook back on the shelf. I turn around, and he is right behind me, leaning on the bookshelf with both his hands over me. You're not going to be able to write much today, are you? He asks in a low whisper. Absolutely not, I say through a heavy exhale as I lean up and kiss him, my face entering his hood as we find each other's lips. He picks me up and presses me against the bookshelves. I wrap my arms around him, and he walks me toward his desk. He sits me on top of it, the cool glass sticking to my rear. I run my hands over his rough battle armour and velvet robes as his hands grip my hips tightly. A knock on the door startles us, and he pulls away from me quickly while I hop off the desk and rush to the bookcase, running my fingers along the backs of them like I'm deciding which to read next. A demon enters and bows lowly to Asmodeus. I don't recognise him, but Asmodeus seems to know him well. He almost receives a different treatment than the other servants. A more familiar and friendly tone echoes from Asmodeus's mouth as they speak to each other. I've gathered the information for you, my liege. I look at Asmodeus, expecting a command to leave the study. To my surprise, he waves the demon into the room. Continue, Tolmond. There were only a few direct sources I could find on Altix, Tolmond begins. I try to tune out their words. I want to be respectful since Asmodeus has given me so much already. I can't help it, though. My curiosity keeps getting the best of me each time I try to tap out of their conversation. I only catch glimpses of words each time my mind draws back to their voices. Altix, demon god, storms. That's all I let myself hear. I turn around and notice a stone on the bookshelf across the room from me. It's about the size of my palm, maybe a bit larger, and it looks smooth. I can almost feel it in my hand now as I study it intently from a distance. It feels like the world stops and I cock my head slowly as I fixate on it. I begin walking slowly toward it like it's beckoning to me, not caring that Asmodeus and another demon are in the room. Thank you, Tolmond, Asmodeus says deeply as I'm halfway to the stone. His voice breaks my concentration on the odd rock, and I turn around to face him as he sighs and looks at me. I'm sorry, Ciara, but I have work I must attend to. That's all right. I smile innocently. I'll have my servants escort you to your room, and I'll be up to visit you tonight. Okay, I say gratefully as he calls Draren into the study. I walk out of the study with Draren and take a last look at Asmodeus before leaving. He's sitting in his chair at his desk and running his hands along his hood, seemingly stressed. I chalk it up to daily king matters, whatever those may be, and head to my room with Draren. Asmodeus should have been here hours ago. It's almost midnight and normally we have dinner at six o'clock. I know he's a king and has an entire world to run but I can't help but feel that something is amiss. My brain is on overdrive, and I'm too worried to pace around my room anymore. I'm surprised I haven't left tracks on the carpet yet. I put on a robe over my thin nightgown and wrap it around me tightly before opening the door and checking the hallway for any of his servants. Once I determine it's safe to leave, I walk down the stairs slowly and cautiously as I make my way to his study. I open the door and peer in to see nothing but a dimly lit room. He's not here and I frown. I think maybe he'll come back, and in the meantime I can do some more writing. I go to the shelf and grab my notebook and pen and sit down in my usual chair, scribbling words on the paper until I've written three poems. I sigh and look out the window, surprised at how much the stars have shifted in the sky since I sat down.
I roll my eyes and put my notebook and pen away, leaving his study feeling disappointed and even more worried. I'm about to close the door and look elsewhere when I see the stone on the other bookshelf reflect some of the light from the moon outside. I glance at the hallway and still see no one around. Slowly, I walk back into the study and gently shut the door behind me. I walk over to the bookshelf, the fixation beginning again. I don't remember picking it up. I don't know when I walk to the window to look at it in more detail. I snap to and inhale deeply, a bit unnerved by my sudden lack of memory. How long have I been here? How long have I held this in my palm? I'm about to put it back when I notice an oddly placed button on the back of it. Cocking my head to the side with blank eyes, I run one of my fingers over it. The button is more fragile. Than I thought, and it clicks down suddenly. I wait for a second to see if anything happens, then go to put it back on the shelf. Maybe it's another one of the ancient artefacts that he keeps in this room for some reason. Right before I set it down, it begins to glow a bright blue, the light illuminating the whole study. I can't look straight at it, or it hurts my eyes too much. As quickly as it began, the light fades. I panic, not wanting to stick around to figure out what that was. I leave his study quickly and gently close the door behind me as I dart to my room. Asmodeus might be furious if he finds out I've messed with his belongings. I hope against hope that it was a weird fluke, maybe some odd nightlight he keeps there, but my gut tells me it was something more serious. As if my gut could predict the future, the ground begins quaking violently as I'm halfway up the stairs. I sink to the ground and hold onto the banister as I watch the weapons fall from his walls and the chandelier shakes above me. What have I done? Chapter 14, Asmodeus. I bend over my altar, lean on it with my hands, and hang my head. Books are sprawled out along the side tables, some of the pages now ripped from my furious and panicked turning of them. I sigh and expand my cheeks as I exhale and shake my head. Nothing has worked in trying to contact Ultix. I've used Sage and Greensbriar in a potion, scried for him in the mirrors, and even spoken in tongues. I'm doing my best to use everything but my pendant. I've wanted to grab it almost every time I've tried something new, but at this point, I doubt even that would work. I look at the ceiling and breathe out through my nose as I close my eyes. I have a sneaking suspicion that Ultix doesn't wish to speak to me anymore. He's a chaotic god desperate for destruction, and I wonder if my brooding misery has proved him bored of my existence. He's probably moved on to other more interesting endeavors, desecrating whole towns, creating famine in various cities, anything he can do to watch more pain unfold. Mine has been consistent for years, and I haven't given him a human soul in a while to satisfy him. I look to the side and notice the moon high in the sky behind the dark clouds. I glance at the clock on my wall and see it struck one o'clock. Shit. Ciara. I quickly clean up my altar and glance at the books, almost getting lost in them before shaking my head. If none of these methods have worked, I doubt it would prove useful to scourge the texts for more failing options. Once the room has been straightened out slightly, I leave it and rush down the hallway of the third floor, worrying about Ciara. She's probably been wondering where I am for hours now. It's not like me to forget my commitments, especially not to her. But this Ultix mess has to stop soon. I can't keep living with this guilt and lying to Ciara. As I'm about to round a corner of the hallway, I feel another quake beginning. I lean against the wall and roll my eyes, knowing it'll last a few seconds and be over soon. It's another reminder that I'm running out of time. Only the quake isn't small, and it doesn't stop. Quickly, objects are crashing all around the palace, and I hear my servants screaming. Paintings and sconces are falling from the walls, so... I cover my head as I walk along the wall. One breaks over me, and I feel the glass shards cut my hand and grimace. I have to find Ciara. I walk down the hallway and make my way to her room. My servants rush by me and flee in various directions, screaming about the world's end. They couldn't be more right, but I'm sure this is just me cutting my time close. It's not over yet. I walk toward the staircase and pass my wall of windows. These haven't broken yet, and I shouldn't be standing near them, but a terrifying sight lies before me. Galmaleth is falling toward Pratheca quickly. My face flushes, and my body goes cold. I almost freeze in fear before I remember I need to find Ciara. I have to find her before we break ground in Prathika. She has to know what's about to happen, 
and I must prepare her for what we're about to face. She has to hear the truth from me before someone else reveals it to her. It's the only way I stand a chance of her still seeing me as the demon she thinks I am. I reach her bedroom door and open it quickly. Ciara! I yell into an empty room. The canopy of her bed has split in two, and her window has broken. I look at the floor beneath it, and I'm grateful she's not there but terrified about where else she could be. I walk to the staircase, still using anything solid in my path for support. I see her grasping onto the railing underneath the chandelier. I use the banister for support as I carefully step down the staircase to her. Ciara, I scream. Walk down the steps. She turns around, and I see she's been crying, and her face is more fearful than I've ever seen it. She nods and hurries down the stairs until she reaches the ground on her hands and knees before she pulls herself up on the wall. I reach her and look up at the chandelier that was above her. It crashes down onto the staircase, and I turn her around and press her against the wall, covering her with my eyes as the glass from the lights flies everywhere. After it's crashed, I look down at her and feel her trembling beneath me. I look around, seeing the door to my study close by. The window there is too big and could shatter in a second. A bright idea comes to my mind, my throne room. It's the most heavily fortified and insulated, only two doors past my office. Do you trust me? I yell over the shattering sconces. She nods between sobs, and I nod at her. We need to get somewhere safe, okay? I'm going to pick you up. Hold on to me. She nods again, and I carry her quickly down the hallway as more of my servants rush past us, and I bump into them and the walls as I try to balance us from the quake. We reach the throne room, and I put her down in front of the door and open it for her before walking in behind her and locking it behind us. Ciara, listen to me. I need to tell you something very important. Everything is about to change, and it's very important that you... Asmodeus, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. I was just... I didn't mean to. I'm so sorry. She sobs into her hands. I stare at her and frown, shaking my head. What are you talking about? You didn't mean to what? I... I... Her hyperventilating is stalling her words. Hey, hey. I kneel and almost fall over from the quake, but catch myself with my hand on the floor. I pull her hand down and get her to kneel with me, lessening her chances of falling and bringing us to the same level. I place my hands on either side of her face and look into her panicked eyes. Ciara, I need you to tell me what you did. When you... You didn't come to my room, I got worried and I... She buries her face in her hands and I pull her into my chest, putting my chin on her head and looking at the shaking throne room. I went to your study to look for you. And I waited and waited. But you didn't come. And there was this pretty stone on a shelf. What? I shout as I pull away from her, looking at the tears streaking down her face. I don't know, she yells as she shakes her hands, her fingers outstretched like she's trying to expel her nervous energy. I don't know what it did. It, it had a button on it, and I didn't mean to press it, but I did. And then there was this blue light, and I... She holds her face in her hands, and I look around the room. A cold pit forms in my stomach. My mouth hangs open, and my eyes widen. Rage flows through my blood, and I feel my jaw clench as I bite my upper lip tensely. I look back at her and grab her arms tightly, shaking her as I stare deep into her eyes. What have you done? I shout as I look around the room desperately. The tremors stop. After the sound of plates dropping and creaking of the castle's foundation, dead silence fills the tense air. Only Ciara's low sobs break the menacing absence of sound. I run cold and feel my face flush as I breathe heavily, my heart palpitating as I look at her. She's still sobbing, but I have no time to comfort her or explain what will happen. I stand up and grab her arm from the floor, looking around for any place I could hide her. The door to the main chambers, I think. I run toward it, grasping her hand. She keeps trying to resist me. Let go of me, Asmodeus, she squeaks. We round the corner in the throne room, and I see that the entryway to the main chambers is blocked by a fallen statue. I run my fingers through my hair and look around, the heat from running in my robes making me sweat. I turn around and try to take her back to the main entryway of the throne room, but she jerks her arm from me. What are you doing, Asmodeus? She asks through sharp inhales. What are you doing? I hear a loud bang and turn slowly toward the entrance to the throne room. My ears start ringing and I freeze. I stop breathing and my muscles tense as I stare at the doors, knowing the lock won't hold them for long. Asmodeus, she yells. I grab her and hold her head in my chest as I keep my gaze on the doors. 
The room isn't soundproof. She tries to beat my chest with her hands, but I hold her tighter against me. I look down at her, hating that I have to restrain her, hating that I let my charade go this far, hating myself for not locking up the beacon she held. What's going on? Stop. Stop talking, I whisper angrily, looking back at the doors. They're here. Chapter 15 Ciara, they're here. The words snap me out of the animalistic panic that's been driving me through the last few minutes. They? I parrot, my voice uncharacteristically shrill. They? Who's they? Asmodeus doesn't respond or even look down at me as the doors across from us nearly buckle under another devastating blow from the hall beyond. His grip on me loosens only long enough to shift me behind him. The protective set of every line of his body only heightens the new dread pooling in my stomach. He's the king of demons, the most powerful being on Galmaleth, maybe even Prathaka. So why does he seem so... afraid? Asmodeus, I beg, tugging on his arm. He goes rigid at the sound of his name on my lips, but still refuses to take his eyes off of the door to the throne room. What was that thing in your office? Who are you talking about? It's too late for questions, Ciara. We're out of time, he says over his shoulder. His voice is low, soft, as if he's afraid of being overheard. But there's a bitterness in his tone that doesn't escape my notice. His lack of answers does nothing to assuage my growing fear. Instead, it only fans the flames. What do you mean out of time? Why won't you answer me? I demand. I know I must sound like a petulant child, but I can't bring myself to care right now not when the palace and the entire demon continent was just careening out of the sky before slamming to a sudden halt. Asmodeus doesn't answer me. Instead, he seems to brace himself as sounds of movement, sounds of a lot of movement, more than just a handful of demons could make echoes from beyond the falling throne room doors. It sounds as if a veritable army were gathered outside, and the only thing that separates us from them is a pair of bowing, once stoic set of doors. Something suddenly clicks in my mind, pieces I didn't know I had falling into place. The dread that had been pooling in my belly turns leaden. The strange stone in his office, the way it glowed, its effect on Galmaleth. The way Asmodeus reacted when I tried to tell him about it. And now, the unknown presences trying to smash their way into the throne room, all begin to connect together. That thing in his office must have been a beacon of some sort, or a summoning device and by touching it I must have activated it. It caused the quake, and it summoned whoever the mysterious of the Asmodeus is so worried about to Galmaleth. They are not just any presence. They are enough to scare the King of Demons into a still, tense silence. And now they are in the palace, knocking down the doors to the throne room, which will lead them directly to us. I hardly have time to linger on the awful heaviness spreading through me at the thought before the doors blast open, the thick wood splintering beneath the brute force of that last final blow. The fragments of the doors have hardly hit the ground before looming shadows darken the doorway, strolling into the throne room. The first thing my eyes settle on are the demons. There are four of them, and while all of them are humanoid and not unlike those I've seen on Galmaleth, I know uncannily quickly that these demons do not belong here. It is not just the way they look around the palace with disdain, or sneer at the king standing before them, as if they have no regard for their own lives. It's something about the way they hold themselves. As if this combination of factors was not enough to make me suspect that these new demons are not from Galmaleth. Their companions are more than enough evidence to prove my suspicions. Behind the small group of demons, a half dozen winged males follow. I fight to keep the air in my lungs as I look at them, curiosity and awe and overwhelming terror mingling strangely in my chest. If the males were seen from a distance, they might be mistaken for some strange breed of winged humans. As they draw closer, however, their resemblance to humans diminishes. Each of them is devastatingly beautiful in different ways, the varying shades of their skin seeming to glow from within as though stars flowed through their veins instead of blood. Power radiates off of them, the symmetrical sets of their faces as haunting as they are alluring. My breath catches in my throat as the mixed group walks toward us, and my survival instincts immediately kick in, tallying up the number of intruders, 
and running our odds of survival. With Asmodeus's power leveled against them, I'm almost certain that we could make it. Running might not even be necessary. After all, he could probably destroy all of them in one blow, especially given that they're in his territory. I glance up at him, waiting for him to unleash some mighty blow or order the intruders to stand down, but he does no such thing. His shoulders are clenched together, his muscles wound tightly, and I get the distinct impression that he's waiting for some imminent blow. Why isn't he doing anything? As the group of intruders stride into the room, demons I recognise begin to flow after them, their eyes wide in shock and confusion as they glance nervously between their king and the strange group striding toward us. No doubt many of the demons of Galmaleth race to the palace after the quake, looking for Asmodeus to assuage their worries and explain what's going on. But Asmodeus pays them no mind. Instead, he only stares at the oncoming strangers. I must say, when we were tasked out to respond to the distress signal, this is not what I expected to find, one of the winged males says, as he steps forward from the rest of the group. Shrewd blue eyes assess us from beneath dark brows, power radiating off of his golden tanned skin. Dark wavy hair falls slightly in his eyes as he stares at us, his fingers twitching at his side as though he's fighting the urge to reach for the massive blade sheathed at his hip. Asmodeus doesn't respond, doesn't do anything as the male comes to a stop mere feet from us. Every inch of Asmodeus's body seems to vibrate with rage, and I find myself suddenly grateful for the hood that's obscuring his face. I can only imagine the wrath etched on his features. I am Theliel, General of the Third, the winged male says, placing a fist over his heart and nodding to Asmodeus. I am here on behalf of the Demon King and the Xaphan, chosen people of Solus. I know who you are, Asmodeus grinds out beside me, his deep baritone startling me. The formality of the winged male, Theliel's introduction was strange enough, but what is even stranger is his mention of the Demon King. Any soldier claiming to be acting on behalf of the Demon King would know that he's speaking to him. The hair on the back of my neck stands up as I mull over this latest realisation. Whoever Theliel is, or claims to be, we can't trust him. He's obviously lying. Oh, Theliel says, narrowing his eyes at Asmodeus. I wish I could say the same, but given the hood... He trails off, waving his hand dismissively. He stares as if waiting for Asmodeus to obey his unspoken command. When he doesn't, Theliel's lips curl into a cold smirk. You can take it off, or I will have it removed for you. You should have killed me when you had the chance, Angel, Asmodeus spits back. Theliel's eyes widen slightly, as if finally connecting the dots, before his smirk turns into a fully-fledged grin. With a mere glance at his companions, they're rushing forward. I stumble back, thrusting my hands up in front of me as if I could fend them off, but the Zaphan and demons pay me no mind, instead leaping at Asmodeus. He does not fight them, though he doesn't make things easy for them either. It takes four of them to rest him to the ground, forcing him to his knees before Theliel. Stop! I scream as one of the foreign demons reaches for Asmodeus's hood. I run forward before I know what I'm doing, my arm outstretched to knock his hand away, but a powerful set of hands grips me before I'm anywhere close. Ciara! Asmodeus murmurs, a warning and a plea all at once. I struggle against Theliel's grasp, but his iron grip doesn't budge, even as he hands me off to another Xaphan. The male's hot breath curls off of the back of my neck as he leers down at me, and I suddenly feel more exposed in my nightgown than I ever have naked. Keep your hands off of her, Asmodeus growls at the new Xaphan holding me, but the male doesn't heed his warning, instead dragging a slow hand across my exposed collarbones. I cringe away from his touch, fear and nausea flipping my stomach. Asmodeus lunges forward with a snarl, but the four males detaining him hold fast, lurching with the motion but not releasing him. Heartwarming, Theliel sneers as he walks to stand directly in front of Asmodeus. I wonder, why would she be so worried about maintaining your anonymity? Surely she's seen your face, if she's so attached to you. Asmodeus says nothing, staring straight ahead, and Theliel's smile deepens. Unless, of course, she knows why you wear your hood. She knows nothing of it, Asmodeus snaps, but the edge of fear in his voice is enough to spur me into action. Know what? About his scars? What difference does it make to you? I yell at Theliel, a sudden rage sweeping through me. 
I have no idea what's going on, and I am so tired of being pushed around. Thelial throws his head back and laughs heartily, stunning my sudden rage away. His laughter echoes around the hall, the demons and Zafin he brought with him laughing along with him. Scars? That's what you told her? He asks incredulously before turning to me. And you believed him? Shame prickles up my spine at his derision, but my tongue is leaden in my mouth, refusing to move. Shaking his head, Thelial wipes tears of laughter from his eyes before motioning to the males holding Asmodeus. Asmodeus's hood is ripped from his face, those strong, chiseled features exposed for all the world to see. His full lips are pressed into a thin line, his jaw twitching, and dark eyes gleaming with barely veiled rage. The throne room falls into a deafening silence, as if everyone within is collectively holding their breath. The silence only serves to make Thelial's voice deafening as he begins to speak once again. You know, Asmodeus, I do remember you. I remember running you through with my sword after cutting down countless other demons under your command. You led them to slaughter, and any male with honour would have died alongside them. I wonder, how many of the scars that litter your body are parting gifts of mine? Asmodeus's lips curl back in a snarl as he lunges toward Thelial again. But Thelial simply laughs, hardly even flinching at the sudden movement. I'm sure King Vagthemon would be very interested to know what his dearly departed cousin has been up to all these years. He searched for your body, did you know that? He thought you dead, and grieved you as if your blood meant something. And all this time, you've been parading around under the guise of his title. My cousin's title and mine are two entirely different things, Asmodeus snarls in response, but I hardly hear him. My mind is spinning, my knees weak under the weight of everything Thelial is saying. King Vagthimon, Asmodeus's cousin. And as if impersonating a monarch is not criminal enough. Thelial continues, oblivious to the way my world is crumbling around me. You've kidnapped hundreds of your king's people and forced them into false roles of submission. These are all executable offences, as I'm sure you're aware. Executable. Perhaps it would have been better, Thelial muses, a cruel grin twisting his divine features. If you had died on the battlefield, maybe then you would have died with at least some shred of honour among the men whose lives you were responsible for the men you failed. As if they'd been waiting for their cue, the rest of the room explodes, the demons Asmodeus has ruled all these years falling into a frenzy. False king. Liar! He's tricked us, glamoured us. Kill the false king. The screaming and hissing surrounds us, the crowd surging forward as if to take the blood they feel they're owed. The Xaphon holding me chuckles darkly, taking pleasure in the way Asmodeus's rule is crumbling so publicly. I can't breathe, can't think. All I can think as my gaze slams into Asmodeus's is that I must never have truly known this demon at all. Chapter 16 Asmodeus I look around frantically, seeing my worst nightmares come to life. My servants have rushed out of the palace, and upon seeing my face, Look at me like they're starting to remember. Some recognize me more quickly than others, and my entire charade has ended. I look at the ground, hearing the screams and hissing from the other demons encircling me, and hear a bone-chilling low laugh in the back of my mind. I thought Ultix had gotten bored of me and had moved on to another plan of destruction and chaos. I know now that this is precisely what he had planned. The years of isolation and regret for taking his deal were nothing more than tension-building to this fateful moment. He knew in order for it to hurt me this much, he would have to give me small premonitions in my dreams, and also something to lose. Ciara. Fuck the charade. I should have dropped it sooner. I should have told her the morning after we made love, and I had that flashback. I knew then that I was doing her a disservice, but my selfish fear entangled my heart and mouth, keeping me stupidly silent. I would rather have let Thelial kill my men and me on the battlefield that day than experience this. Not the real demon king. Fake, miserable bastard. The voices aren't anything new. They're things I've been thinking about myself for years. I've even debated suicide as penance for my wrongs, but I was always too afraid to go through with it. I look up from the ground and catch Ciara's gaze. She's frowning, and the look of sadness and disappointment on her face pierces my heart more than all the screams combined. She knows everything now. Even if she doesn't understand it now, the realization will come to her soon. Her face is pale. 
and while she should be looking around in fear at all these demons surrounding her, she's fixated on me. Maybe this is because she knows all the evil surrounding her can't amount to the evil deeds I've done, especially betraying her trust. I have to pull myself together. They can't see me as weaker than they already think I am. I lift my chin and cock an eyebrow, looking at Thaliel intensely. What has my dear cousin been up to? I ask mockingly. Well, I chuckle. If he's bothered to get his ass off of the obsidian throne. The large demon to my right strikes me, and I try not to move from its force, rather standing tall again and clenching my jaw. I want to drop the weight I've carried. I want to break and fall to the ground. But there's no place for that here, especially when I'm the outcast, the traitor, the disgrace of the royal family. You dare not speak of the true king in that manner. The demon barks as he walks toward me and stands over me menacingly. You will suffer enough for the disrespect you've already shown. I would suggest you not make it any more difficult for yourself. He looks me over like I'm a disgusting sewer rat. Asmodeus. I sneer and chuckle. Oh, really? And what's the price to pay for aligning yourselves with the likes of them? I motion to Theliel and the other Zaphan in the crowd. Is there no punishment for taking on an alliance with... I look at them and smile cockily. Angels. One of the Xaphon tries to come toward me, but Theliel stops them. The word angel has been considered a minimizing disrespectful term to the Xaphon, and if my life is going down the shitter anyway, I might as well try to stir the pot before going down. Do you not remember the war? I shout as I look at the demons. The desecration their kind caused us. Do you not remember the bloodshed, the losses, the agony our kind went through as a result of their actions? I hear Theliel chuckle, and I look at him as he approaches me the demon in front of me stepping aside to make way for him. Vagthemon is much better suited to be called king than you are, Asmodeus, if that is what you truly believe. Oh. He holds up a finger as he looks to the sky, then back at me with squinted eyes. I didn't know angels could look so evil. That's right. You were in your false palace, on your phony throne, with your imaginary title. He motions to the demons. They had no choice but to make a truce with us. Which, by the way, was very gracious of us to offer. You would have understood that if you had stayed around to help your kind instead of running off like the coward you are. He snarls as he steps closer to me. And while your kind isn't too happy about this, I look around at the displeased demons around me and wonder why they're not interrupting him. Zafan have been posted all around Ekoth to ensure that the holy rule and truce are honored. I have no rebuttal, but I can't let them know that. There's nothing I can do if the Zaphon have taken half the control, or even more than half, of Ikoth. I remain composed and look back into Thaliel's eyes. And what do you plan to do now? I pivot. Because I've been a great king and ruler to those that followed me. I pause for a millisecond, praying one of my servants doesn't say that I pushed them into the portal when they were in a trance. It was involuntary, but I would rather not highlight my wrongs more right now and Vagathamon could ever be if he made a truce with the likes of you. I watch Theliel bristle and inhale deeply, trying to control himself. Part of me wishes he would attack me so I could release some of the rage that's eating me alive. Instead, he smirks and begins to walk back to his followers. We will refer to demonic law to hold a trial for your misdoings, he shouts as he walks away. Yes, the demon next to me comments, along with your inner circle, of course. I scoff. And how will that work? I'm the true king. I oversee all the trials here. No, the demon laughs heartily. A real trial before the true king, here on Airsac. Fuck. I've studied demon court well enough to know that my punishment will be one of the more severe options in the court on Airsac. I try to get away from the Zaphon holding me back. I'm not sure what I'll do if I break free, but I know I have to. To my disappointment, they're stronger than I gave them credit for. My blood runs cold, and I look at my servants now standing with disapproving and furious faces. I can't let them go down with me. You already know they've been deceived, I yell as I continue struggling against the Zafan's grips. It's not necessary for you to drag them all back to Ikoth. The demon chuckles and steps in front of me again. And I should believe you? He scoffs. Some may have been tricked, but clearly they have some prior knowledge. Otherwise, they wouldn't have stayed around as long. Don't count us as stupid, Asmodeus. What do you mean? Ciara yells. The Zaphon holding her strength in their grip, and I see her kick them and bite down on one of their arms to no avail. She struggles fiercely as she should. Fury rushes through me, and I try to get out of their hold again. 
Let her go. She did nothing. She had no prior knowledge of any of this. She's innocent. I scream into the demon's face. I break my gaze from the demon's face to Ciara's, hoping to see empathy in her eyes for my demand to release her. My heart sinks when all I see is betrayal cross her face. I've never seen a more discouraging look from another being in all my life. The demons can send me to trial. They can execute me, torture me in front of the masses, and none of it would be more painful than the look in her eyes. I broke her heart, and in turn, mine as well with my selfish greed for power. Please, I scream. It's unlike a demon to beg, but right now I'm not considered much of a demon right now anyway. She's done nothing. You have to listen to me. The demon sneers at me and gets close to my face. Your inner circle and yourself will be escorted to Ersac. He chuckles before turning to the crowd. Along with anyone else who wishes to view the trial? The crowd cheers and I look around, seeing the faces as blurs. My heart rate spikes and I look at Ciara again. She's always known how to calm me down. She's always been my rock. But when I see the look in her eyes again, I realize she's not mine anymore. Good. She deserves better than all I've put her through. At the end of this lunar cycle, the demon declares to the crowd, in two days' time the trial will commence if you wish to attend. The crowd cheers again, and the demon motions for them to quiet down. Or, if you would like to return to your home planet that the false king has stolen from you, we welcome you back. The crowd cheers, and I watch one of Theliel's men open a portal. The blue light spins around in circles, reminding me of the one I opened on that fateful day on the battlefield. The Zaphon holding Ciara begin walking her toward it. Stop! I didn't do anything, please! She screams before they walk her through it. Please take me through the portal, too. I think, as the Zaphon gripping me walk me toward it. I feel strange gratitude, knowing I'm following Ciara, but also an omnipotent feeling of despair as they walk me through the shining blue light. Chapter 17 Ciara, 13 That's how many months it's been since I've been on Prothica. That's how long it's been since I've seen the sun or touched real grass or known what it was like for the seasons to change. I never thought I would miss the planet where humans were ruled by dark elves. But my life there had been better than the dungeons. On Prothica, we had toiled away and every day had been a threat. But there was a semblance of freedom. I had a purpose, a life, and the demons blew that up for me. And for what? To place me in a cage for an indefinite amount of time. I had been gone for thirteen months at least, that's what I think. In the dungeons it was hard to tell time. Without a sunrise or sunset I couldn't keep track. And we slept so often, being bored and starved, that I couldn't count on that either. But our meals were so infrequent that I knew they must come once a day. I counted each one. And I was on my 395th, when I was ripped from an island I was just starting to make my peace with. My mind whirls with that information, struggling to piece it together. Thirteen months, and my sentence was still going. Time may be endless, but I had never allowed myself to quite consider that. I'm not sure if it is the effects of the portal or not, but suddenly, the concept of time has lost its meaning with me. Maybe that's what happens when you only know four walls for a year. But all I can feel is my mind stretching. My body burns and hurts, and I feel like I'm being hurtled at a speed that should not be achievable. Am I even conscious? Am I even alive? I can't find the answers in here. All I can think is... 13. That's how many months I spent in the dungeons. Memories press against the back of my eyes. My first days there. I was shoved in an overcrowded cell with no one to cling on to. Cries and screams kept me awake at night until I felt suffocated with my own fear. I remember when the demons started to take people. I said nothing with the first. I ran away from the door, just like all the others, with the second. It's shameful, I know, but I was scared. And I felt so much younger than I do now. And then that door opened a third time and I lost it. Lost my will to live, my mind, my patience. It was all gone. What are you doing with them? I had shouted at the skull-headed demons. Their exposed jaws used to scare me, but at that moment... All I wanted to do was snap the bone that had no protection. You can't just take us like this. No one stopped me as I surged forward, and for that I'm glad. I do wish they had cared, even if it was an eighth of what I did. Maybe something could have happened. 
but they laughed as I shoved my way toward the door, and I stumbled at the last minute. The demon closest to me caught me by my jaw, stopping my fall and squeezing hard. It's not your turn, human. His beady eyes roamed over me. But soon, I'll see to it personally. But like always, he was lying. Because I sat in that jail for thirteen months more, suffering the pain of my failure as everyone else was taken, but me. Twenty-one. That's how many days since I met Asmodeus. Three weeks since I had learned that maybe not all demons were like the ones I had met. I knew the bone-headed demons. I knew the ones who looked too similar to dark elves that invaded my settlement. I even knew that there were some more powerful than the dark elves that held open the portals that ripped us from our homes. But I did not know there were demons with true hearts. That would look at me with kindness. That would pay such close attention to me. To be pampered in a king's bed, to have breakfast summoned for me. These were not things I thought I'd find on a demon's island. And yet with Asmodeus it was different. He was different, just not as different as I had hoped he would be. It might have been twenty-one days with him, but I'm starting to wonder how many days were real. How many were a lie? If I were to guess, I'd say twenty-one. Twenty-one days with nothing but winning me over by any means necessary and for what. I think I'm about to learn the truth. About all that has happened, and about him. That scares me even more than anything else I have faced. Four eight. That's how many hours we have until Asmodia stands trial. It's such a short amount of time in the grand scheme of things, and right now, it feels like my eternity. It shouldn't. It's not me on trial, and yet, the thought of it makes my heart throb and throat squeeze tight. Fear grips me harder, harder than it did when demons ran loose through my settlement or sneered at me between bars. Those forty-eight hours can stretch out to so long. 2,880 minutes, 172,800 seconds. The thought of having to make it through that long sounds unbearable, and I'm not even sure if I'll have Asmodeus by my side. Do I want him there? I don't know, but I've grown too used to having him, at meals and in my spare time. We were bonding, and even though he had hurt me a few times, I could tell it was never his intention. He just wasn't used to being near someone. I didn't expect the king to know how to spar. I had told him the first time he took me to the arena practice room. I could hear the grin in his voice and tell from his body language he was relaxed. He may have wanted to hide himself from me, but I could see through the cloak. He used it like a barra, and it was coming crumbling down. There are a lot of things you would be surprised to know about me. I'd lifted my weapon, weighing it in my hand. I'd nearly called back that the same could be said for me, but there was something about his voice that encouraged me to ask something that had been weighing on my mind. Tell me one of them. I know not to go too far. Why do you keep yourself so separated from everyone else? Most people would deny it, but Asmodeus wouldn't suffer me as a fool. At least I had thought so at the time. Instead, his answer was soft. Because it was what I was destined for. I think in that moment, I knew I wanted to show him he could have more. One. Only one night has passed since I met the man under the hood, and I cursed myself afterward for waiting so long. Seeing Asmodeus in his full glory, beautiful horns and toned body, made me regret taking so long to get there with him. I didn't care about a single one of his insecurities. Not his dark eyes that I loved, or his scarred flesh that I appreciated. And now, I don't know what to make of it. For him to tell me this secret, to let his guard down around me, it was shocking. I remember how hard he tried to hide it from me. He argued vehemently when I told him to remove it when we sparred, and once I ripped the fabric and he all but panicked. I'm sorry, I had shouted, as he twirled away from me, fingering the hole I had made. I don't know if he had even heard me as he murmured to himself about getting it fixed. Was it... was it something important to you? I thought it was just a cloak. It is. And then, as if thinking better of his tone, he turned his head and said much more calmly, Not the cloak, but the reason for it. I didn't ask then what the reason was. I could sense he wasn't ready to share it. But I wonder if I had. Would he have revealed himself to me sooner? Or was this more strategic than I had ever realised? To me, it had been three weeks of happiness getting to know him, and one magical night. But to him, what was it? I don't know if I want that answer. Now, as I dig through the past... I'm not sure how to interpret my memories. Each moment was special, 
and I started to see everything about Galmaleth in a different light. But no matter how much time has passed, not the thirteen months or twenty-one days or one night, I am no closer to the truth. In two days' time I will know more than I ever have, and I can only hope that my heart can take it. All the time in the world won't matter if it has all been a lie. Now the real question is how much time will it take to recover from this? Will it be days, weeks, or months, and how many? I can count out my past, of the things that have changed me, but I don't know what lies ahead, and that might be the scariest part, but I will just have to take it one at a time. One second, one minute, one day, and I had once hoped with one man. One. Chapter 18. Asmodeus. I step out of the portal, and my eyes adjust from the blinding blue light. Going through portals is never an easy feat, but after a while you learn to control the nausea and headaches. The trick is to keep walking. Don't stand still once you enter. Unfortunately, there's no trick to the momentary mind fog that creeps in after you land in the next world. Once my eyes and body adjust, I feel the heat on me. Ikoth is always hot, much warmer than Galmaleth. The heat rips through my robes, and I immediately start to sweat. I look at the ground and notice we're on a large hill. When I look ahead of me, I see the city right below the hill. Once my mind defogs, I look over at Ciara. I imagine the portal was rough on her human body. The magic that forms them isn't for the faint of heart. Even lower-level demons I've met have vomited or passed out from the intensity of the journey. The portal's magic reflects off of ours and if you don't have any in your system, it'll shoot right through you. When I first look at Ciara, I almost think she's a wraith that's joined us from another portal. She's flushed and looks like she hasn't been out in the sun in years. She glances at me slowly, like she's thawing out of something. Her gaze hits me, and I realize that she's not only this pale because of the portal. She looks like this because of what I put her through. I haven't only caused her emotional and mental damage, but physical now, too. If it wasn't for me, she wouldn't have shaken with the quake on Galmaleth. She wouldn't have bruises on her arms from the Zaphon holding her so tightly, and she wouldn't have gone through the portal. I open my mouth and get ready to call out to her, but the Zaphon whisks her away quickly. The two angels holding me turns me away from her, and when I look back, she's gone. I had too many chances to say something to her, anything to make up for or explain what's happened. I look ahead of me, my eyes tired and spirit broken at the city I used to call home. This is the first time I've laid foot anywhere near Ikoth in decades. Shit. It's the first time I've been back on my home continent in decades. The bright red sky casts an ominous glow over the black and silver homes lining the back streets at the bottom of the hill. The hot air has no mercy for plants, leaving only dead trees and dry bushes around the city. I think of my childhood home and wonder if it still stands. I've missed so much being gone for so long, and I don't know the extent of the changes. Zaphon having posts all over our city is the last thing I thought would happen. I don't know what else to expect, but from up here, my home looks the same as it did before I left. The sentimentality and nostalgia knock the wind out of me as I look over the city. I exhale and hang my head. Although it's sick to admit and probably insanely selfish, a part of me feels relieved. I feel like a weight has been lifted off me. I'm home and have no secrets to keep from anyone. I don't have to hide under my hood anymore. I don't need to keep the company of solely blind men because I'm ashamed of my deception. I didn't realize how much I missed it here until now, but I also know homesickness is the last of my worries. I have to find Ciara, prepare for the trial, and find a way out of the punishment. I can't die knowing I dragged her into my mess. I don't even know if they would sentence me to death. That would probably be too nice of a judgment for my crimes. The Zaphon lead me down the hill and through the back streets. I know where we are. Prazeth Street intersects with the Yikon Passage, the main road in the capital city, Sarzirok. These back streets are our version of rich human suburbs, although the foliage is dry and the homes are more gothic. We turn onto the Yikon Passage and I look ahead of me. The road is lined with demons, angry and jeering, and they line all the way to Vagthamon's castle at the end of the passage. Along the sides of the road, black and silver buildings spiral into the clouds. Being at the top of one is a beautiful sight. Vagthamon and I went to the top of one of them when we were children. I wish I could rewind time and go back, warn myself, and stop myself from becoming so selfish. I would love to be at the top of one of those towers with him right now as children before this mess began. 
I can hear the roaring and screaming of the city's residents as we walk closer, dead in the center of the road. We get closer to the castle, and I see Zaffin posted on the side and in front of the angry mob. I look at them with confusion, suspicion, and rage as I'm walked by. They don't look at me but rather keep their eyes straight ahead. Kill the traitor. Sick, disgusting excuse for a demon. Let him bleed out on the streets. Long live Vagthimon. I can only imagine what else they have up their sleeves as I'm brought into the chaos. The shouts and jeers continue, and the words shouldn't hurt, but they do. They pain me because, for decades, I knew this day would probably come. Either that, or the mob in my own head would have shouted these thoughts at me until the day I died. I look to my side and see one of our communal venues in the rubble. The townhomes that used to line the venue have all crashed to the ground. Gray and black bricks sprawled on the streets like pebbles in a creek. I look in the other direction and see more destruction on the northern side of town. One of the skyscrapers is split in half, and I can see the vacant rooms that used to be lived in hanging freely in the wind, cut cleanly open. We pass a side street in that direction, and I look over the crowd to see the other half of the skyscraper on top of hundreds of homes. I can only assume this is due to the war. I always thought Ikoth was impenetrable. We had the best warriors and guards on duty at all times. I hate to admit it, but I wonder if Vagthiman really didn't have another choice but to take the truce. I'm in disbelief and heartbroken that the structures are still on the ground. This isn't the Ikoth I grew up in. This is a city hell-bent on destruction, whose leader doesn't give a fuck about their well-being. As I see the furious faces of demons lining the streets being held back by Zaphon guards, I think of what it looked like before I returned. These streets used to glimmer and sing of royalty like the castle looming before me. As I look up at Vagthimun's palace closely, I realize the castle seems to be the only structure left intact, save a few cracks on the side that look like they've been patched together. Of course, Vagthimun wouldn't take care of the city in years, but would repair his walls within minutes. We walk toward the black, twisting archways leading to the castle, and I exhale as I prepare to enter through them. Right before we do, the Zaphon make a hard right turn and lead me down a side street. I look back, hearing the screams echo from the houses lining the passage, and a solemn thought occurs to me. I'm not going to see my cousin. I'm going to the dungeons. I don't try to fight it. If I do escape from the Zaphon's grip, where am I going to run? The entire city despises me. Ciara probably wants nothing to do with me. Ciara. Her name echoes in my head, and I close my eyes as I trudge forward. A montage of our memories plays through my mind, from the first moment I saw her, to the night we made love to when she told me she pressed the button on the beacon in the throne room. They lead me down the dark stone staircase underground before opening the solid steel door that leads to the holding cells. I walk in, looking around at the other criminals I'll be jailed with. It's only fair that I stand among them, but I can't just stay here. I have to get out. I have to find Ciara. I'm escorted to the back of the dungeons and thrown in a cell of my own. My body smacks the floor and I try to get up, my arms weak from the grip the Xaphon had on me. I manage to lift my head and look at the two that were holding me, staring at them and imagining I'm ripping their fucking heads off. Where is Ciara? I scream. Take me to my cousin! I stand up and grab hold of the bars of my cell as I watch the Zaphan walk away. I have royal blood, and I deserve to be treated as such. No excuse works. The Xaphan that escorted me here walk out of the dungeon, and a dungeon guard walks over to me. He's a demon, and I know his type. Probably fresh out of training, aiming to look good for Vagthamon and a complete hard-ass. Not that I have the power to convince anyone to help me, but someone more seasoned might have given me a better shot. Maybe you should worry more about yourself than that human bitch you brought with you. You'll most likely be executed anyway, so spend your last day thinking about that. He smirks and gets close to my face. Oh. And I heard Vagathamon has taken a liking to your precious Ciara already. Chapter 19 Ciara I meet Asmodeus' eyes after the portal, and can't maintain any sense of expression. My mind is too overwhelmed, and my body is drained. My world has been turned around so many times in the past few months, and this is the last time I think I can handle it. I see the sorrow in his gaze and desperation in his frown, but they mean nothing to me. I thought he had a semblance of humanity, and I feel so stupid for letting myself be tricked by a demon into thinking he was anything else. 
I wince as I feel my legs ache and arms droop over the Zafan's grip. If I had any more energy or emotional bandwidth, I would probably cry as the Zafan whisks me away from him. I don't look back. I've seen enough. The Xaphan drags me to the opening of a small road on the outskirts of the Gothic town. There's another one waiting for us there. The same one that confronted Asmodeus. I think his name was Theliel. I begin to hear screams and furious words from deeper in the center of the city. Although I'm furious with Asmodeus, I still worry about him. The crowd sounds large, and these demons and Xaphan are out for his blood. I don't know what demonic court. Punishments alike but I assume they're much worse than any type of legal sentence from my home. I expect them to take me toward the menacing sounds of fury and outrage, so I build a steel wall around myself emotionally. It's the only tactic I have left to protect my brain and my body from more damage. Instead, they keep walking me along the side streets. Good, I can't deal with anything else. Thelial exhales and grins at the other Xaphon holding me. We can breathe easy now. Finally. The other comments with a chuckle. I thought he'd never submit. Of course he did, Thaliel replies. He's too weak a demon to hold his own. Their comments are offensive and a delusional part of me wants to stand up for Asmodeus. I decide not to and instead follow along with them weakly and listen to their conversation. He didn't look good either. No, but that's what decades of isolation and self-pity will do. He's not filled with pity, I say quietly. They laugh at me, and I bristle as I realise they don't think I'm a threat. I understand why they wouldn't, seeing as how they're workers of the divine. I'm a measly human that was kidnapped by a demon. As I think of Asmodeus holding me captive and taking advantage of my empathy and kindness, my stomach begins to turn. I stop walking with the Zaphon and hurl on the side of the road. The acidity burns my throat, and the awful taste of nothing but stomach fluid plagues my mouth. I close my eyes and dry heave as my body purges whatever is left inside me. Once I'm done, I stand up again and dazedly look ahead of me at the side streets. I could fall over right now. Nothing sounds better than a warm bed and waking up from this nightmare. Thaliel takes a towel out of his pocket and hands it to me as the other Zaphon lets go of one of my arms. I take it from him suspiciously, wondering what kindness inspired him to care for a captive like me. Fuck. I think as I wipe the acid from my face. I'm a captive again. Are you all right? Theliel asks as he meets my eyes. His gaze is surprisingly gentle, and I wonder if they're not here to hurt me. Asmodeus did call them angels after all, but they didn't seem to like the word much. I'm far from all right, I comment as I hand the cloth back to him, looking over him like I'm studying a majestic, rare creature. Who are you? I am Theliel. My name is Grawlin. And what are you? I ask, straightening my posture and recovering from nausea. Clearly you're not demons. Grawlin snorts as he laughs. At least she didn't call us angels. I hate when humans do that. Thelial rolls his eyes. Disrespectful and asinine, he looks at me with kind eyes again. We are called Xaphan, loyal servants and chosen people of Solus, the one true god. Grawlin and Theliel start walking, and I follow unwillingly. Why are you at war with the demons? We make a turn down dark alleyways between the backs of tall townhomes. The only light is from the red sky, and I wonder if they have a planet similar to the sun behind it. I also wonder where they're taking me. I assume they're going to try to keep Asmodeus and me separated as much as possible. Grawlin and Theliel exchange a dark glance after my question, before Theliel sighs. Zarfan and demons are natural enemies, as I'm sure you've known your whole life. It's a tale as old as time. We are holy warriors here to do Solus's bidding. Demons are... He pauses and taps his chin before looking at me. A scourge, a blight on the land, selfish and brutish. They choose to actively defy all that is good, right and moral. Their mission was to steal more territory from nearby continents to unseat Solus himself and drain his power. They hoped that in acquiring more wealth and space, they could spread their message of evil to Solus's followers. This sounds like a sermon. I think as I remain silent. Maybe a borderline cult. But then again, Asmodeus kind of had his own on Galmaleth, so it's really not that surprising. Are there other humans here? I ask with hope. If there are, 
Perhaps I stand a chance of being reunited with some semblance of familiarity, possibly a new home with beings I could actually trust. Of course there are. Zaphon are travellers in every sense of the word. We've visited many planets, even your origin planet Earth. They love calling us angels there. Unfortunately, it's more of a slur to us, but we don't fault them for it. He looks at me again. We actually were humans at one point, most of us. Becoming a Zaphon is the highest honour one could receive, a blessing derived from those who sacrifice their selfish tendencies for the greater good of all humanity. Actually, many humans have travelled here from faraway planets to join our kind. It's a selective process, but each who makes the decision to try is considered. I can't believe I've been kidnapped by angels. I think as my mind reels from all the new information, that the man I fell for lied to me about everything, and now he's going to be punished for a multitude of crimes. How did I not see the signs? How could I have been so stupid to trust a demon? What's wrong with me that I could be so blind? My mind keeps turning in circles, a wheel of heavy information that makes me question my reality and myself. I've been cast out into two different worlds now, and I start to wonder if this has all been a dream or some kind of sick joke. It doesn't seem real, and I wonder if it ever will. We turn another corner in an alley and walk through winding arches. The cobblestone beneath my feet makes me wobble as I try to keep my balance. I look up and see a large, gothic palace, black and tall against the devilish sky. I debate asking them what's going to happen to me, but ignorance is bliss, and I don't think I can handle any more information. I'm escorted into the palace and walk along black marble hallways, Thelial and Grawlin's footsteps echoing off the dark stone walls. We climb winding metal staircases to the fourth floor, and I'm walked down a red and black paisley carpeted hallway to a door on the left. I don't know what I should expect to see. Will it be Asmodeus's dead body? Will they take mercy on him and have him wait for me? Is this going to be a chamber where I'm chained up and left to die? I never thought angels could be cruel, but nothing makes sense anymore. They open the door, and I'm surprised when I see a beautiful bedroom. I sigh in relief as I look at the mattress. The only thing I want to do right now is sleep and rest my tired mind and body. Grawlin releases my arm, and they walk out of the room without a word, but not before Theliel stops and glances back at me with sad eyes. He closes the door, and I flop on the mattress, feeling my muscles relax and the pain throbbing in my arms fade slightly. My feet hurt from walking such a long distance, and my head is pounding. As I lie on the bed... I glance at a door on the edge of my room. Curiosity awakens my body from its weak state, and I walk to it to see a large bathroom with a giant black tub and lit sconces on the walls. I look at the faucet over the bathtub and sigh as I walk toward it. My glance is fixated on it like I haven't eaten in weeks, and a feast is laid before me. I look around and hear no footsteps outside the bedroom door. After closing the bathroom door, I begin to run the hot water and undress. Once the tub is full, I step into it and sigh as I sink into the slightly scalding water. I was told a long time ago that lonely people take hotter baths and showers. I always thought it was a stupid myth, but now I wonder if there was some truth behind it. I try to shove Asmodeus out of my mind as I run my hands through the water, creating small ripples. It reminds me of the beaches I visited as a kid back home, and I close my eyes, pretending the salt water is stinging my cuts. While the memory seems painful, it's the most relaxed I've felt in a while. I open my eyes and wash myself with the soap provided. They smell like patchouli and musk, a scent I don't particularly mind. Anything smells better than sweaty demons lining the back alleyways of a crowded city. Once I'm clean, I take one more breath and make more small ripples before reminding myself of the comfortable bed in the other room. I get out of the tub and wrap myself in a towel, looking at my dirty clothes on the floor and sighing. I wonder if there are more clothes in the dresser of the bedroom, and I open the bathroom door, focusing on adjusting my towel. When I look up, I see a large demon standing before me. My mouth drops, and I clench the towel to my chest in fear. I look into his eyes and feel shock race through me. This must be the true demon king everyone's been talking about. Chapter 20, Ciara. I'm speechless, and I can't stop staring at him. 
He looks so similar to Asmodeus, but also vastly different. The main consistency is his eyes. They're pitch black, and I can see my reflection in them. The armor and robes are similar too, but his are a deep purple, unlike Asmodeus's typical red or black attire. He's slightly taller than Asmodeus, and his hair is long and black, tied in a low ponytail beneath his winding deep purple horns. I'd be lying if I said he wasn't attractive, but no one can replace Asmodeus, not even the real demon king. Um, I look down at my towel. I, uh, I'm sorry, I... He points to the dresser. There are robes and gowns in there, I'll wait. I nod slowly and walk past him in my towel, the cold air hitting the water that falls from my hair like ice. At least I hope it's only the air and not his icy stare on my partially covered body. I open the drawer so quickly it almost falls off its hinges. I catch it quickly, almost dropping my towel, but catching it in enough time that it doesn't fall off me. I breathe out and grab the clothes from the door and scurry to the bathroom. Closing the door behind me, I look at the bathroom and breathe heavily. Why is he here? He almost saw me naked. Does he know where Asmodeus is? Exhaling slowly and trying to lower my heart rate, I drop the towel and put on the robe and gown. When he said gown, I thought it would be something more covering than a nightgown, but it'll have to do. It's better than a loose towel. I look at the bathroom windows and think that I can run. Then I remember I'm four floors up. I almost walk over to them to peer down and see if there's anything I could land on, but I know this place must be very heavily guarded. I wouldn't stand a chance, even if I tried. I turn around and open the bathroom door. Upon seeing the king again, my skin feels like it's transparent. He radiates power, and I can almost feel it shooting through me as I approach him. I wrap the robe around my nightgown and cross my arms, trying to conceal any part of me he could find attractive. Instead, he scoffs and shakes his head while he inhales. Why my cousin would choose to keep such company, I can't understand. His eyes move over my body, and he cocks his head to the side quickly. But I guess you do have a certain... appeal. What a flattering man, I think, as I remain stoic. My fear and rage are intertwined. Part of me wants to dash out the door and scream, even though I know no one will help me, and the other part of me wants to chew him out. I decide to go with the latter in a more subtle manner. What is going on? I ask demandingly. Where is Asmodeus? What's going to happen to him? His response is chilling, as he says nothing. Instead, he looks at me and remains silent as he stands by the bed for longer than I'm comfortable with. My name is Vagathimon. I decide to play his own game and stand still as I look at him. Yes, I'm terrified, but he doesn't have to know that. He laughs and walks around the room slowly as he sighs. You have much to learn of courtly manners, human. And why would I need to learn those? I snap back. Aren't I just going to be imprisoned or executed anyway? He turns around, faces me head on and speaks to me like I'm a child. I will answer your questions once we can have a civil conversation and you tell me your name. Ciara, I respond begrudgingly. Vagthiman motions to a table and two chairs that sit next to the fireplace. I walk over with him and sit in the chair across from him, crossing my legs and arms tightly. I don't know if it's more of a protective stance, or if I'm trying to make myself as small as possible. Trawl in! He bellows toward the door. Bring the food for the human! I just told him my name, but I guess I'll take the title of the human. It's better than being dead and having no title at all. Dead! What if Asmodeus is dead? I shake the thought from my mind as bread, meat and cheese are brought to me. I'm surprised demons know a damn thing about charcuterie. Did you know Asmodeus was a celebrated war general, Ciara? I nod as I sceptically bite into a slice of bread. I did. Yes, he continues as he crosses his legs. He was quite capable when he was here with us. He sighs. But even as a child, he always had this... He raises his long, dark grey fingers into the air like he's painting a picture. Horrible craving for power, mine, especially. I often wondered if it was due to his low breeding of his mother because he was so prone to fits of passion and sullen nature. He was strange, but we accepted him anyway. He looks at me gravely. At least that's what I thought family stood for before his betrayal. I bite into the meat and nod as I listen to him talk. I hate that I'm interested in what he has to say but I have to admit, 
I want to know more about Asmodeus. I want to hear it from someone else, someone who might tell me the truth about him. I look down at the fork I'm holding with the meat on it, and the most jarring thought I've had yet hits me like the quake hit the castle on Galmoleth. Am I in love with Asmodeus? I freeze, not caring whether Vagthimon is looking at me or not. It would make sense if I was. After all, he's done to me and all the lies. I'm still constantly thinking and worrying about him. The better question is, since there are so many sides to Asmodeus, which one do I truly love? Do I love who he was before the quake, or who he was in the streets with his hood being ripped off and the demons screaming at him? What do you know of the war? Vagathimon's deep and slow tone breaks my thoughts. Only that it's between demons and angels, I respond as I chew. He laughs heartily, which makes me jump. I like you already, Ciara, calling them angels. Oh, well, the Zaphan have their hands in every continent except Ikoth. We've always refused their righteous and moral help, more concerned with preserving our society and traditions. The shiny promises didn't take hold with us, simply because we're too smart to believe in such glamour. Wow, and he's humble. How touching, I think, as I hold back rolling my eyes and take another bite of cheese. The Zaffan weren't pleased with our lack of trust, so they attacked us, ambushed us, and wore down our kind. Well, the weak ones of us, you could say. It took decades for the war to end, actually. But I'm sure Asmodeus wasn't able to give you that information, seeing as how... He holds out his arms, motioning to the room. He wasn't here. He smiles with a grin that could make the happiest man frown with disgust. After Asmodeus and his battalion were ambushed, we assumed they were dead. They never reached the distress signal and we mourned. Vagathimon's eyes look at the ground and he stares solemnly at the carpet. I squint my eyes slightly and watch him. He seems almost sad as he's telling this story like he really did mourn Asmodeus. If he did mourn that hard, a part of him must care for Asmodeus. But I don't know if it would be enough to save him from his crimes because demons, Vagthimon in particular, are way too proud a species. Why didn't Asmodeus die? I ask, the words slipping from my mouth. He looks at me, almost shocked and angered that I would ask such a thing. I lean forward, my heart pounding as I clasp my hands together and continue, despite my better judgement. I have to know. If he and five hundred other demons were involved in such a destructive and bloody battle, how did they survive, let alone make it out alive on an entirely new planet? He gives me that bone-chilling grin again and sits back in his seat, clasping his long, bony fingers together. He exhales and cocks his head to the side, looking at me the way a mother would a newborn. The gaze makes me sick. This is precisely why I wanted to speak with you, Ciara, he says as he stands up and walks slowly over to me. His height and stance are intimidating, and I lean back in my seat and cross my arms and legs again as I wonder if I made a mistake opening my stupid mouth. He walks behind my chair and places his hands on my shoulders. I feel him lean down over me, and I look down at my gown, happy the opening to my chest isn't broad. I don't want him to see any more of me than he has already. I feel his breath on my neck, and his long fingernails scratch my shoulders slightly as he leans down and whispers in my ear. If you play your part, he says lowly as he pushes a lock of hair off my ear, there might still be a chance you and your Asmodeus can make it out of this. Alive. Chapter 21. Asmodeus. I've been counting the meals the guards have brought to me. They're minuscule and taste like bland mush, but they've given me an unlikely way to tell the time. As far as I can tell from my meals, the trial is tomorrow. Looking up at the concrete ceiling of my cell, I sigh and sit back down on the cold floor. Looking at the other solid wall of my cell is the only peaceful place my eyes can rest. If I look straight ahead I see three Trollvors locked in their cells, scowling at me. To my right, there are five of them. I've even made a game of seeing which one looks like they despise me the most. I didn't ever think I would be the most hated criminal in Ikoth, but here I am. On the bright side, they haven't said anything to me. The guards barely speak to me either. I figure they know the worst punishments I could have are silence, isolation, and being cast out from society. The things I tried to avoid when I traveled through Ultix's portal. 
The lonely years alone in Galmaleth couldn't have prepared me for this, though. Isolation is much worse when you're in a crowded room of beings and still unaccepted. I would take my lonely planet over this any day. What I really want is Ciara. I rub my face with my hands and rest my chin on them as I look at the ground and close my eyes. I've written a thousand apologies to her in my mind and doubt any of them would be good enough to make her forgive me. I can't make her do anything, but I wish I could at least try to redeem myself somehow. I also know that she deserves better than me. Someone who's honest and forthcoming. Someone who isn't ashamed of their actions and has to hide under a cloak to disguise himself from others. It's selfish of me to want her. Disrespectful, even. What's truly disrespectful is the thought of Vagethamun taking her for himself. The comment the demon made could have been false, trying to cause me more pain. But I can't help but feel he might not be entirely wrong. Vagathimon isn't purely evil. I know that in my core. But he is a massive prick and would love nothing more than to spite me right now. I did this to myself, falling in love. I pause my thoughts and frown as I look at the floor. Love? Do I love her? I look at the ceiling confusedly, not caring that the Trollvor are probably staring at me intensely. I've never thought much of the definition of love, and I've never really felt it for or from anyone before. The closest I got was appreciation from my battalion when I had led them in past battles. Demons don't love. We fight and manipulate. I don't even know if it's in our genes to express the fabled emotion. Only when I think of her do I feel a deep warmth in my chest and a pulling in my core, like my body is being catapulted toward her. It has to be love. She's all I can think about aside from the trial. And even that pales in comparison to the number of thoughts about her swarming in my mind. Thinking of Vagathamun touching her, laughing with her, and holding her at night makes me clench my jaw and ball my fists so hard I swear the skin on my knuckles is about to rip off. On the other hand, the thought has crossed my mind that it would be better for her to be taken care of by someone else than dragged down with me. Even if I get executed, I won't be able to forgive myself in the afterlife for what I've done to her. The dungeon door slams open and I flinch. I try to look past the concrete walls of my cell but see no movement. It's probably another low-life demon being brought in for a petty crime. As I look at the floor again and sigh, a shadow crosses my cell. I look up and my eyes widen, and my mouth drops. Ciara is standing in front of the bars of my cage with Vagthamon towering behind her. They're flanked by other Trollvors, and I stand up quickly to get a better look at her. My heart breaks like the string holding her and me together has been burned from the middle. The flame from the metaphorical fire has reached my heart. And it's scorching. It must be true. Vagathamon has taken her. And she seems to be beside him willingly based on the look she's giving me. The closer I walk to the bars and the more I study her face, I realize I can't fully read her expression. This is a look on her I haven't seen before. I'm shocked that she isn't looking at me with utter disgust and judgment. Asmodeus. Vagathamon says with a stoic tone. I glance at him briefly. He looks the same as he did when I left, only his hair has grown more. He still has an arrogant air about him, and stands like he's entitled to everything he has now. Unfortunately, he is entitled to it, but it would be great to rip it all away from him and see his ego diminish just a little bit. I look back at Ciara. She looks different, well-rested, and clean. The color has returned to her face since the last time I saw her when she looked like a ghost. That memory of her has played over in my mind more times than her name. I'll never forget the look she had that day. Vagathemon rolls his eyes at my silence and bends down, pushing Sierra's hair behind her shoulder. I bristle and exhale deeply as I bite my tongue. I want to rip his fucking head off, and a part of me is also angry that she isn't stopping him from touching her. I know she's his captive, and there's nothing she can do. But if she began as my captive and we got to the emotional depth we did, would she do the same with him? He whispers something in her ear, and she leans into him, trying to hear him better. Either that, or she likes his hot breath on her ear. I'm fucking shattered. Vagthemon makes it worse by, running his long fingers up and down her arm softly. I see her glance at his hand quickly before looking away, and I can't tell what that look means. I'm trying to decipher every second of this interaction. I want to know what he's done with her, but also a part of me hopes I never know. I can't convince myself otherwise. It's true. He's taken her for his own. She's not mine anymore. Then again, maybe she never was. I know once the quake happened I lost her. I never thought I would, which is what makes this pain more brutal than anything I've experienced before. 
Vagthyman looks at me as he raises his head from Ciara's ear and withdraws his fingers from her arm. He nods at the Trollvor surrounding them, and they leave the dungeon without another word. I look at Ciara, fumbling for the apologies I composed in my mind. They're all forgotten now. As I look at her, I have no words. She crosses her arms and looks at me firmly. Why? She's furious. She has every right to be. I hang my head and look at the floor, asking myself the same question. The only answer I have for her is that I was stupid and power-hungry, and I couldn't bear losing her once I discovered how special she is. I open my mouth, and I'm about to say those words, but my pride kicks in, and I shut down. Come on! Why? She exclaims as she hits the bars of my cage. The clanking shatters my pride. It began when I was a child. I spit out, my eyes widening and my brow furrowing after hearing myself speak the words. I look at her and see a slight bit of empathy in her gaze. I stutter and rub my hands over my head as I start pacing in my cell. My mother wasn't there. She was absent at best. I chuckle, cruel and violent when she was at her worst. I only knew my father was good at one thing, I shout, my emotions pouring out through my words. Leaving! That's all he did! He was never there for us! Between an absent-minded mother and an absent father, I was always out of control as a kid. How could I not be? Who was supervising me? No one. I was. I sigh and look at her before biting my tongue and looking at the wall. I can't face her when I say this. The things making this life worth living were the other demons I met, the ones who embraced culture and tradition. It was the only constant I could cling to, besides. I motioned to the dungeon door apathetically. Vagthamun, who always had everything. Imagine growing up, and the only person you know is the one that has everything you covet. He was his parents' pride and joy, the baby boy of the family. He was set to inherit everything while I went home every night to a silent, dark house and tucked myself into bed. That would make anyone insane, Ciara. I lower my voice. I'm not mad at her. I'm furious with myself. One day I was in our gardens in the back of our mansion, walking among the dead roses my insane mother forgot to fucking water. I mean, it's Ikoth. There's no fucking rain here. I sigh and rub the bridge of my nose, trying to stay on topic. I decided I wanted nothing more than to be a part of them the ones who I looked up to. More than that, I wanted to lead them, be their constant, because I know what it feels like to not have anything consistent in my life because now, I motion to the dungeon door. Not even Vagthamon is a constant, no one is. I hold my arms out to the side and breathe heavily as I try to calm myself down. I meet Ciara's gaze, and her eyes look softer. She's uncrossed her arms and places her hands on the bars gently as she peers through them. She sighs and closes her eyes before looking at me again with sorrow. That's not what I meant, she says gently. Chapter 22 Asmodeus I close my eyes and touch my tongue to the side of my teeth. I just bared my soul to her. And that's not even the question she asked. Not only that, but everyone in their cells heard it too. As my heart rate drops, I wonder what came over me to spill my childhood into the dungeons. I release the air from my lungs and look at her, feeling embarrassment shooting through my chest. She rolls her eyes and scoffs. Why would you lie to me? She places her hand on her chest. Me, of all people? What? Was it that you didn't trust me? Was I just some stupid pawn for your plan? Because I fucking believed everything you told me, Asmodeus. I never questioned you once. In my eyes, you were the real king, the man who ruled over a whole planet. I believed in your morals, your rulings, and I even believed you were beginning to... She jerks her head back slightly, and her mouth closes gradually as her eyes reflect heartbreak. You were right. I think as I hold her gaze, I was beginning to love you. I think shit. I hope that's what she was about to say. I want to get on my knees and beg her for forgiveness. I want to tell her everything I've thought of her since I met her. That she's extraordinary, gorgeous, witty, the funniest woman I've ever known. Unfortunately, I feel all that would be for not because I can't get the image of Vagathamon whispering in her ear out of my head. I discard the thoughts and return to reality, staring at her. I thought I made my point clear as to why it's difficult for me to trust others. But that's not enough for her. My walls shoot up. Again, and I feel myself go cold emotionally and physically. She's let Vagathamon take her for his own. Why should I feel a need to express myself any more to her? You know, Ciara. I sigh and look at her with my head cocked. 
I enjoyed our time together. Truly, I did. There were times I debated opening up to you, telling you this whole shit show of a story. I look at her gravely and cross my arms. But now that I know you're untrustworthy, I scoff. I guess it's a good thing I didn't. It's a relief, actually, that you found out this way. As I speak my final words, I instantly regret saying them. She doesn't deserve to be spoken to like that. She doesn't deserve anything I've done to her, and the soft part of me wants to scoop her up in my arms and hold her tightly as I apologize profusely. I can't take that risk if she's become Vagthimon's. I would never recover from feeling so foolish. I'm untrustworthy, she shouts, disbelief and rage crossing her face. You lied to me, Asmodeus. Did you forget that? Did you choose to ignore how you manipulated me into thinking you were a king? That Galmaleth was your planet? Let's not forget when you told me you were scarred from bringing your people to Galmaleth, but they were cut on you in the war. They're one and the same, I snap at her, not understanding why there's a difference between the two. I also probably want to excuse my own actions through any means necessary. But I still don't know the full story, she pleads, almost begging me for an extrapolation. How can I believe anything you say now? I mean... She runs her fingers through her hair and closes her eyes as she exhales patiently. You're not king, she states in a calmer tone. You're not who I thought you were. I thought you had immense power. But now I know there's no way you could open that portal on your own. So how did you do it? She opens her eyes and crosses her arms again as she calms down. What's the point? I shout as I throw my arms out to the sides and laugh. You won't believe anything I say anyway. I didn't, I scream. Ultix did. Again, she takes a deep breath and looks at me intensely. I still can't read her expression, but I know this isn't something I can avoid. I need to tell her everything, or I'll never forgive myself. And who is that? I breathe out through my nose as I bite my bottom lip and shake my head. He's the demon god of Earth, I say lowly. The one my family has always worshipped. He's been important to me ever since I was a child, told to be trusted and honored. I look at the amulet on my chest and twirl it in my fingers, seeing the tree branches engraved on it shine in the dim lights of the dungeon. I sigh and look at Ciara. When the Xaphon attacked me, I saw my men dying. Thaliel was racing toward me. I knew I didn't stand a chance. I was as good as dead. I pause and purse my lips as I inhale, trying to collect the bravery, to be honest with her. I called out to him at that moment, something that was foolish. We know better than to call on gods for assistance. It's not something demons do, I just... I throw my hands up before dropping them by my hips, the smacking sound echoing in my cell. I panicked. It's a dishonorable act to admit defeat and have to call upon something greater than you. I never thought he would do anything to actually save me. It was a foxhole prayer more than anything. But it turned into something much greater. It turned into Galmaleth. I look at the floor of my cell and the memories return of that day in the clearing. I hear the horses whinnying and feel mine rear up on its hind legs as the ambush begins. My men scream and swords clash as they defend themselves against the Zaphon. I remember thinking we would be all right until I saw over a hundred Zaphon in the field, demolishing my battalion and slicing my warriors' necks. The blood stains the grass and the sounds of the Zaphon racing past me deafen my ears. It's a mixture of battle cries and representations of two worlds, all trying to defend their beliefs through bloodshed and power-seeking. Once again, I was powerless. I wanted nothing more than to lead my warriors to the distress signal, and I had failed again. Every moment of powerlessness played in my mind like a montage when Theliel glided toward me. Hearing my mother scream at me from the kitchen because I broke a figurine, failing a test by one point in school, watching Vagathemon's coronation, everything piled on top of me, and I didn't trust that I had the strength to continue. I remember gripping the amulet and thinking it was a terrible idea. What cemented me calling out to Ultix was the thought of my men dead on the field, and me somehow having to live with the knowledge that I failed them. I called out his name and the rest Ciara already knows. I look at her as she remains silent, staring at me like she's studying a rare animal. I still can't read her expression. I want her eyes to scream empathy, her lips to open with forgiveness, and her arms to uncross and embrace me. I want her to melt with my truth and remember who I was before she discovered who I am. She looks to her left and signals for the Trollvors to open the dungeon doors. No, please don't leave me, I think as I watch her take another look at me. Can't you see that I'm bearing my soul to you? Can't you tell that I haven't done this with anyone before? 
I didn't mean what I said about you being untrustworthy. I'm only terrified you'll never forgive me. Please, Ciara, don't leave. I try to cram my message into my stare, hoping she catches the hint. To my disappointment, she begins walking away toward the door. I run to the bars on my cell and grab onto them as I watch her stop halfway down the hall. The two Trollvors opening the doors to the castle. I hang my head, knowing I've done everything possible to convince her I'm not an evil, manipulating bastard. I look back up, hoping she will say something, turn around, and run to me, anything to lift this weight of loss from my shoulders. I'm defeated and disgraced. If she walks through those doors, I know I've lost everything. You know, Asmodeus, she begins quietly, her head slightly turning and her eyes looking over her shoulder at the floor. I was beginning to fall in love with you, you know. Not with the crown or the powerful hooded demon king, but with you. She walks forward slowly through the doors. I open my mouth, my heart breaking into a million shards. They race through my chest and spear my skin like they've exploded. I look at the floor, and all my emotions intensify. Loneliness, fear, regret, and shame are all I have left. Without her, I have nothing of use anymore, nothing to wake up for to motivate me to fight. I look at the ceiling and close my eyes, silently praying that I'm executed tomorrow. Chapter 23, Ciara. It feels like I wrench the confession of love out of my own chest, prying open my ribs with my hands in order to lie my heart bare at Asmodeus' feet. And he says nothing. And that says it all. My footsteps echo as I climb up the dungeon steps, but Asmodeus' haughty silence is much louder. Some part of me expected him to... What? Apologize? Plead for me to stay? Tell me he loves me? Gods, but my throat burns. Furious tears prick at the corners of my eyes, and I swipe them roughly away on my sleeve. I should have known better. The only thing that matters to Asmodeus is Asmodeus. That's why he's imprisoned. I'm a fool to think he'd care for me even a fraction as much. Greetings once again, my human friend. A dark, silky voice purrs as I reach the top of the dungeon steps. A guard bows low before he slides the door to the dungeon shut, and the bow isn't for me. The true king of the demons, Vagthamon, grins so that his sharp teeth gleam. It doesn't look like you've had a pleasant visit. He has always been the jealous type. I am so sick of being a pawn. Without thinking, my feet carry me forward until I'm close enough to push a finger against his broad chest if I wanted to. His personal guard of Trollvor hiss and step between us, but Vagthamon waves them away, unconcerned. He's your cousin, I snap, too furious to care about any propriety. What's he going to do, throw me in a dungeon? At this point, I'm more at home in a room of cold stone and no windows than anywhere else. And I'm not just some toy you both get to fight over. It's shameful, but the pain in Asmodeus's eyes before he shrugged on his cold, indifferent demeanour actually warmed me. I don't like seeing him hurt, but it was proof for a moment that he cared. He doesn't. At least not for me. I could be anyone, really. All demons are territorial, and for his own cousin to steal his... his... What am I to him, anyway? Just a plaything to pass the time. You should be grateful. Vagthamon rocks back on his heels, appraising me slowly. I said all that for your sake. My sake? I am so sick of these demons and their mind games. How? Now you know the truth. His lips curve once more. He loves you. My traitorous heart leaps. I have to look away. I can't stand how his eyes look at me, like they're seeing my own thoughts. Do you enjoy lying to everyone? Is that how you pass the time here? His Trollvor are unamused, but Vagathimon takes my barb in stride. It's no lie. If he didn't care for you, he would have refused to speak to you. I know my cousin well. Even after my stunt, he listened to you, confided in you. Who else has he told the truth about Galmaleth? He never would have breathed a word of it to me. I open my mouth, but no sound comes out. Walk with me to your chambers, he orders. His voice is smooth and amiable, but he speaks like there's no question of my obedience. Part of me wants to cross my arms like a child and refuse, just to spite him. But he's still talking. And gods help me. I want to hear what else he has to say. He's just like every other demon, 
plying me with shit I want to hear. After what he pulled with Asmodeus, it's clear to see that he's a manipulative, conniving fuck. But I'm weak and foolish and tired of standing in this empty antechamber, so I walk beside him, flanked by Trollvor, who sneer whenever I glance in their direction. He doesn't love me. It is rather inconceivable, he agrees, and yet I'm certain it must be the truth. My cousin would not go around blabbing about this to just anyone. Vagathimon muses about the portal. Perhaps the trip itself scrambled his brain, or maybe he was just desperate for companionship, since there are so few matrons in his tiny facsimile of a kingdom. Indeed, he concludes, it's lucky he didn't take up with an Ergin instead. On that flattering note, we arrive at my room. Allow me, he says. He doesn't open it himself, of course. He tilts his head, and one of the trollver opens the door. I step inside, ready to throw myself on my bed and weep, but Vagthimon follows me inside. He shuts the door behind him, and with the flick of his finger a lock slides into place. I ought to be frightened. He claimed me in front of Asmodeus, and gods know what his fellow demons think is happening in this room. But I'm not afraid. He lends against my door, hands steepled beneath his chin. He seems different when he's not in front of anyone else. Regal and arrogant, but somehow more approachable. Is it possible I can convince him to spare Asmodeus' life? What are you going to do with him? I ask. Why does it matter how he got to Galmaleth? Can't you forgive him and, and let it go? You're the one in charge here, right? What you say goes. He shakes his head. If Asmodeus had been the one to open the portal, he would be king. He lets that linger for a moment. No one can say he doesn't have a flair for the dramatic. Not only of his small kingdom, but here as well. Power such as that would nullify any accusation of impersonation or treachery. How could anyone deny him anything with power such as that? I would kneel before him myself. I don't understand. But he did open the portal. He... No. Fagathimon looks more contemptuous than I've seen him thus far, which is an accomplishment because it seems to be his default expression. No, my dear cousin clutched his pretty necklace and begged for help from our gods. Humans would believe that makes him powerful, that the gods favour him. And that is what makes humans so weak. The Xanthan don't seem... Careful. I press my lips closed. We serve our gods, he says. They do not serve us. To plead with any of them to interfere in mortal matters is the height of dishonour. Even if he saved lives because of it, I demand, what would have happened if he hadn't asked for help? He and all the demons around him would have been killed. Then they would have been killed. His voice sounds sure, but something in his eyes shifts. He leans the back of his head against the door. The trial will proceed as planned. What does that mean? He'll serve time in a dungeon, or be punished somehow. It's painful enough to visit him in the dungeons, to see his proud demeanour in such a dark, squalid place. Dungeons nearly broke me, and I was no royalty when I went in. How awful it must be to have the world at your fingertips only to lose it all. It's chilling for me to imagine the man he'll become if he's sentenced to decades locked away. Vagathimon shrugs, leaving his head where it is. His horns scrape the thick metal door. If he's found guilty, he'll be put to death. Rage propels me forward. I want to grab him by his infernal horns and shake him until his head tears off of his neck. You used me. You let yourself be used, he sneers. All I did was grant you the audience you requested. You told me, my voice shakes with fury. You told me that if I spoke to him and found out the truth, he'd be spared. You never said the truth would have him killed. I said it might. Vagathimon stands at full height, and his eyes pin me like a specimen to the elaborate tile floor. How was I to know what my cousin had done? Were you not listening? If he had opened that portal of his own accord, he would be sitting in my throne at this very moment. You knew. There's no way a power-hungry demon like Vagthimon would have put his own rule at risk, not the way he struts about like he was made to be king. He must have suspected, at the very least, what Asmodeus had done, and now I've confirmed it for him. I might as well have killed Asmodeus with my own hands. You played your part well, he says, and I keep my word. For your assistance, you will live, remaining on Erisac as my personal guest. The room blurs. 
helpless, furious tears fill my eyes. I don't want to stay anywhere near him, but before I can argue, he leaves. The sobs I've been holding back since I first met with Asmodeus in the dungeons below burst forth, nearly bringing me to my knees. I fling myself onto the soft bed and let them overcome me until the light from the window grows dim. With every hour, the trial draws nearer. Does Asmodeus know these hours will be his last? What is he thinking, alone in that dungeon? He'll know when he hears testimony tomorrow that his confession to me is what has sealed his fate. All those words I blew about, upset that he hadn't told me the truth. I wish I could swallow them whole. He was right not to tell me anything. He's going to die and it's all my fault. How am I supposed to go on living without him? Chapter 24, Asmodeus. The night after hearing Ciara say she was falling in love with me was my life's longest, darkest night. Even with the dim flames of the torches in the dungeon, I can tell something evil and sinister has crept over me. I can't help but wonder if Ultix always knew this would be the outcome of me jumping through his portal. If I don't have Ciara to fight for, or have her beside me while I fight for myself, there's no apparent reason for me to remain in this world. It's sadly comical. I'm home for the first time in... Decades, back in the city that raised me. I remember thinking I would prove everyone wrong as a child, make something of myself, and become a household name for the whole country. Unfortunately, I was correct, but not in the way I expected. I can only imagine the conversations in children's schools, asking them to write reports on demonic law and justice for my crimes. Families will speak about my injustices over the dinner table. Vagthimon will tell my story for the rest of his reign probably happy that he was right about me all along. It hurts the most knowing that while my name will be spoken for centuries, and my name will be kept alive, it certainly won't be from Ciara's mouth. I doubt she'll ever want to relive this journey, and I don't blame her. She shouldn't want to relive it and never want to utter my despicable name again. A part of me thinks I should have said something quicker before she left the dungeon last night. If I had said I loved her, screamed it from the top of my lungs, loud enough for everyone in the castle to hear. Would she still be gone? Would I still be sure she's never coming back? I know that was my last opportunity, and of course I blew it. I let my pride and selfishness get in my way again. I'm my worst enemy, and part of me hopes I'm executed today, if for nothing else than for Ciara to have justice and kill the part of me that's always gotten in my way. The dungeon door slams open, and my heart beats loud, like ceremonial drums summoning me to my beheading. I see out of my peripheral two Trollvor approach my cell and unlock it. I don't lock eyes with them, nor stand to walk with them. I let them enter the cell and grab me by my arms. I've lost the will to try anything, even stand. I may my eyes squint at the light coming from the castle door, my pupils adjusting to the bright light I've been deprived of for days. The Trollvor walk me up a flight of steps and into the main castle. I look around, nausea hitting me as I remember the last time I was here. I had just received orders from Vagthamon and was in the altar room making a prayer to Ultix for protection, something I did before every battle. If I could go back in time, I would warn myself. I would tell myself not to open the portal, and somewhere out there, a woman named Ciara is waiting for you. She'll give you love as you've never known, and if you find her as yourself, you can avoid the worst pain of your life. I'm led through the palace and into the large doors of the throne room. I hear a commotion from inside, some voices screaming, some cheering. Upon the Trollvor opening them, I see hundreds of demons awaiting me. As I walk down the center of them, I glance at some of their furious faces. Some of them I recognize from Galmaleth. Even Draran and my other servants are in attendance, staring me down profusely to let me know they've received their sight back. Most of the room is filled with demons I've never seen before. Beings that should be brothers and sisters, but have turned against me due to my foolishness. Zafan lined the sides of the aisle, keeping the crowd from spearing me on the spot. I grimace at the thought of them in the main castle's throne room. I can't believe Vagathimon allied with them once I was gone. My heart sinks as I realize I couldn't battle my way out of this, even if I wanted to. The obsidian throne awaits at the end of the aisle, taking up more than a quarter of the room. Vagthamon lounges on the oversized throne with his head resting on his hand as he looks at me. He couldn't be more bored, 
disgusted that he has to take time out of his day to decide his cousin's fate. The screams turn into low whispers as Vagthamon motions for the court to quiet. I can barely hear what they're saying, but I'm sure it's nothing worse than what I've told myself in the dungeons. I stand before Vagathamon in the empty space in front of his throne. Beside me, one of my most trusted advisors is escorted to the side of the room. There's a line of them, what I thought were my trusted servants and right hands. Some from Galmaleth and others I worked beside closely in Ikoth. Less than half of them are in chains, which tells me that most came here willingly. The realization makes my gut turn. Even though the ones from Galmaleth were in a trance when I reigned over them, that doesn't mean they won't err on the side of justice. I try to gaze into their eyes to make out their expressions, of the ones that volunteered to come here which stood by my side. After all the years of their luxurious lives in Galmaleth, which one stood true and noble? I wish I could tell, but my heart is pumping too quickly, and my mind is racing too fast to read their faces accurately. If I am executed, what will that mean for the ones who stayed true to me, if any? Will they follow me into the afterlife, leaving behind the families they've just reunited with? Or will they be shown mercy? I guess it doesn't matter anyway. I won't find out until I'm sent to the world beyond Ikoth. I know Ciara won't be following in my shoes of death, thankfully. As the thought hits me, I look at Vagathamon's throne and am surprised she's not there. I look over my right shoulder and see a cluster of disgusted demons. Over my left, I find her at the front of the crowd, standing next to a Xaphon guard. Her eyes are sunken, and she has bags underneath them. Her skin looks pale and dry, and I begin bawling my fists as I wonder what's happened to her. She didn't look like that yesterday. I look back at Vagthymon and sneer, trying everything to hold back the rage that shakes my core when I wonder what he's done to her. I grit my teeth and shake my head slightly at him, as images of him hurting Ciara rush through my mind. Was she punished for talking to me in my cell yesterday? Did she reject his advances, and his pride got the best of him? Worse, did he lose control of himself and harm her while they were in bed together? The last thought is the most painful, and my chest tightens as I try to continue breathing. I want to choke him out, rip him off his throne and slash his throat in front of all his followers. I want revenge, not for anything he's done to me, but for what he might have done to her. The guards holding me push me down. I try to resist their force but I fall to my knees under their force. They hit the golden tiled floor, and I keep my head high, staring at Vagthemon dead in his eyes. I refuse to bow before a tyrant. Asmodeus, Vagathemon says as he looks at his hands, apathy still heavy in his expression. You have been charged with kidnapping over five hundred demons, impersonating the one true demon king, and treason. He sighs and looks at me. Do you have anything you would like to say? Yes. There are a million things I want to say, I think, as Ciara's tired and grave face flashes in my mind. I exhale deeply as I maintain my glare with Vagthemon. If you lay a finger on Ciara, it won't matter if I'm dead or alive. I will come back to find a way to kill you slowly myself, I growl lowly. The courtroom gasps, and I still don't break my gaze. I don't want him to think I don't mean that statement with every bone in my body. I have no idea how I would return from the dead but I will find a way if he takes advantage of Ciara in any form. Well, Vagathamon says lowly as he shakes his head and cocks his lips to one side. For a second, I swear I see sorrow in his eyes. If that's all you have to say for yourself, the laws are clear. One of the guards draws his sword from his sheath, and my muscles tense. I close my eyes, hoping that Ciara knows I love her despite my not saying it in the dungeons. At least now I can die knowing I did everything I could to protect her. Even if my all wasn't enough. I make a vow to myself as I hear the guard's clothes scratch against each other, thinking he must be readying the sword above his head. I vow to come back for you. I promise Ciara silently as I scrunch my face, preparing for the swift pain of the sword slicing through my neck. The guard screams, the traditional battle cry made before a courtly execution. Wait! I hear Ciara scream from behind me. I open my eyes and turn over my shoulder, seeing the guard lower his weapon and turn toward her. She bolts out of the crowd and beside the guard that almost killed me. She looks at me briefly with an odd expression. I want to tell her she's stupid, that she should get back in the crowd, but I'm too stunned to speak. Chapter 25 Ciara I can't let this happen. 
I'm angry. I'm furious at Asmodeus for lying to me, at Vagathimon for doing this to his own cousin, and partially because Asmodeus is lying down and taking this punishment. His last words had nothing to do with his own defence. It also breaks my heart to see him so defeated and worn. My only option is to be the one who has to stand up for both of us since he's too deep in a hole of self-pity and hatred to see clearly. Does he really think he can let himself die? And I'll be all right without him? Despite all his actions, that might be the dumbest thing he's done yet. The nervous energy surging through me propels me forward like I'm being catapulted out of the crowd. My heart thuds in my chest as I open my mouth. Wait! I scream as I push past the Xaphon guards and run to the side of the guard who wielded his sword over Asmodeus' neck not more than a second ago. I feel hands on my arms and try to jerk away from them. I look to my sides and see two Xaphons scowling at me. I fight them, knowing I can't resist their grasp. I look at Vagathimon with a fierce glare. As if he can read my mind, Vagathimon motions for the guards to release me. I quickly take my arms out of their grip and look at Asmodeus. His eyes are wide and brows furrowed like he's surprised I stepped forward. Did he really expect me to sit back and do nothing? How clueless and idiotic can he be? I'm hurt that he's shocked. I told him how I felt about him last night. Did he not hear me? Did he think I was lying to him? I've never known a love like this, and I'm not going to give up, despite his atrocities, because he's the man I always wanted to exist in my life, but never thought was real. Voice your objection, human, Vagethemon says, mockingly waving a hand at me. Since you clearly have one. My mind sputters out like an old automobile. I'm trying to find a reason, any reason that Asmodeus shouldn't be executed. He didn't deny his crimes. He wasn't forthcoming when we first arrived in Ikoth, and there's no use for him in the kingdom now that his name has been slandered. Then the idea hits me. The only thing that might be his saving grace. You can't execute him, I shout as I walk toward Vagathimon's throne. Guards step in front of Vagathimon, but he waves them off. He motions to the floor, and I walk in front of Asmodeus and look at the real demon king sprawled on his throne like a lazy dictator. He was carrying out Altix's will. He was granted leadership over his people and the continent of Galmaleth by a god and not even you. I look at Vagathimon with disgust. Your Highness, outrank a god. The crowd gasps again, and I hear whispers behind me. Vagathimon looks over the group for a second, and I can feel the panic washing over him. He quickly collects himself before anyone else notices and stands from his throne, waving his hand over the crowd. When they quiet, he looks at me with a ghost of a smile on his lips. My mind races, wondering what dispelled his panic so quickly. Was he expecting me to say that? Am I too uneducated on the roles of gods and demons that I'm wrong? Regardless, I know I had to try something. Even if he disagrees and Asmodeus dies today, I know I've done everything possible to save his life. Vagthimon remains silent, and I realise I haven't done everything. I begin to play my statement in my mind, and details wash in like calm waves. I piece together my puzzle and step closer to his throne. Asmodeus didn't intentionally set out to betray the king of his country. He is a decorated war general and a male of royal blood, and his bloodline is one of honour, of respect. He would never intentionally try to take the throne from his cousin. He led his battalion into battle to try to reach a distress signal. He was on his way to help save his people, your... I point at Vagthamon. People. When he was ambushed, watching your men die all around him, he called on Altix. The crowd murmurs, and one demon shouts. A disgrace! Despicable he can't be trusted. He did it for himself. He has dishonoured us all. One never calls on a god. Vagathemon smiles wider at the chaos in the courtroom, but motions for them to quiet again. I'm thankful he's letting me continue. If I can keep this up and reach my end point, there might be a chance of Asmodeus living through this nightmare. I whip around and look at the angry mob behind me. They look disappointed and disgusted with me, probably wondering why a human of all creatures is on the floor making a defence argument right now. Yes, I shout, throwing my hands over my head. It is dishonourable to call among a god, especially in a moment of weakness, but Altix decided to answer his call. Would a god truly have entertained a request if they considered it disgraceful? The crowd remains silent, and some relief washes over me. 
I catch eyes with Asmodeus briefly, and he looks as shocked as the crowd at my statement. I can't believe he didn't think of this himself. You all know the gods have more pride than that. How dare you disrespect them by deeming what is and what's not honourable. That is their choice, not yours. Even more, I chuckle. Altix not only answered but granted his request. He prepared an entire continent for him and his followers. He crafted a large castle, living quarters, food and water for them all. It was almost as if it was planned before Asmodeus even summoned him. Also, I glance at Asmodeus. From my understanding, Altix was the one who put Asmodeus's soldiers in a trance, which was the only way Asmodeus could convince them he was their true king. Doesn't that seem suspicious to you? This was set up and put into motion for Asmodeus. All he did was take the opportunity. He didn't intend to forge any of it. This is true, Draran says as he steps out of the crowd as they gasp and murmur amongst themselves. And from what I've heard, a god has never granted a request like this before, at least not in my lifetime. We all know when gods bestow blessings upon us who honour them, it is a sign of favour and support. It was predestined to be this way, Telex shouts as he steps forward from the wall, his hands bound in chains. We all know gods can foresee farther than any of us. Altix must have known this would happen. He was prepared, I look back at Asmodeus, whose jaw can't drop any further. He looks stunned like an animal that has just crossed paths with a fierce hunter. Hope flows through me as I see the look on his face. If I was wrong about something, I don't believe he would look as shocked if it didn't check out. But we have no proof Altix planned this, a demon from the crowd shouts. How can we question a god? Why can't we question them? Aren't they powerful enough to handle our suspicions? Another responds, yelling from the other aisle. That's disgraceful! Show loyalty to your gods! We have. I look at the crowd as the demons from Ikoth and Galmaleth battle each other. It seems the room is split in half regarding my argument, but it's better than all of them jeering when Asmodeus first walked through the doors. It's chaos. Everyone shouts their opinions and disregards the other side. If each of them had weapons, I have no doubt this would turn into a bloodbath quickly. How do we know any of this is true? Do we rely on demons that served Asmodeus? They could still be entranced. My eyesight has returned, and I'm back in my home country. Draran screams. I have no reason to help nor defend him anymore. Enough, Vagathamon bellows over the crowd. The room silences immediately, and I turn around to see Vagathamon step down from his throne, walking down two significant steps as he looks out into the crowd. I try to decipher his facial expression. The argument is good. It has to be enough. He can't kill Asmodeus. Everything I said was true, and half the room knows it. I want to continue speaking, to keep rambling and making points to raise support from more of the crowd, but Vagthimon is standing powerfully and firmly. I've started a debate among hundreds of demons about their gods, and the respect they deserve. I don't need to push anyone further. What's done is done, and it has to be enough. The drawn-out silence in the room is almost a living thing. It hangs over all of us like a thick mist over the meadows. I can barely breathe. It's so tense. Vagathamon smiles slyly and chuckles slightly as he looks at me. It seems the human in our courtroom is quite the public speaker, a persuader of the ages. He looks back at the crowd and raises his voice. Regardless of the dissent she has managed to raise, the decision regarding my cousin's punishment falls on me and me alone to make, and I have come to my final judgement. Chapter 26. Asmodeus. The awe runs through me more than the fear of dying. I look at Ciara, partially turned to face Vagthymon, and my throat closes up. I haven't cried since I was a child, but it would be now if I were going to. Ciara, my wickedly intelligent, beautiful, and fiercely brave Ciara, thank you, I think as my mouth hangs open, my jaw almost sore from being displaced for so long. I can't stop staring at her. Even when Vagathamon said he had made his decision, I barely cared. It was a whisper in the background, almost unintelligible to me. As the human so aptly pointed out, I am no god. Vagathamon declares to the court. If I weren't so fixated and blown away by Ciara's courage, I would be surprised his pride was leveling. And I have no power to stand in the face of one. 
Asmodeus, you will not be executed. I shake my head and frown as I whip my head toward Vagthimon, my eyes giant and a perplexed look on my face. What? Did I just imagine that? Did he say not executed? I continue questioning myself as my cousin glances at me with something I haven't seen in his eyes in ages, sympathy. You are here by exile to Galmaleth for the rest of your days. He looks at me with empathy, and I remain shocked. I did hear him correctly. I'm not crazy. You will be permitted to rule as you wish, on the continent Ultix provided to you. I will grant this under the condition that you never set foot on your homeland of Ikoth again. He looks out at the crowd, and his statement still jars me. I almost refuse to believe it, wondering if this is a sick trick he's playing on me. I don't dare get my hopes up from fear of my own foolishness. All the demons here have a choice. They can either return, or stay home in Ikoth, or take residence on Galmaleth under your rule. However, the choice may only be made once. Those who set foot on the planet will never be able to return under any circumstances. Vagthiman's body stays turned toward the crowd, but his eyes flash to me. I begin to accept the reality of his statement, and I feel my gaze soften toward Vagthiman. I catch a minuscule nod from him in my direction, a last motion of grace. My gaze shifts to the floor as my emotions swirl in my chest. I get to go back to Galmaleth. I get to live. I can do something different now. I've been given a second chance. I'm not imagining this, right? Yes, he did say I could return. The sword hasn't hit my neck and I'm still breathing. My thoughts run wild in circles as I process the shocking decision. The crowd roars behind me, some demons shouting that Vagathimon has made a mistake, some saying he's only doing this because I'm a royal family member, claiming unfair favorable treatment toward me. Others are overjoyed. I hear words like honor and King of Galmaleth echo through the throne room. The guards grab my arms tightly, and Ciara whips around to face me. All I can do is look at her and try to collect my thoughts before the guards escort me out of the throne room, demons from Ikoth spitting at me and shouting despicable things in my ears, and those from Galmaleth smiling and cheering my name. I pass by Draran in the crowd, and he smiles and gives me a nod. We leave the sight of my ruling, and I'm still catching my breath. My heart is beating so hard that I wonder if I'm about to pass out. We walk down the tiled hallways of Vagthimon's castle back toward the dungeons. I look around at the castle, so dissociated from reality that it all feels like a dream. As I come down from the high of being saved by my cousin, I realize it's not a dream. It's a level of grace I don't deserve. Unchain him, my cousin's voice commands from behind me. The guards remove the chains on my hands, the cold metal rubbing against my wrists as I feel the key click and the cuffs fall off. I turn around, thinking about what I will say to my cousin, when Ciara almost knocks me over. I stumble backward, shocked at first and slightly disoriented, before embracing her back. I grab onto her and feel her clothes beneath my fingers, trying to remind myself that she's real, that I'm free. I look over her shoulder as she sobs into my chest and notice I'm locking eyes with Vagthaman. He nods slightly and grins, a smile of appreciation. I nod back to him, my face still surprised, I'm sure, before I bury my head in the nook of Ciara's neck as we grasp each other. I pull back from the embrace and look deeply into her eyes, placing my hands on either side of her face as we chuckle. Tears stream down our faces, and I hug her again, kissing the top of her head and holding her close as I feel her loving warmth against me. You're very lucky to have her, Asmodeus, Vagthymon comments lowly. You should do well to remember that. I will, I say between heavy breaths. I will, I repeat as I pull back from our embrace again and look at her with admiration and love. Before I can say anything to her, Thaliel appears from beside Vagthimon and looks at me with disappointment. I don't give a fuck what he thinks. I have Ciara, and I've been given the grace to live. He can think whatever he wants. They all can. No one can follow us to Galmaleth, and I won't care. Thaliel pushes a button on his beacon, and the famed blue portal opens again, its white lines swirling toward the center. I grab Ciara's hand and walk her up to it before stopping and looking into her eyes. Keep walking when you step through the portal, I smile. It'll help with the motion sickness. Okay, she exclaims with a chuckle as she wipes the tears from her face. I grip her hand tightly and look at the portal before leading her through. We step out quickly on Galmaleth the cooler air hitting my face and electrical storms raging above. I've never been so happy to enter a cold, dark storm. I turn around to see the front steps of my palace behind us, 
the gold on them shimmering with each electrical strike that hits the ground. Then I glance at Ciara. She doesn't look as bad as the last time we went through the portal, but she's shaking, and her face is paler than usual. I take her hand and gently pull her into me, sighing in relief as she embraces me. Despite everything that's happened in the last few days, I have never felt lighter, happier, and freer than I do at this moment. I'm standing with the woman I love holding me in front of our palace, in our own world, where there are no limitations, secrets, or hindrances. The line of demons waiting to go through the portal back to Ikoth is lengthy. Holding Ciara in my arms, I watch as faces I've known for decades leave Galmaleth and me behind. I can't blame them for wanting to return home, for being disgruntled by their king being a liar. But it does hurt. I must remember that it wasn't their choice to come here, and they were led here while under the trance of Ultix. I keep telling myself they're leaving because they've figured out the truth and just miss Ikoth but I can't help but wonder if I was such an evil king that they would leave forever. As if she can read my mind, Ciara squeezes my hand. I look down at her and she nods encouragingly, silently telling me it will be all right, that I shouldn't blame myself, and that the nightmare is behind us. I know her gaze is correct, but my heart still sinks to my gut as I continually watch them disappear back to Ikoth. The last demon walks through the portal, and I glance at the crowd surrounding us. Only about a hundred choose to stay, which breaks my heart even more. I would be lying if I said I didn't feel ashamed and disheartened at how much the Galmaleth population has lessened. As I nod and close my eyes, accepting that they have made their choice, I embrace Ciara tightly, knowing she is all I need and will overcome this feeling of defeat. As I hold her, a line of demons enters the portal into Galmaleth. Each of them approaches me and shakes my hand before heading into the palace or along the road to explore the other parts of the world. I shake their hands with confused stares, wondering why they followed us. I think each will be the last to walk through, but the line doesn't end. Even Ciara looks at me in shock between greeting them, amazed at how many followed us through. I lose count at ninety, and the line continues for another hour. My hand is dry and cramping from all the handshakes, and my legs are tired from standing. As I check the crowd behind us, I see the population has grown more than three times its size once the others decided to return to Ikoth. The last two to cross are Draran and Tilek. I look at them in amazement as they step through and see the portal close behind them. They each come to me and shake my hand before Draran bows his head to me. Welcome home, King Asmodeus. I'm shell-shocked and don't have words to respond to him. They both walk into the castle and I glance down at Ciara, who slightly pulls apart from our embrace. I get a full view of her beautiful shining face, albeit still flushed and grin. My heart almost bursts after seeing how many decided to come to Galmoleth with us, and more than anything, it's bursting because she chose to return with me. Same. I turn around and look at the crowd as they disperse along the roads of Galmoleth. There are hundreds of new faces for me to meet, and they all decided to follow under my rule, instead of Vagathimon's. Vagathimon. His voice echoes in my head as I think of the look he gave me before I stepped through the portal. He was forgiving and lenient, gracious even. I look at Ciara, and the color has returned to her face. She's beaming as she leans into my chest and places her hand on me, moving her thumb over my torso as if trying to calm me down. The exciting thing is that I've never felt this calm. Everything I ever wanted has come to me. Leadership, love, and being a part of a community. This is a new beginning for all of us, and everyone that stepped through that portal knows it. Chapter 27. Ciara. After Draran shakes Asmodeus' hand, I watch him walk into the castle and feel my face hurt from smiling. I can tell he's amazed at how many demons followed him into the portal, but he shouldn't be. There's no question that he was a great ruler when he took the throne on Galmaleth. Despite his actions, he has good intentions at heart. Who he was when he initially called on Altix has now developed into a mature, lovely demon something I thought I would never say, that I can't be happier to call mine. I squeeze his hand and look at him as I tip my head toward the palace. He sighs and smiles at me before walking with me into the castle. We enter, and I look at the destruction caused by the quake. Draran, Tilek, and other demons that have chosen to take residence in Galmaleth are hard at work rehanging paintings and cleaning up glass from the chandelier. Hey, Asmodeus calls to them, don't worry about this. We can repair the castle later. If everyone could join me in the throne room, we have some important business to conduct. 
All of his followers and advisors follow his advice, and he walks toward the throne room. I watch him walk in front of me and smile. His mental state has switched into king mode, and I'm excited to see what he has planned for his kingdom. We walk into the throne room, and I look at the spot on the floor where I apologise to him profusely for opening the portal. I remember the terror on his face as he told me they were here. Asmodeus walks up the steps to his throne and sits on it, leaning forward and clasping his hands together as he looks over the crowd that has joined him. I stand in the back against the wall and watch with awe as he begins conducting royal business. We will need a headcount on how many new demons have taken residence on Galmoleth, he states to Tilek, who scribbles his words on a notepad. We'll also need to build more homes. Does anyone know of a good location to make a new complex? I raise my eyebrows and grin. He's asking them for their opinions, creating a democracy amongst his followers. This is quite a different kingdom from Vagthimans, and I can tell he's proud to make these changes for everyone. The sandbar near the East Woods would be a good location for small, single-family homes, one of his advisors suggests. Asmodeus nods. That's a good start. Where else? The ocean front to the north. If we clear a path through the East Woods, there's a clearing that can host roughly ten houses, a town centre, and an area for farming. Their planning continues, and I wonder how many new lives will be made here. The population will undoubtedly increase over time, and soon we will have a kingdom double in size. Also, as Modius stands up and fixes his robes, I want a welcoming ceremony for everyone, not just the new arrivals. This is a new Galmaleth, and I want them to know their opinions will be valued here. This will not be tyranny or dictatorship. This will be a world inclusive of all. Drara ran. Asmodeus looks at him kindly. Please put this into place, and I want updates on the new settlements by tomorrow morning. If you have any questions, please direct them to Draran. He will oversee the kingdom's operations from now on. Tilek will be appointed second in command, overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of Galmaleth. The advisers nod and leave the throne room discussing creating new jobs for the new residents, starting with architects and construction. Afterward, they're planning to open new marketplaces all around the world, ensuring every resident will be able to showcase their talents in their career. Once they leave, Asmodeus walks down the steps of his throne and exhales as he raises his eyebrows. I smile and walk toward him, thinking seeing him speak to his advisers without his hood on is still odd. I wrap my arms around him and he places his hand on the back of my neck as he kisses me intensely. We pull back from the kiss and I chuckle. I've never been more tired in my life. He laughs and his fingers brush lightly against my face as he admires me. I feel the same way. Come on, he says as he squeezes my hand. Let's go rest. He leads me up the stairs to his chambers. I look at the disarray of the castle, and my heart sinks before I realise now we can recreate all of this for ourselves, and we can change everything, clear out the past, and make way for a brighter future. We walk into his chambers, and I look at his bed. The metal bars that held up his canopy have fallen on top of each other. He closes the door behind me, and sighs as he walks over to the bed, runs his fingers through his hair, and stares at the broken bars. I walk up behind him, and wrap my arms around his chest. Hey, I whisper. His head turns around slightly to look at me over his shoulder as I rub his chest with my hands. We'll fix it. He places his hands over mine and exhales, before turning around and pulling me against him gently. We will. Ciara, he sighs. I'm so sorry for keeping the truth from you. You should have had it from the beginning. If I could turn back time. I stand on my tiptoes and plant a kiss on his lips. I don't need the apologies or the sorrow, nor do I need him to repent for his sins. I softly pull my lips from his, lightly sticking together, before placing my heels on the ground. We can talk later, I whisper. Asmodeus, even with everything that's happened, you're already forgiven in my eyes. There's no need for apologies. The dam of my control loosens inside me, and my craving for him begins to pour into my conscious mind. I just want to be with you right now. The rest of this chapter is a bit too spicy for YouTube. Check out the links in the description for the uncut version. Chapter 28 
Asmodeus. The glass in my study has been repaired beautifully, with Tilek asking the glassworkers to add stains on the side, making the light colorful with the afternoon sunset through the electrical storms. I always feel the air on my head and through my hair now, as I haven't worn a hood in over a month. My shoulders have loosened, my chest has unclenched, and my face hurts from smiling by the end of each day. The nightmares have also disappeared since our return to Galmaleth. I fall asleep instantly when my head hits the pillow at night's end, and I don't wake up at 3 a.m. drenched in sweat droplets and wrapped in panic-soaked sheets. Part of it is the exhaustion from creating a new Galmaleth for my people, which also brings me peace and gratitude. The welcome ceremony went beautifully. Tilek and Draron planned it perfectly. We had the streets lined with signature food from Galmaleth, beautiful jewelry, and live music. Demons I'd never seen before came out to celebrate, and I even met a female demon pregnant with her first child, the first baby to be born on Galmaleth soil. Knowing they're all here because of choice, not force, is a relief. They've been very appreciative, bringing offerings now and then to represent their gratitude. We've created hundreds of new jobs and built four different settlements around various terrains of Galmaleth. Each week there is a town hall meeting for residents to air their grievances and praise what is going well in our world. It's become a democracy, something I never thought would bring me pride. Vagathamon has come to have more empathy toward myself and Gamaleth. He has implemented a plan for visitors to travel to and from our world for three days. We keep in correspondence regularly, and our relationship is slowly growing back to how it was when we were children. I turn the black box over in my hand before looking back at sunset. None of this would be possible without Ciara's wickedly brilliant brain and large heart. She's the reason hundreds of demons have flourishing lives and the reason I have one at all. The velvet box I turn over in my fingers holds a ring our recently employed jeweler handcrafted for me. He supported my decision to have a human queen. But I wonder how the rest of my kingdom will feel. I know there will be some uprisings against the decision. But if they followed me this far, knowing what I did before, I doubt it will be much of an issue. Even if it is, I'm going through with it anyway. Regardless of my stance on human and demon relationships in the past, I can't bear to think of the rest of my life without giving her the proper title of queen. She deserves it more than anyone. The proposal has to be perfect. I can't let her down by asking this question. It has to be. The sound of my study doors opening interrupts my thoughts. I panic and spin around in my chair, pulling out a drawer from my desk and shoving the box inside. Looking up, I see Ciara approaching me with a suspicious face. I grin at her and lean forward on my desk. What was that all about? Ah. I wave my hand. Just more blueprints for a... I clear my throat. Marketplace in the Freeland District. You look really panicked. It's just a large project. I sigh as I run my fingers through my hair. I want to make sure it goes smoothly. Okay. She says the words slowly and looks me up and down before shaking her head and smiling. Anyway. I wanted to ask if you would like to walk with me in the gardens for old time's sake. I chuckle. I would love to walk with you in the gardens. She holds her arms behind her back and smacks her lips as she sways back and forth cutely. Will you come with me now? I nod and stand from my desk. Absolutely. Great. She smiles widely and I follow her out of my study, glancing back at my desk and sighing in relief. She takes my hand and leads me out into the gardens. Since our new residence moved, we have an abundance of talented gardeners in our midst. They have done wonders for maintaining and growing the garden, which looks spectacular. We walk past the flowers and new flourishing trees springing from the ground to a clearing between the red bushes lining the sand. My mouth drops, and I laugh as we step closer, shocked at what I see. Ciara has laid a blanket on the ground with candles lit all over the garden, and I look closer and see a basket on the corner of the blanket. I grab her and stop walking toward it as I pull her close, my hands pressing her against me. Thank you, I whisper, always, she comments as she leans in to kiss me. I let her lead me to the blanket and sit on it across from her, straightening my back and stretching my neck from side to side as the tension in my body lifts. She always knows how to bring out my calmness when I need it most. So, she begins as she opens the basket and hands me a stacked sandwich. I wanted to talk to you about something. Shit, I think as I take the sandwich from her and unzip the plastic bag. She wants to go to Ikoth or return to her home. Wait, could she be pregnant? I would be so happy. No, she must be upset that I've been working too much. I wanted to talk about the trial and everything that happened. Ciara. I reach for her hand, 
my heart thudding. I never got a chance to tell you how I feel about lying to you. Sorry doesn't begin to cover the anguish I put you through. You deserve more than being treated well. You deserve to be treated right, and I will do everything. Asmodeus, she cuts me off with a broad smile as she takes my hand in hers tightly, running her thumb across my skin. I know you've been feeling this way, and I wanted to bring you here to tell you I forgive you. I wanted to apologize because I only wish I could have helped you sooner somehow. I understand why it all happened, and I know you've grown exponentially since the day you called on Ultix, and even though he's one to crave misery and destruction. She motions to the garden with her hands. He didn't win this time. We did. I love you, I say quietly as I lose myself in her eyes. She widens them and giggles as she leans in close to me. I love you too, King Asmodeus. I grab her waist and pull her on top of me. She locks onto me, her hands spreading comfort and safety across my body. She's my body armor, a protective shield that keeps me from pain and misery. She's the sunrise that wakes me to new possibilities each morning. The sunset behind us that marks another day passed with love and companionship. Chapter 29. Ciara. Time has passed quickly since being back on Galmaleth. The days are filled with joyous adventures of visiting the nearby settlements, building relationships with other demons in the court, and spending time with Asmodeus. We settle and discuss our days at night, make jokes, eat fine food and make love. Everything is easier now, not only because I'm in love with a king. My mind is freer than it's ever been. Asmodeus and I have passed through the threshold of inner and outer conflict, and know nothing can tear us apart. Of course, being in love with the king has its perks. I'm brought breakfast in bed when Asmodeus is busy with court matters early in the morning. I have a carriage waiting to take me wherever I please, and the gowns Asmodeus has the suest sew for me are gorgeous. Even if all this faded, if we were in one of the low towns of Galmaleth in a small shack, with nothing but our feet to carry us to and from the marketplace where we would have to oversee our finances, I would still be just as happy. I must admit, though, I love watching him conduct royal matters every day in court. He presents as powerful, but in a different way than before. His power now is one of respect and honour, not commands and intimidation. I often wonder if other demons regret not deciding to follow us here. I know the word has travelled back to Ikoth of the beautiful realm he's created for us all. I couldn't be more proud to call myself his. After everything that's happened, this is an ending I never expected. I arrived on Galmaleth, a terrified prisoner and a hooded demon. King told me my soul would be ripped from my body and locked in a dungeon. After weeks spent together in various castle rooms, listening to him respond to me in as few words as possible, I fell in love. Deep, true love that I almost admitted to him before I discovered everything about him was a secret. I will never forget his face when he was in the middle of the crowd of demons and his secrets were peeled back, as was his hood. The face of pure terror and fear will stay locked in my mind for the rest of my life, because I know at that moment he wasn't worried about a trial, or the heinous remarks shouted at him by the demons taking residence on his home planet. He was concerned about losing me. Now I can say that I've travelled to other worlds most on Prathika have never seen. I have met various species of demons and have lived to tell the tale. I rescued a king from execution with an argument made on a whim. I've been allowed to experience true unbounded love, and I have the blessing of looking forward to a long future with him. The sound of a sword unsheathing breaks my sentimental thoughts. I wasn't expecting Yarel in the arena this early. He's a tall, broad-shouldered demon Asmodeus has made great friends with. He's been like a brother figure to me, all too happy to train me when Asmodeus is busy. In case of another fallout, I want to be prepared for battle, mentally and physically. Yarel runs across the arena, wielding his sword over his head, and I duck under it and around him before spinning around to swipe at his back. He catches my blade with his sword over the back of his shoulder and sends me backward with a hard thrust. I shuffle backward, keeping my balance on the rolling sand as I try to strike his left side. He blocks it as he always does, and I dodge right and swing my blade to his neck, stopping just as it's about to slice through his red skin. He smiles and nods as he looks at me from the side. Very good. You have to stop blocking on the left, I respond stoically. Dodge it and go for my back. He chuckles and lowers the blade from his neck. 
Aren't I supposed to be the teacher here? That's what I thought, I respond mockingly with a sly smile. He spins and swings his blade at me again, and the sparring continues. We practice almost every day in the afternoons. He's a fantastic teacher, and he's taught me more than just battle tactics. He's been accommodating in understanding more of demonic court politics and traditions carried over to Galmaleth. The only issue is sometimes he can be a bit too predictable. I go for his left, and he doesn't dodge right. Instead, he moves back and then forward quickly as my blade swings to the ground. Before I have a second to comprehend his new strategy, the blade of his sword is at my neck. We look at each other briefly before laughing and withdrawing our swords. Very nice, I hear Asmodeus's voice on the stairwell. Hi, I exclaim as I run over to him, kissing him lightly on the lips so I don't get my sweat on his nice robes. Has Yarel been easy on you today? Actually, she's been easy on me, Yarel answers with a grin as he wipes the droplets from his brow. She's a fiery one, Asmodeus. Oh, I'm fully aware, Asmodeus comments as he admires me. Is something wrong? I ask Asmodeus through heavy breaths. No. He smiles. I came to inform you that we have dinner plans tonight. Is it with the young couple in the eastern woods? No, he says gently. It's a surprise. Also, he pulls me close regardless of my body's sweat. A new gown is awaiting you in your old room for tonight. Asmodeus, I comment with a surprised and suspicious stare. What are you up to? All will be revealed soon, he responds with a quick kiss as he lightly pats me. Go get ready. He looks at Yorel. I'm sorry to have to interrupt your session. No, Yorel responds as he picks up his sword and sheathes it. Believe me, I don't think I will win any more rounds today. I got that last one, but she's on her game this afternoon. Yorel walks past us before nodding to me. Tomorrow? I nod and grin. Absolutely. Asmodeus and Yorel shake hands before he leaves the arena. Asmodeus follows him upstairs, and I stare at the arena with confusion. What are we doing? Why do I need a new gown? I have so many already that I haven't worn yet. I shake off the thoughts and run to the middle of the arena to pick up my sword, studying the carvings on the handle as I walk to place it back on the wall. Asmodeus had a line from a poem I wrote when we were first getting to know each other carved on it for me. Grey skin and dark eyes cannot hide the true nature of your kindness. I will see you regardless of how you try to hide. I smile. When he gave it to me, he told me he never wanted me to forget those days, regardless of the hidden secrets kept during that time. I promised him I never would, and meant it with all my heart. I open the door to my bedroom and look around excitedly before seeing a dress on the bed I used to sleep in when I was first brought to Galmaleth. I walk toward it, and my mouth drops. The other gowns he's bought me have been gorgeous, but this one is special. It's silver and gold with a mermaid flare at the bottom. Next to it are glimmering heels, fine stones I'm sure harvested primarily for this pair of shoes. A knock on the door sounds as I marvel at the outfit. Draran walks in and smiles as he bows to me. I'm here to get you ready, my lady. I chuckle and look at him suspiciously. Draran, what's going on? Ah. He shakes his head and clicks his teeth. That I can't tell you, madame. I groan and look at the ceiling before removing my fighting gear. Draran clears his throat, and I look at him with confusion before my face falls, and I smack my lips slowly. Right, I say slowly. My eyesight has returned. Yes. Embarrassingly, I close my eyes and walk to the bathroom with the dress. I'll be right back. Of course, madam. After a hot shower, I step out and dry off, looking at the dress on the counter. I run my fingers over the gorgeous fabric and smile as I hang the towel back up and pull it on. It's very form-fitting. I'm sure Asmodeus gave the seamstress my exact measurements. He had them taken the first week we returned to Galmaleth, and I remember thinking as the measuring tapes were wrapped around my waist that there's nothing this man wouldn't do for. Me. I slide on the shoes and clasp the necklace around my neck, watching it sparkle in the bathroom lights as I place the earrings in my ears. I walk into the bedroom and look at Draran as I spin slightly. What do you think? Gorgeous, madame. He smiles widely and motions for me to come closer. I walk toward him and glimpse myself in the mirror, shocked at how I look in the outfit. 
I swear Asmodeus has a better fashion sense than I do most times. The only statement I can think of when I look at myself in the mirror is that I look like a queen. I break my gaze in the reflective glass and walk closer to Dradran, who has makeup laid out on the bench next to him. Dradran, I chuckle as I look at him with doubt. Do you know how to do makeup? He puts the foundation on a small sponge and smiles. I've been studying at the request of the king, madame. I laugh and try to stay still as the sponge presses over my face softly. I watch from the corner of my eye as he pulls out various contour and blending brushes, amazed. He knows how to do makeup better than I do. Where are the books he learned this from? I can tell he's highly focused, but he doesn't take long. A part of me is nervous once he backs away and motions for me to look into the mirror. I'm stunned at his work. I chuckle and look at him with surprise before hugging him. He staggers backward, unsure of what to do. I pull away quickly, shaking my head and grinning. I'm sorry, I just... You're happy, madame. He responds with a nod. And that makes me happy. Thank you, Draran. Draran motions to the door, and I take a deep breath as I walk through it, making my way down the grand staircase. I glance up at the new chandelier Asmodeus had put in to replace the broken one. It's modelled after the phases of the moon, each phase hanging from the ceiling and the visible part of the moon illuminated in each one. He told me when he put it in that he wanted to remember the nights we spent together every time he walked down the stairs in the morning. He continued to say each day was worth it, no matter how stressful, because he came home to me every night, and I couldn't agree more. Draran opens the door to the dining room, and I see Asmodeus sitting alone at the head of the table. There is a violinist in the far right corner of the room, playing a slow, sweet tune. I smile and walk in with an eyebrow cocked, wondering where our guests must be. Asmodeus stands from his seat and walks over to me. He's dressed in his formal robes, an attire I've only seen him wear once before at the welcoming ceremony for all the demons in Galmaleth. We reach each other in the middle of the dining room, and he holds out his hands, palms up. I place mine in his and laugh quietly. Are our guests late? I tease. No. He grins and looks me deeply in the eyes. She's right on time. Asmodeus, I whisper as I look around the room, hearing the soft violin in the background. We've eaten dinner in our nightwear. Why do we need all this fanfare this time? This is a special occasion, Ciara. I frown and look at the ground, wondering what I missed. The Icoth honour day isn't until Friday, and the ceremony of honouring the animals isn't until the end of the month. I know today he prepositioned the court for more housing in the low towns due to complaints of lack of space. I knew it would go well, but I thought it was another day in court for him. I'm so sorry, I say with a frown. I don't know what today is. What's the occasion? We are celebrating life tonight. He withdraws his hands from mine and puts them in his pockets. The life we led before each other. He pulls out a small black box from his right pocket and looks at me with admiration. I feel my heart leap in my chest and my mouth drop slightly. The life that brought us together. He pauses and kneels on the ground, opening the box to reveal a gorgeous blue and green ring with a golden band that has green gemstone leaves holding the stones together. And our lives together after this moment. Asmodeus. He holds up a finger, and I place my hands on my chest, my eyes beginning to water and my throat closing up. My heart is quickening, and my hands begin to sweat as he stares at me again, his face sincere and his tone gentle. Ciara Drury. You are a woman I never knew existed. You carry with you so much love, peace and power. You are the most ambitious and intelligent being I have ever encountered. I was told there was a word called love when I was a child. It was nothing more than another line in the mythical books I read until I met you. You saved my life. But more importantly, you showed me that life is worth living and that each day is another opportunity to experience the joys surrounding me. I want nothing more than to present you with this ring as a sign of my gratitude and profound love for everything that you are. So I kneel before you, a king humbled by your beauty, and ask you, Ciara Drury, if you will be my queen. Asmodeus, I squeak through my clenched throat, and tears stream down my face as I kneel to the floor in front of him. I look at the ring, then back into his eyes as I nod my head and cover my mouth. He quickly embraces me as we kneel on the dining room floor. I press my head into his chest and sob. 
overcome with every emotion known to man. I feel an overwhelming love for this man, intense gratitude for the life we've built together, the exhilaration from the notion of being his queen, and a feeling that I've finally found where I belong. I fit in his arms better than anywhere else I've ever been. His touch is warm and comforting, something a special childhood blanket couldn't even give me. His heartbeat is as pertinent to my life as mine is, consistently giving me an abundance of life and love. I pull back from him and look down and sniffle as he slides the ring onto my finger. We lock eyes again, and I see him wipe a tear from his face. I chuckle and place my hand on the side of his face. Do demons even cry? I tease, sniffing after the words leave my mouth. He laughs heartily before sniffling himself and nodding. They do now. Our faces fall serious, and I kiss him, our lips lightly pressing against each other as my heart lifts in my chest. There are no walls between us now, physical or emotional. I have full faith in him, and he trusts me to be his queen and help him rule over Galmaleth. What matters more is that I accepted a proposal from the real Asmodeus, the demon I always knew beneath the hood and the lies, the demon king that needed no official title to gain my heart. As I taste the love on his lips, I feel honoured to hold the title of his queen, something I will not take lightly. Chapter 30. Ciara. I breathe out as Draran adjusts the train of my dress. The ball gown figure fans out perfectly at my hips, and the sparkling corset matches the tiara placed strategically along my loose winding braid. Looking in the mirror, I feel a rush of emotions. Excitement to be pronounced as Asmodeus' wife, nervous about being crowned as the queen, and doubting I'll live up to Galmaleth's expectations. Don't do that, madame, Draran says gently, as he stands up and looks at me in the mirror. Do what? You're overthinking again. I smile slightly before my nerves take over again, and I gulp as I look over the necklace resting between my bare collarbones. Dra Ran has come to know me so well, almost too well. He's been a lifesaver, an emotional support when I needed it most. He walks before me and adjusts my necklace as he grins widely. Remember what I told you, he says kindly. I nod and close my eyes. A queen does not know perfection. He joins me as I continue the sentence. She strives for the greatness of her people. I nod again and look at him gratefully, cocking my head slightly as I smile. Thank you, Draran. Don't thank me, madam, he says as he takes my hand. Thank your king for the world he has blessed us with. I exhale through tightly wound lips and look at myself in the mirror again, before I hear the procession begin outside. I turn around step off the podium in front of the mirror and walk toward the door, stepping carefully so as not to trip on my dress. Draran opens the door, and I walk outside to see Yorel waiting for me with his elbow bent by his side. I wrap my hand around his bicep and sigh as we walk toward the side of the grand staircase. I look at the ground and breathe out again, trying to steady my heart rate. He pats my hand on his arm and I look at him, grinning widely at me. You look beautiful. Thank you. I respond, trying not to cry as I look into his kind eyes. He's the closest thing I have to a father on Galmaleth, and I wouldn't ask anyone else to give me away to Asmodeus. We round the corner, and I look down the staircase to see Asmodeus waiting outside the castle's front doors, facing away from me. Beyond the steps, hundreds of demons have gathered to witness our wedding and my coronation. My panic only spikes more as I cautiously walk down the stairs, Draran constantly adjusting my train behind me. I reach the bottom step and my heels hit the tile floor. Asmodeus turns around at the sound and locks eyes with me. His face falls into a grin of astonishment as I proceed forward, gripping Yarel's arm tightly as I'm escorted out of the front doors. I walk to the other side of the opening and stand facing Asmodeus, watching a tear slide down his face as we meet. He doesn't wipe it off, as that would be too obvious to the other demons watching the ceremony. I grin at him, loving that he's so emotional beneath his expensive, beautiful dress robes and the weighted golden crown between his horns. Loud footsteps clack on the tile, and Asmodeus and I look to the door. We both grin as Vagthamon approaches us, holding his tome of demonic courtship. He walks to us and smiles before taking Asmodeus's hand, shaking it and bowing to me. 
He looks out at the crowd of demons, stretching for miles as he shouts into the world. We gather here to honour a love that has passed the test of masked faces and the union of different species. I look at Asmodeus, and we smile at each other as Vagthimon continues. Asmodeus and Ciara are an example of true, profound love. They have travelled through various worlds, saved each other's lives, and found solace in the kingdom of Galmaleth. The crowd cheers, and I giggle with Asmodeus as I look out over all the demons that have shown up for our ceremony. I remember some from the courtroom in Ikoth, celebrating when Vagathimon said Asmodeus would not be executed. Others are new and old followers of Asmodeus's rule. I am here to unite these two in the demonic court of law and under the eyes of the divine gods. Vagthimon motions to Asmodeus and me. Will you please present each other your rings? Draran hands me the one for Asmodeus as I watch Tilek give him mine. We hold out our hands and slide the rings onto each other's fingers, the feeling of mine spurring giddiness inside me. I stop and breathe out, wondering how I got so lucky to be here today with the man I love, initiated into the royal family by his cousin, who almost executed him. It looks like good, and love do always prevail, even in the world of demons. With these rings, Vegathamon declares loudly, I pronounce the union of Asmodeus and Ciara Drury blessed by the planet of Galmaleth and the power of the divine. He looks at Asmodeus and me admirably. You may kiss your bride, Vagathamon says gently. I smile and wrap my arms around Asmodeus' neck as he bends me over and kisses me. The crowd cheers, but the sound doesn't fill my ears. I'm too distracted by the feeling of his smile beneath my lips. I grin in return before he stands me up and looks into my eyes, grinning and shaking his head, seemingly in amazement. I look out over the crowd, and Asmodeus lifts his arm, grasping my hand. They cheer again, and I'm in awe of how many demons support our union. They have come from everywhere to witness the union of the demon king and a human woman, something considered taboo in most of Ikoth. Asmodeus turns to me and kisses my hand, lifting his head with a grin as he steps aside. I turn around with my back to the crowd, facing Vagthimon as Draran adjusts my dress train, and Tilek brings Vagthimon the sword Asmodeus had personalised for me. He takes it and lifts it to the sky as it lays horizontally in his palms. By the power vested in me by the kingdom of Ikoth, I invite you all to be present for the coronation of Ciara Drury. The crowd goes silent, and I bow my head to Vagthimon as I kneel on the ground. He lowers the sword and looks at me with kind eyes. Repeat after me, he says gently. I, Ciara Drury, vow to protect and serve the people of Galmaleth during my reign as queen. I repeat the sentence, each word carrying twenty pounds of weight as they leave my mouth. I sneak a glance at Asmodeus, who beams at me as another tear leaves his eyes. I've never seen someone so proud of me, and I grin as Vagathimon lowers the sword to my left shoulder. Ciara Drury, may the gods watch over you and your oath to serve and honour your people on Gamoleth. He moves the sword lightly to my right shoulder, the sharp cold blade sending shivers through my body. I bow my head to him again, as Tilek brings Vagathimon the crown and trades it for the sword. Draran removes my tiara and walks beside Asmodeus, as Vagathimon holds the sparkling white gem-encrusted crown in the air, looking out over the crowd. Ciara Drury, he shouts to the crowd as he looks down at me and smiles, lowering the crown onto my head. I pronounce you Queen of Galmaleth. My audience cheers as the crown nestles gently in my hair. I stand up carefully and look at Vagathimon expressing gratitude with my eyes before turning around and looking at my people, the residents I reign over, and the demons that support my crowning. I bow to them, holding the crown on my head gently, and when I stand back up, I see them bow in return. I turn to the side and look at Asmodeus, watching him clap as he shakes his head and smiles broadly. I am a queen, a ruler of a world. I stand beside my king and will honour my vow to protect my people. I can create a new life for the residents of Galmaleth and make this world a safe and inclusive kingdom for all. I smile as I realise I finally have the power to bring more empathy and kindness into this world. I lock arms with Asmodeus and spin around with him in the middle of the castle ballroom. The glint in our guest's eyes fills my heart with warmth as Asmodeus pulls me close. Our faces come together and he places his forehead against mine as we stare into each other's eyes. Backing away, he spins me another time, 
the train of my dress sweeping gracefully over the golden tiled floor. His arms wrap around my waist as he dips and kisses me, the instrumentals in the background ending slowly. The night has been filled with drinking, dancing, meeting my new charges, speaking about what they would like to change in Galmaleth, and getting to know the names of their families. Now that the crown is bestowed on my head, I must pay attention to the details of the residents of Galmaleth. The best way to earn trust and honour is to connect with them on a deeper emotional level, to remind them that they're not just numbers in the kingdom. Their lives matter to me, and I'm more than excited to undertake the beginning of my reign. Asmodeus has been doing the same, chatting with his advisors and accomplices, as we exchange loving glances from across the room. Toward the end of the night, we bid goodbye to the loving guests, and Draran and Tilek begin to clean up the room. The last to leave is Yarel, who pulls me aside and speaks to me briefly in the corner of the ballroom. You did well tonight, he says lowly. Thank you, I breathe out the words quickly, placing my hand on my forehead and smiling. I was so nervous. You embody the role of queen well, you're a natural. I grin and hug him as he stands still momentarily before embracing me. Thank you, Yarel. You're welcome, he responds as I pull from our embrace. Queen Ciara. He winks at me and leaves the venue, and Asmodeus comes up behind me, wrapping his arms around my waist and kissing my neck lightly. You were amazing tonight. So were you, I reply, turning my head slightly to look into his eyes before he kisses me and spins me around, taking me tightly in his arms. Chapter 31. Trinity. I have to admit, things on Galmaleth have just gotten a hell of a lot more interesting. Parties celebrating Asmodeus and Ciara's union have raged well into the morning hours in the palace every night for the past week. You'd have to be blind not to notice some of the demons' reluctance to accept a human as their queen. But much to my surprise, the vast majority of the demons on Galmaleth have welcomed Ciara with open arms. It's strange to walk through the palace ballroom or look up at the dais and see the woman who tried to teach me how to survive in the dungeons a couple of months ago. Back then, Ciara was little more than a feral animal and that's exactly how she wanted it. Now every time I see her, she has a jewelled crown on her head and delicate fabrics clinging to her as she kisses babies and smiles and waves at her new subjects. Trinity. The nasal voice of the captain drags my attention back to him and I quickly paste a vapid, thoughtless smile onto my face. My apologies, Captain. It seems my mind was elsewhere. Please continue. Predictably, the Captain's chest puffs up at my encouragement, and he begins his long lecture on the importance of his rank all over again. I take care to nod and hum my approval where appropriate, even as my mind begins to wander once again. Ciara's fate is incredibly rare for human women, even among those lucky enough to find a demon mate that actually respects them. Rising from a prisoner in a dungeon to the beloved queen of an entire country of demons is hardly common after all. Still, I'm happy for my friend. If anyone deserves it, it's her. But I can't help the pang of jealousy I feel at how everything worked out for her. Ciara's method of survival was to be brutal, feral, and undesirable. It worked for her, for which I'm glad, but that behaviour out of the vast majority of the rest of us wouldn't make us queens. It would earn us a one-way ticket to the chopping block. My method of survival is vastly different from Ciara's. My eyes rove over the captain as my thoughts begin to turn, lingering on the polished medals on his chest that scream self-importance and the long, narrow nose he so loves to use to look down at others. The captain is not the worst of my targets. Despite his many shortcomings, he is easy to manipulate and not altogether terrible company. While Ciara managed to break free of the dungeons using determination and sheer brute force, my way out required more finesse. Demons are just like any other group of males. If you know what they want, what buttons to press and where their ego needs to be stroked, you can make them do just about anything. It took me a while to work my way up to the captain. At first, I toyed with my craft, batting my eyelashes at the Trollvor and listening carefully to their conversations so I could mimic them back with interest later on. I was thrilled when it worked. The Trollvor began sneaking me scraps of better food, giving me extra water to wash with, and ignoring me when their duties called for brutality, all in exchange for the feigned interest of a beautiful woman. 
When the captain stopped by to check up on his charges and make sure things were running smoothly, it was all too easy to turn my newly acquired skills to him. Femininity is so often viewed as a detriment, both on Galmaleth and on Protheca, but I've found a way to weaponize it. Now, with a permanent bridge existing between Galmaleth and the demon country of Ikoth on Erisak, as well as a human woman on the throne beside the king, the opportunities for power are endless. Captain, I'm beginning to feel a bit warm, I simper, dabbing my hand gently across my forehead before dragging it across my chest lightly. The captain's eyes follow my hand as it trails just above the swell of my breasts, lighting with lust. I'll go get you a drink, he replies hurriedly, flashing me a quick smile before turning and disappearing into the crowd of people. I take the opportunity to watch the rest of the party-goers strewn about the ballroom, laughing and dancing with glasses of wine in hand. I lost sight of Ciara and Asmodeus long ago, but the rest of the demons have proven just as entertaining to observe. Dancers glide across the ballroom floor, twirling and switching partners in time with the music, their lavish suits and dresses making them all look more like dolls than real people. As my eyes skim across the crowd, I find myself stopping over one face in particular. The demon sits back lazily in his chair, the top fastenings of his tunic undone carelessly, and his leg propped up on the chair beside him. Empty glasses of gods know what litter the table before him, and he swigs down the remaining dregs of liquid in the glass in his hand as he stares at me. Something about the intensity of his dark eyes, the way they press on me heavily like a physical touch, has a scarlet heat crawling up my neck. Here you are, my dear, the captain says as he steps into view. I look away from the other male hurriedly, smiling softly up at the captain. Thank you, I say genuinely, relishing the way the wine coats my tongue. The captain nods, an almost shy expression crossing his face. He truly isn't a bad male, and I don't hate spending time with him. He's just easy, predictable. He's useful, a small voice whispers across my mind. Despite his shortcomings, he's proven to be kind and reasonable. I've been able to lobby for better treatment of the other girls, and I now have a whole cell to myself, complete with pillows and blankets and a washing basin I can use whenever I'd like. He may be boring, but at the very least, he's an advantageous partner. The captain launches into a detailed joke with a long, rambling prelude, and I force a laugh as he gets to the punchline. No matter how hard I try to focus on the captain or enjoy the ball, however, my eyes keep wandering back to that male. Every time I look at him, he's already looking at me. He is devastatingly handsome, with a strong jaw and crimson eyes that sparkle every time they meet mine. His full lips are pressed into a hard line, dark brows lowered in a brooding expression, and I can't help but wonder what it is that he's thinking about. May I have this dance? The captain asks, extending his hand to mine with a flourish. I don't have to force the laugh that slips from my lips as I place my hand into his. I'd be honoured, I say, giving him a small curtsy. The captain sweeps me onto the dance floor, swinging and twirling me in time with the lively music. The conversation flows easily enough, and I find myself truly enjoying the festivities. Anywhere is better than the dungeons, I suppose, but being here in the palace with a human queen on the throne all but ensures that I'm treated as an equal, respected at least at the most basic level. And that is more than I've had in quite some time. Despite all of the merriment, however, I continue to catch sight of the brooding male in the corner. I'm no stranger to the stares of males, but it's difficult to decipher his rank when he's so... underdressed. I decide to take a chance as I meet his eyes for what feels like the dozenth time over the captain's shoulder, shooting him a sultry smile and a wink. I know he saw me, he was looking directly at me, and yet, his only response is a subtle twitch in his jaw. A sudden flare of frustration rises quickly in my chest, He's been staring at me all night and hasn't moved from that damn table. Is my attention not what he's looking for? Why else would he be staring like that? I stifle the emotion quickly, smiling back up at the captain. Fine. If he's not interested, I'm having a perfectly good time right where I am. Still, dance after dance, drink after drink, every time I look up, that damned male is looking at me. By the time the ball is drawing to a close, I can see the gleam in the captain's eye. He's eager to return to a more private setting, likely in the hopes that I'll indulge his baser desires for the night. But I'm too distracted to play my part well. Excuse me for just one moment, Captain, 
It seems there's something I need to take care of, I say apologetically with a curtsy. The captain nods, disappointment flashing across his features, but thankfully he lets me go. Without a backward glance, I stride toward the table the male has been sitting at, that flare of frustration beginning to burn hotter and brighter behind my ribs. Just who does this male think he is, to ogle me in such a public setting? The demon watches my approach, the corners of his lips quirking up slightly. The sight only makes me angrier, and I ache to wipe that smug expression off of his face. Well, is this what you wanted? I demand as I come to a stop in front of him, placing my hands on my hips. The male says nothing, though I could have sworn the smirk on his face grew just a touch. You've been staring at me all night, I snap. What is it that you want? Did you just want my attention? The slight smirk on the demon's face turns into a fully-fledged grin at my question, but he still doesn't respond. His eyes sweep down me slowly, assessing me in a way that makes liquid heat pool in my belly before his eyes return to mine. I stare at him expectantly, waiting for his response, but the damned male doesn't say a thing. Instead he stands, drawing himself up to his full height, and it's only then that I realise just how truly massive he is compared to me. The demon glares down at me, an infuriating smirk still twisting his full lips, before he turns on his heel and begins to walk away. A sudden burst of rage fills me as he turns his back on me. How dare he? I deserve to at least receive a reason for why he's gone out of his way to ruin a perfectly good night. Hey, I shout. Before I realise what I'm doing, I've grabbed the demon's admittedly muscled arm, stopping him where he stands. The demon turns his head dangerously slowly, giving me a glimpse of his strong profile. I'm talking to you. What in the world is your problem? Thank you so much for listening to this production of Her Demon Daddy. If you enjoyed this story and want to support the channel, please like and subscribe below. It's free, at no cost to you, but helps me more than you know. If you enjoyed this story and would like more demon stories, comment below, or if there is any other dark romance stories you would like, comment and let me know below.